Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is just open up the terminal so I can create our Rails app. Alright, and because I'm on WSL, I always have to start my Redis server. Now we're good to go. If I was to do Redis CLI, I say ping, it says Pong, which means Redis is set up. And we need Redis for things like uh, action, broadcasting, and background jobs, things like that. So now I'm going to create the our Rails app. To do that, I'll just type in Rails new. And I'll put in the name of the app. Which is going to be Airbnb Rails. Then I'm going to set a few options, which would be dash D to set the database to use PostgreSQL. I'm also going to set the CSS framework to use Tailwind, just so everything looks a little bit nicer out of the box. So with those options set, I'm going to press enter. And then this will generate our simple Rails app. Now that the app is generated, you can see into this folder. And just start the server by typing in bin slash dev. Now that the server is starting, we can view our app if we open up the browser and go to localhost colon 3000. Now we'll see this little error if you didn't create the database. Uh, so it's just saying that we need to create the database. So I'll just click that button and it'll create the database. And now we'll see that uh, the Rails logo is right here, which means that our app is set up, Rails is working, and we're ready to start coding. I'm gonna create a simple model so we can view something inside of our app right away. And then I'll add user accounts in a second. I just want something simple right now. So I'm gonna do a scaffold by typing in Rails G scaffold. And we're gonna create a listing model. And a listing will have a title, an address of the listing. And then let's also give it a description, which can be typed rich text. Rich text is like a built-in advanced text editor. So you can add cool things like embedded images and other things like that. And speaking of images, why don't we add images and then I'll put that as type attachments. Although we could always have added these in later. It's a very small change. So I think with this title, address, description, and images, that's probably all we need for a simple setup. So I'll just run this generator. We're also going to need to run Rails action text colon install. To add the migrations for action text and active storage. And then the last thing we'll do is migrate the database by running Rails DB migrate. So now our database is migrated and we have all these fields in our table. So we can just go ahead and start the server with bin slash dev. And then if we go back into uh, the browser, we'll see that nothing has changed yet. But if we go to slash listings, we'll see this listings page and that was generated by the scaffold. So when you do a scaffold, it generates the views for you which means like you have this url listings and then you can also create new listings you get all of this just from typing in that scaffold and you can do that for anything so let's go ahead and create our first listing so i think the title might be like, honestly let's go to airbnb and try to find uh like one of their houses and then we'll see like why i did it like this uh, let's just do Yeah, how about that? This one in Austin, Texas, it says East Side Beehive, or no, it says Tiny Home in Austin, Texas. So that would be our title. The address, they don't really show the address for people, uh, but let's just, I don't even know. We can go up on Google Maps and try to like find a random address that we think would be like, probably like over here. Just try to take one of these addresses. I can try to, here we go. Let's just copy that address. And then obviously they don't show that to people because they don't want them to know where it is until they book the reservation. And then we could take the description would be like whatever they show right here, which is actually a pretty big description. I'm just gonna take the top part. And then for images, it would be all of the photos. So we probably can download these images. Uh, I mean, it, it goes as a WebP, that's fine. We're gonna have some images to work with for our Airbnb app. I kind of like how they fit all the images into like this certain template. It looks cool. All right, I don't wanna take too many images, but you get the idea, we have some images to show. Now if I went to my downloads, I could just select these and drop it into that field. And it shows we have seven files and we can create the listing. And just like that, we have such a simple app, but like this is the start of all great apps. Like this.
this is something. This is pretty cool. So right off the bat, we have this listing section. Where we can create it, and then uh, we can just get started on making it look a little bit better. Maybe like making it look similar to this type of setup. So let's just do some UI updates. So actually, the first thing I want to do is set the root so that it's, when we go to our main uh, URL route, like when we go to localhost, this would be the, in production, it would be like the main, it would be the name of your domain. You know, it's a root URL. I want to set that to go to the listings page. So to do that, let's first open up the code in VS Code. And then I'll come here, go to the config folder, the routes.rb. And I'm going to need to add a root. So you'll see down at the bottom, we have this root section commented out. So I can uncomment it. And then we don't have a post controller or anything. So that's what it would be looking for. So instead, we can use listings. So we'll change it to route to the listings index action. Now, when we go back into our browser, we reload we'll see that the listings show up as the main page on our site. This is exciting. We already have this full setup and just as easy as running that scaffold command. So now I wanna make this look a little bit better. Like the first thing we might wanna do is update the listings page so that this looks nicer so we don't just see like all this content right here on the listing page. So to do that, we can come into our app, into the code, and then go over to the app folder, the views and the listings, and then just come in here to the index file and we can see what's happening. So inside of the, the index file, we're rendering all the listings right here. And then we're saying render listing. So we're, we're looping over the listings, the collection of listings that we have, which this variable is defined in the listings controller on this index action we're setting at listings equal to listing dot all. Here's how you get all of the listings. And then inside of the index, we're just looping over them with some Ruby code. And then we're rendering a partial and we're also showing a link to show the listing. So this listing partial just basically contains all of the content about your listing. And this was generated by the scaffold. You don't need to use it. You don't need to design your app like this. It's actually better not to. So I can just straight up delete that and then let's make our own partial. So I'll render like, let's just say listing card and I'll pass in listing as listing. Now this is gonna look for a partial in the same folder called listing card. So we're gonna create that file. So what I when I said partial, I meant it's a file that starts with an underscore and it allows you to render it in different files just like this. So we can create the file by typing underscore listing card and then dot html.erb, which is the type of uh, like extension that we're using to use Ruby and HTML at the same time. And inside of the listing card, we can start styling that card. So let's say like width full and I don't really want to get into any specifics too much, but I just want to render the listing dot title and then probably listing images first but we'll check if we need to make sure that there's a listing image so if there we'll say if listing images are any then we're going to render an image tag for the first one and we can take a look at what that looks like if we reload now we see this, the image is actually really huge. So I wanna resize that with some CSS. And because I'm using Tailwind, it allows me to just add some CSS classes right onto the page. I don't need to use a CSS file. But you guys can choose any CSS framework that you want. If you wanna use Bootstrap, Tailwind, or if you just wanna write the CSS in your own CSS file. So I'm just gonna put a height that works for me, like a width. The thing about Tailwind, you have to remember all of the different like sizing ratios, but you don't have to. You can also put brackets and then put any size, like 300 pixels. And I kind of like doing that too. And it's just a quicker way to style, but it's basically like doing inline styling. So if you're not using Tailwind, you could also just said like style 
with 300 pixels and this would do the same thing but we don't have to worry about that because we have this uh, whole CSS framework to do this it's, it's cool all right so now this looks honestly like a little bit better we have the title one thing is that I think the title was on the bottom here so it's like image first and then title at the bottom so we can just go ahead and move the title down probably put this inside of some sort of element I just use a P element you know, the, I don't really know what um, element you're supposed to use put it at the bottom and it looks like on Airbnb they kind of bold it so we could do that too by typing font bold Ooh, that looks pretty good and then also the images are rounded I like the roundedness on it so if we want to round our images too we can just add that class to the image tag Say rounded large overflow hidden now we're gonna get that nice rounded look and then right now it's not working as a as a link like we want it to like on Airbnb if you click anywhere on this element it'll just bring you to that listing so to turn this into a link we can just wrap this whole div in a link to just do a link to listing and then we have to add a block which means you say do and then with every block you have to have an end so it just connects the do to the end and then all of the content inside of it will get put inside of our link and what that looks like is if we reload now you get that nice cursor effect and when you click you actually go to the listing so already I mean this looks just like Airbnb if I'm gonna be honest <laughs> so yeah let's go to let's go get another house just so we can see what that looks like let's get this little cabin one entire cabin and let's grab our description the address I'm gonna need another address maybe this one's a little bit farther obviously this isn't the address but it just works for a nice demo in our app and then as far as images go well, let's download some of these images so we can use them so just like download 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 and I'm gonna put in those images Just select these drag them over create listing and if we go back to listings oh now we see something weird like it's not in the same styling as the Airbnb site where they line them up in like they do like four different listings on each line but on our app it's just like looking like they're on they're stacked on top of each other so to fix that we can go back to the index and what we can do is on this listings div element that's wrapping all of our listings we can start styling that so we just say width full and then actually we're gonna use grid so grid is a CSS uh, like it's a CSS uh, it's part of CSS that allows you to style elements into a grid so if we add the class grid and then we give it the amount of columns so uh, for Airbnb they do four columns now we can even add gap to space them out now if we go and reload we'll see this already looks amazing we have our setup it looks pretty similar although their pictures are like more square like if we wanted to make them square like we can although I don't really mind it but if you just add a matching height and the width then it would be square like already just like this although you notice that our images get stretched out and it looks kind of ugly so to fix that we can add object cover which means it won't stretch the image, but it'll actually just like crop it to, to zoom into the center. And then if you wanted to change which position it zooms into, you could say like objects top, I'm pretty sure, or objects left. Yeah, see how it, now it's zooming in on the left side. But if you leave it by default, it'll zoom into the center, which I'm pretty sure is how Airbnb does it. So yeah, we have these listings. I don't really like the squareness. Maybe it's too big. So we can change it to like 
250 pixels. Mm, I don't know. I kind of liked the other look. Maybe we'll do just width full and then height, like a certain height. So I'm going away from the, the pixels. So now it's like height 64. Oh, and then now you, you'll see when we go on mobile, it looks really bad. So actually we want to add a breakpoint back on the index. So right now it's always going to try to stick it into four columns. But if we add a breakpoint like this, we say medium, it'll switch to four columns. Then on mobile, it'll do the default with our grid, which is just one on each line. Also, we need to add some spacing between these top links. So to do that, you can just simply add a BR, which is the HTML element that adds a little break in the content. And that already looks pretty good. So just like that, we have a simple, very simple Airbnb type of app. We can look at the listings. Although now the listing page doesn't look very, it doesn't look as pretty as the front page because the front page looks really pretty. All right, guys, so let's get working on making this show page look more like this uh, Airbnb actual setup. All right, so let's get started. So to do that, let's just come back into our code. We're gonna go over to the app and the views folder, the listings show. So the show page is where uh, you're gonna show that listing. And it's just because of how the routes are set up. So you're going to slash listing slash this post up here, we have the ID. So actually that might be something that we want to change real quick. Instead of using an ID, we can actually use like a readable type of thing. Although Airbnb, Airbnb actually uses an ID, look. But we don't have to be just like them. We can make ours a little bit nicer. Although, I guess it's not really a big deal. But just to make it so it's not like two in the URL, we could at least add some sort of uh, what they call it is a slug and there's actually libraries to add slugs there's a library called friendly ID and we can use that for adding a slug although it is failing but it's used by a ton of people used by 36,000 different people which is crazy so let's just go ahead and add this in so you can do that by going over to the gem file adding in friendly ID just anywhere in here. And then we can do bundle install. So come into the console, run a bundle install. Now we have that gem added. And then we also need to add a migration field. So if you look over here, we need to do a migration slug unique. So to do that, we're gonna do it on the listing model. Let's do a rails G migration, add slug to listings. And we'll say slug unique, just like that. And the cool thing about Rails is when you do a migration and you have the right naming convention, which means like the last thing basically needs to be the table name. I think I'm not really even sure how it, how it works, but if you say like adds whatever to this table, it actually does that for you. So if we looked at the inside of the migration file that we got generated, it actually creates this migration where it's adding a column to the listings, slug type string, and it's also adding an index and it has to be unique. So that looks good to me. You can just migrate the database with Rails DB Migrate. And if you do need to change that before you migrate it, you can go over to the DB folder, the migrate, and then look for the latest file. And this is your migration right here. We could change this if we needed to, but that looks good to me. And I guess the next thing you have to do is generate the configuration file. So I guess we have to run this rails generate friendly ID. And it also adds a migration table for friendly ID slugs. And then we can just migrate the database like this. All right, and it says edit the, the model file as the following. So we have to add an extend and we also have to set up the friendly ID. So let's go ahead and do that. I'll copy this code and then we'll go over to inside of the app folder, the models folder. And you'll see that we have this listing, the RB model. And it already has some attributes. Like it has the rich text and it has the images attribute. So these are using those libraries that are built into Rails, but we did have to run an installer to use them. So what I'm gonna do is right after 
that code, I can just extend friendly ID. Actually, a lot of times I like to have my extends, like whenever I use the extend keyword, I like to put it at the very top just to keep it nice and organized. And I might even want to have the friendly ID on top of the has many associations. So we have friendly ID name. So that's the attribute it's going to use. And I don't think we use name. I think we use title. We could have used name. Let me go and check in our app. What did I call it? Yeah, look, we called it title. So actually we're going to use title, use slugs. So just like that. And then uh, we also have to edit inside of the controller. So instead of just a regular find, we have to do a friendly find. So to do that, we're going to go into the app controllers, listings controller, go over to, well, actually it's not inside of the show action. It's inside of a before action up here. We have a set listing before action. So that means it's going to be all the way at the bottom of the file. We have this method called set listing where we're setting listing uh, to this listing dot find. So instead of doing dot find, we have to do dot friendly dot find, which will use the slug instead of just searching for the ID. And just like that, we have that nice setup. Although since we already created those tables before, we actually need to run this callback, find each and save so that it can set the slug. Cause if we look right now, our models that we already created, like those listings that we already created don't have a slug attribute set. So we can check that out by going to the rails console, type rails C in your terminal. Now we're in the rails console and in the rails console, you can interact with all of your different models and objects inside your app. So if we were to check listing.count, we'll see how many listings we have. We have two listings. And if we did listing.last, you'll see all the attributes on the listing. We have the ID, title, address, and then slug, but the slug is set to nil. Also, the reason why you don't see, you don't see images, you don't see the description is because those are not really included directly on the model. Since we're using those libraries, action text, it has its own table. So we actually just need to call like, description and it would pull up, but it just doesn't show it as one of the attributes actually on our database table or on the model. All right, so what we have to do though to get the slugs to get generated is we just need to run this callback, the save callback, which usually gets ran whenever you save. So like when you update or when you create a new listing, but since we've already had created them, we just need to run the callback again by doing find each and save just like this, run it. And now you see that our listings got updated. Now, if we check our listing.last, the slug looks like this entire dash cabin and like it looks better. And that's what it'll look like in the URL too. So let's restart the server and take a look at this. So if we go back to, you know, our main page, localhost, and now we click on the listing, you'll see that up in the URL, it has a, like a prettier URL that actually uses the title. And it'll take care of, if there's like somebody else has a tiny home in Austin, Texas, it'll take care of that because it already has to be unique. So it would just add like a few numbers at the end. And that's perfectly fine with me. All right, so now that we have the slugs worked out, we have a pretty. All right, let's get started on updating the listing show page to look more like the Airbnb page. So to do that, we're gonna go into the code and then go to the app folder views listings and then the show html.erb file and then inside of here we can i mean really we can just delete this whole file and start again uh because like the things that they do have they have the link to edit the listing back to listings but we're probably gonna just rewrite this anyways so yeah i would just delete everything and then just start from scratch so we can start with a div or you know what, let's just start. I was gonna put a container around everything, but let's start with the images. So what we're gonna wanna do is to display all the images, we're going to access the images like this off of the listing. So we say at listing.images, each do image, and then we'll end off the loop here. And then inside of here, we're going to do an image tag for the image, just like that. And if we go back in the browser, we'll see that all of our images are displayed on the page. 
Although they're kind of like just put side by side next to each other. And also they're really huge. So to fix that, we can add some styling. Let's add a class. Let's just give it a fixed uh, width. So we'll do width 40, that'll be pretty small. Now we have all the images. They're still right next to each other though. So I don't really know how we're gonna wanna display it, but we can put a container around them and we can at least add some gap between them. So I'll just do flex gap four. And then you'll see that there'll be a little bit of spacing between them. If we wanted to have more, we could just increase the gap to a higher number. And we can also increase the size of the images. So something like this, we have all the images, although some of them are kind of wrapping over. So to fix that, we might want to do uh, overflow wrap. Or no, not overflow, it's actually flex wrap. Which means if they are gonna overflow, it'll just wrap them instead. Because by default with flex, it wants to just keep it in that straight line. But if you do flex wrap, it'll, it means that it'll change so that it can actually wrap over onto the next section. So this is pretty cool, but actually on the Airbnb website, I think they only display a certain amount of pictures up front. See, they have like this one, then they have the rest of them, and then they have show all photos. So if we wanted to make something that looks just like this, we can accomplish that by adding some more logic. So let's say like the first image is gonna be big and then the second ones are gonna be smaller. We can actually do something like that. If we just have our first image right here, we do image tag for at listing dot images dot first. And then let's say we wanna do width 64, height 64. I think that might be a little bit too small. We come back, now you see on the left, this one's like a little bit bigger, but we probably wanna do width 80, height 80, just to make it a little bit bigger. And then I'm gonna make these other images fit inside. And also we're not gonna display all of them. We can just display the first four and then have the link to show all photos. So to do that, well, first I'm gonna add some spacing between these. So I think I'll wrap it in another div. You can do flex gap eight and we'll have that one image and then we'll have another container which is the one right here where we display the rest of them so we actually just want to get listing images one through four i think something like that will work so yeah we got four images right here and then instead of flex we can do grid uh, grid calls two so two columns which means there should be two on each line and already we get this nice kind of setup Although now we can decrease the gap, put it on four. And then we need to kind of think of the sizing to figure out how we can get them to fit into like the right area. So instead of doing width 64, we're gonna actually have to think about this in terms of height. So we might be able to do height 36. And then look, that already kind of like, there's a little bit of space at the bottom, but it almost is perfect. So we could even increase the gap a little bit and maybe that'll push it down a little bit. It's still like a tiny bit of space, maybe gap eight. And you know what, gap eight, it seems like perfect. All right, and then to center all of this in the middle, let's just add an MX auto to the top div. It should push it in the middle. And then boom, just like that, we have this setup. Now also you'll notice we have some rounding on this div. So actually to achieve that effect, I think we can just add rounding to the top level div and then just do an overflow hidden. We come back to our app. Now you'll see we get that same rounding effect and I'm pretty happy with this. And then that, if we want to show the rest of the images, let's see how they do that. When you press show images, they kind of bring you to like, I don't know if they bring you to a new page or it just pops up to show all the images. It looks like it just kind of pops up on top because they're probably using some sort of JavaScript library where you know, they don't actually change the page. But for us, we could really decide how we wanna do that, but let's add in that show all images link. So to do that, I'm going to put relative on the top div, and then that'll allow us to have a link to show all photos. Right now I'm just gonna put in 
this hashtag, which is kind of just like a filler link. So we're not actually going anywhere yet until I define that route. Then I'm gonna do an absolute, bottom zero, right zero. So what this is gonna do is gonna say absolute, but since we have the relative class here, it's only gonna go on top of all of the content in this div. And then bottom zero, right zero is gonna put it in the bottom right corner, just like this. If we reload, we'll see we have this link, show all photos. Although we can do some nice styling like we have here. So to do that, let's add like BG white. And we can do the rounded. And also we can increase these numbers to like push it off of the side a little bit. And if we reload, uh, we see we have something like this, which you know what, that doesn't look too bad. We might be able to do some padding, something like that. And then yeah, this looks good to me. We can show all photos. Right now it's not going anywhere. So we either need to define, we need to add some JavaScript, like a pop-up that shows all of the images, or we could just have a page for that. So I think I'll just add a new page for that. And to do that, I'm going to add a new route. So we have this resources listings in here. I'm gonna do a resources listing do, and I'm gonna define a new route. So we can do a get images, or actually let's just call it photos, since that's what we're calling it, photos. And then we can say to listings, hashtag photos, hashtag or pound sign, whatever you want to call it. And then that means we'd have a new action inside the listings controller. We could make a full new controller called like photos controller where we list all the photos. That's actually like a more organized way to do it. Or we could just have a new method inside of here that photos where we actually can go and view all those photos. And then we also have to add on member so this means it's going to be defined as a new route that uses the id that we are passing in and now that we have this we can actually go and change this url inside of the show page to a listing photos path and then pass in at listing and then let's go and reload and make sure that that works so actually we're getting undefined method listing photos path I think maybe you have to do photos first, photos underscore listing path. Yep, just like that. And we click here. Uh, it's missing the template actually, but if we went and defined that, then this would work. So defined, to define the photos template, go to the listings folder, create a new file called photos.html.erb. Note that this isn't a partial, like the other files we're creating. This is actually a full template, which means it's a full page that we're going to render and then inside of here you can just simply loop over you say listing uh, images each do just like we had before and then display all of these images with the image tag image and if we go reload oh uh, we're actually seeing this undefined method images for nil so the reason being is we added a new route on the listings controller but we're not running the set listing method that callback that before action callback so to do that we need to go up to the top of this listings controller and you'll see that we're doing set listing but only for these different actions that we set inside of here so to add our photos method we just add it like that and then we reload and boom it's looking i mean <laughs> we need to change the styling but we are seeing all the images which is cool so if we go back to that photos template Let's add some CSS for these images to make them a little bit smaller. So I'm adding a width. Whoa, okay, that looks crazy. Oh, you see why? Because I actually did the equal sign. So we're displaying uh, like all of, we're displaying some stuff that we don't wanna display. So let's delete the equal sign, reload. All right, this looks a lot better. Just side by side. Now to add more of that styling like we had before, we can just wrap this in a div. I think I'll do like grid, grid calls four, gap four. So we can have maybe four images and then something like this. I don't know. I don't really know how we want to style it. Maybe we can make the sizing bigger. Cause this is the page where you're supposed to see them in better detail kind of. But we could also define a new route where we can click in on the image. All right, and you'll notice that actually this image is a little bit bigger than the other ones. I'm not sure why, but to fix that, we can just add a fixed height. 
let's say like the height is 64 and then let's do object cover so we can fit the image inside of that section and yeah this looks a little bit better we have all of our uh, different photos or images displayed here and then even if you look at the route too it looks pretty nice because we just have listings we still have that name in the URL and then we have slash photos this is like easy enough that somebody could share this which actually makes it better than show all photos because I don't think you can just show like display these photos maybe you can probably something up here in the URL I think probably like this part let's try to delete that I mean I don't know <laughs> it's hard to really test but what I do know is that this is looking pretty awesome we already have this much and then what I want to do is up at the top let's add a link back to the listing so if you want to go back and display like and go back to the listing you can just add a link to back to listing and then this will go to the listing path passing listing actually because we have just this listing path you don't even need to do it like that you can just say link to at listing that's a shorthand and that'll also work all right so, so to fix this so that this link isn't on the side but it's actually on the top and we can also style that link a little bit better let's go in here and let's go to a the photos page and I'm gonna wrap this all of the content inside of a div which would be flex flex call which would make all of the items stack on top of each other now the reason why we need to do this is because inside of our layouts application by default the tailwind setup for rails adds this main class around all of our content because see it's wrapping the yield so yield is where all of our pages get rendered so if we wanted to, we could delete this, but then we'd have to change some of the styling around the app just to center the parts that we do want. So I think I'll just leave it for now and then we might want to change that later. So now when we reload with our new flex flex call setup on the photos page, we can actually see our link at the top. And then if we want to style that a little bit nicer, we can go back to the photos page and what I'll do is I'll add a BR tag between the link and then the content so there's a little bit of space now if you see and then if we wanted to make this a bit better we could do a carrot we could try that it's like back to listings I've seen that in some places and yeah you know that's not bad all right so we can show all photos then we can go back to listing if we want we can also style that maybe add some like a background around it let's try BG gray 100 rounded large and then a border maybe a dark border we'll see how that looks Ooh, <laughs> so actually it looks like this whole link is like stretching out to fix that let me do margin right auto and then let me do padding too so that the padding is just to like add some space in between so it doesn't look so small and then we have something like this uh, let's delete the carrot I'm not really liking that Back to listing you know this is not bad but there's definitely some refactoring we could do like i don't know it's not bad for now though back to listing and now we have all of our images still like this looks really nice i'm really happy with the design i did here and then underneath let's display like the title description and all that detail so what i'll do is go back to the show page and i'm going to actually outside of this div i'm going to add an h1 inside the h1 all display the listing title now using an h1 is actually kind of important because uh, this will help your app show up this will help like the pages on your app show up in Google search results because when Google goes and looks at your website it'll look for all the h1s and that helps it index your site so you can show up in searches so putting this in the right in the correct tag is actually pretty important and I'll just make it pretty big text 5xl Ooh, maybe a little bit smaller and also you'll see that it is getting like put side by side and it's still because of that flex class that we have on the application so I could either delete this or just add a flex call div to this page do this flex flex call wrap everything now this looks a little bit better it looks like the MX auto is not taking effect anymore to center the items, which is kind of annoying. And yeah, I do want to center the items. So what we could try is 
do item center. That's a class that gets added with by using the flex class. But it looks like still this div isn't going to the center. So one way to debug this is we can add a background color onto that div to see like what it's doing. And it looks like it's just here. It looks fine, but for some reason it doesn't want to go in the center even though we have MX Auto. That's kind of annoying. I don't know why. Hmm. Why it doesn't want to go into the center. Okay. Because if we do item center, I just saw that that div's not going in the center either. Even though this text is. Oh, I think I know why. So we have to do width full on this element. There we go. Now it looks a little bit better. We don't need to do item center. Although when we don't, we'll notice that our link gets sent all the way over here. So the problem is I want it to be like right underneath the images and fit in the same kind of size. So to do that, we need to add some sort of width on either this top element or just the images. I think let's do on the top element. Let's do a max width 5XL. And then you still want to have the width full so that it'll automatically fill that width. And what I'll do is I'll change the background so that it is on the div just so I can see how much space it's taking. And see, it's taking up a little bit too much space. So maybe 4XL. Still a little bit too much. We try 3XL. And I mean, that's fine. I guess that's fine for now. And then we can always figure this out later. So once we have the 3XL, let's actually add this MX Auto class. We don't need it on that element anymore, but we can put it on the top level element. And now we'll see what's centered. And we can remove that green background color. And then we have something that looks like this, where we still have everything that kind of looks nice. And then we have the title right there. You can also add BRs to add spacing between them. And I might even want to do like a font bold, either bold or semi bold on the title to make it stick out a little bit. Probably more like a semi bold. All right, so like that. I think there isn't a space between semi bold. There's not one of those dashes. All right, something like this. We have entire cabin in Concord, Texas. And then right underneath is where I would put the description. So I'll just go ahead and render out that description. Should already be styled with that description styling. Okay, so this looks pretty good. Yeah, I think this is good for like the first little setup. Oh, we might also want to add a link back to all the listings at the top or something. So to do that on the show page, we can just add it right above the images. I have like a link to back to all listings. And then this will go to the listings path, which is the path for the, all of those listings. So see back to all listings. All right, that looks good. We can also add another BR. So a break between this link and the images. Uh, if we want to make it have the same styling as this back button, which I think you usually do when you like you want to make your site look pretty consistent. So I'll just copy that styling from the other link. And then we have th this nice setup. Yeah, I think this looks really good. Then we can go back view all the listings. We're inside of here. We're looking at this listing. We can show the photos. And yeah, this is, has a pretty nice setup already. So from here, we might add like more information about the listing like they have inside of Airbnb. Stuff like how many guests it'll have, how much, like how many bedrooms, bathrooms, all that stuff. And also like information about the host. And then of course, booking the reservation. Actually, it looks like on Airbnb, you have to get the app to book. But on our website, we don't even have to add like that. But I'm definitely going to add the app too. Just because I feel like that'll be nice. All right, so I want to go ahead and start adding more fields onto our listing model. But first of all, since I deleted all the links, now I can't find the link to edit this listing. So I'm gonna go ahead and add that in. If I come back here in the code and then go to the listing show page, I'll just add it up here to the top next to the back to all listings. So what I'll do is I'll add a div around these and I'll use flex justify between so that the back button is on the left and then our edit link can be all the way on the right. 
feel like that'll look pretty good. And then one thing we want to do is, well, we don't even have users set up yet. We don't have user accounts, but we'd want to only show the edit link to the user that posted the Airbnb or possibly like an admin. But since we don't have users right now, since I didn't add that in, uh, it really doesn't matter. You can have a link edit listing, which is going to go to edit listing path. Then we're going to pass in the listing. And as far as CSS, I don't even think we need like too much CSS. Let's just see what this looks like. All right, so this looks good, although I want this to be more centered. So to center that, we can add item center onto this container that's wrapping in two links. Just like that, we have this nice little setup. We can go to the edit page. And then inside of here is where I'm gonna start adding more fields. So to do that, first we need to have a migration file that we add to the database to support our new fields. But really we could start, we could choose where we wanna go. Do we wanna add the migration first or do we wanna add the UI? I think I wanna add the migrations just so we can get that out of the way. So to add our migration, I'm gonna go into the console. I can, we can stop the server or we can leave it running and do it in a new tab, it doesn't really matter. I'm gonna do a Rails G migration add house info fields to listings. And house info really is just the name I'm gonna use, but the most important part is that we're saying two listings. And then we can do a space and we can add all of our fields that we actually wanna add. So I wanna add bedrooms, which will be an integer, because there will always be a certain amount of bedrooms, you know, like two bedrooms, three bedrooms, however many bedrooms. And then we can do uh, bathrooms, which also is an integer because we're not gonna do like two and a half bed, even though they do that when you're selling houses. For Airbnb, you know, I don't think we wanna do that. Although if we did, then we could use decimal. If we wanted to have like 1.5 bathrooms, but I don't wanna do that. I think it makes more sense to just have integers. So we can have bedrooms, bathrooms. Uh, hmm. What else? How about like fits, like fits, uh, how about limit, like people limit? I don't really know what else they call it. <laughs> Integer, so like you can say how many people, it fits up to this many people. And then anything over, you know, that would basically be against the rules. So let's just leave it at that. We're doing bathrooms, bedrooms, and then people limit. So we're gonna run that migration. And then if we want to look at that migration, see what it generated, we can do a cat on the file. And you'll see it's adding these columns, bedrooms, bathrooms, people in it. So that looks perfect. You can migrate the database. If that doesn't look right, then <laughs> just make sure that you are looking, make sure you're doing this right and you wrote the migration in a way that it's like adding something to the listings, to like the model. Because Rails uses that in the name to somehow uh, do this sort of generation. It's pretty cool, but it also can be confusing as a beginner. So I understand that. Now I'm gonna restart the server and reload. We don't see anything changing on the form. So that's where we have to go and update the UI. So we're gonna come into the code and then go over to the listings form partial. And inside of here, we just need to add those fields somewhere. So possibly at the bottom or possibly like up here, I don't know. What I'm gonna do is, since I wanna have the same styling as the other links, I'm just gonna copy one of these divs that has like the link and then let's just put it down here and we'll get started with bedrooms. So what I'll do is I'll just change this label and text field, the name of it from address to just bedrooms. And then we're also going to do, instead of a text field, it should be a number field. Just like that, and then we have bedrooms. If we came back here, we'll see we have bedrooms and then there's even like this nice built-in UI to select the bedrooms. Now, one thing to note is that you can go negative, which we don't want to allow. So to change that, uh, it's really just changing the HTML on the number fields. We can add a min, and also possibly we can add a max, although there's really, you know, I feel like you can have unlimited bedrooms. But we can do min zero, which means it is not able to go under zero. See, if you try to click, it won't let you. I feel like that looks pretty good. So now we have bedrooms. I'm going to add, I'm gonna really copy this, paste it, and then this is already set up. All I have to do is change the name from bedrooms to bathrooms. And now we have another field for bathrooms right here. 
the bedrooms, bathrooms, and then really since this is just a number, we don't really need it to take like this much space, right? This seems kind of wasteful in terms of UI. So what I want to do is I want to just wrap these two things in a div. We do a grid, grid calls three, gap eight. And then also, oh, I meant to do the div on top of the bedrooms. And then MY, see MY is gonna add a ton of margin. Let's not do that. It's not important anymore. But we can add, let's actually add MY to this top level div. So the same MY, I guess that's fine to add spacing. And if we reload, we'll see something more like this, which I think looks a lot better. And even when you resize, it still looks good. So you can put the amount of bedrooms and bathrooms and then there's enough space for the people limit so we want to add that and just copy another one of these and we'll put this on people limit which I think it sounds kind of stupid you know but like maybe we want to add some text here too so to add custom text we can do uh, a second parameter and just set whatever the title of the label we want to be. So you can say like people limit and do a parentheses and say like suggested is one per bedroom or something like that. Although that's kind of, kind of big. So we might want to do even more styling than that, which is possible. If we just deleted this and then we added maybe like a span. And then since we have some, a span element we can actually make it be like text small so it's a little bit smaller. We can say suggested is one per bedroom and three per bathroom. Something, I don't know. I guess the bathroom part doesn't really matter. <laughs> suggested is one per bedroom. See something like that? Hey, that, that looks pretty good to me. So we have bedrooms, bathrooms, people limit, which we have the suggestion, although really if you want to do two people per bedroom, you can do it, you know? We're not stopping you. So the last thing we want to do is uh, we need to update the controller because right now if we try to save this, we went to update. Well, first of all, the images actually break. Ooh, that's not good. It looks like it's trying to go to the listing show page, but now there's no images to, to display. So actually, we probably want to do a condition around this whole block and say if listing.images.any. to prevent that error so we're not going to display that whole image section unless there's any but another thing to notice is that right now these fields at the bottom aren't getting saved because we're not passing them in if we go back to edit listing see they're not saved uh, it's just not getting filled out so what we have to do is we have to update the controller it's really a tiny change just go into the code go to the controllers listings controller and then all the way at the bottom we have this listing params method which this is what we're using inside of the update action. We're saying li listing.update listing params. And then also when we create it, we're using listing params. And the reason being is that, well, there's this comment, it says only allowed list of trusted parameters. So this makes it so that just in case a user tries to almost like hack the page, like let's say they try to, because you can really do that. You can inspect element, you can inject your own HTML in to the site and then try to like update your user account with all these different parameters. And you can figure out the parameters too by like going into network and just doing all this like hacker kind of coder stuff. That's why we do listing params so that you're only permitting certain parameters that you want the user to be able to change and they're not gonna be able to hack anything. Like let's say if there was a admin parameter on the user, they're not gonna be able to just send admin true to try to update their account to an admin. You know, that would be really bad. That's why we do secure params because we're keeping our site secure. But anyways, we need to permit those new attributes. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And now I think what you wanna do is you wanna put your parameters before your collection parameters, before the array. I don't know if this is actually needed, but I feel like I remember this from a long time ago because, yeah, because see how this is a key? See how images is like a key like that? So. The way that Ruby works is it kind of handles things differently. Like it'll handle these as just arguments, but it'll handle 
this as a keyword parameter. And then you can't really put any more arguments after you do a keyword parameter. So that's why you have to do it first. So we're going to put bathrooms, bedrooms, and then also people limit. And then we can just go ahead and bring this onto a new line because it's getting pretty long. All right, and just like that, now we can go and update our bedroom. So let's say it's five bath or five bedrooms, three bathrooms, and you can host six people. Update listing. You'll see it's just like that, it saves. Now, obviously our images got deleted and that's just a problem with the form. <clears throat> so the way that the form is working right now is we have this basic file field, which nobody really uses basic file fields because they're annoying like this. And it, it turns out it doesn't really save the images because yeah, because when you submit the form again and you didn't have anything selected, it just like resets all the images and gets rid of them. So that's really annoying. And I'm going to get to that in one second. But first, let's display those new attributes like the bathrooms, bedrooms and people limit. So let's go ahead back to the show page and let's put it right underneath the description. And for this, I actually want to do like some cool UI for this. So let's do a div. Let's do grid calls three. Gap eight. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add like this little card pop up. So we can give it a shadow. Maybe have like a little bit of a light background. And then I think I'm gonna use icons to make it more like flashy. So to get some free icons, I'm gonna go to Hero Icons, which is actually made by the creators of Tailwind CSS. And let's see if they have anything for bed. They don't. <laughs> Soilet. <clears throat> like for bathrooms no nope. people user okay so they this is well this is good it doesn't have like specific icons that I want which is annoying so you can either use font awesome if you're really getting serious about this you can use font awesome although it's kind of annoying to set up sometimes but it's easy to style enough and also another thing to notice is that most of the good icons are all pro and you have to pay like a hundred bucks a year to use them and see I don't like this because it kind of just signifies two genders which to me is kind of wrong I would rather just use a toilet oh they do have toilet but, okay let's see how can we install font awesome real quick because I do want to use this uh, let's put this in font awesome toilet if we try to do that right now you'll see there's no toilet uh, but we can underneath we can display listing dot bathrooms and it'll show you the number so see it shows up as three uh, but there's no toilet icon also it's like right close to here let me add some space between the description we can use a break or we could just do like margin it might honestly be better to do margin just so we can do a little bit more of it margin top eight and then let's say we want our container to be like height 40 so it's a little bit bigger like that and then we can also do flex flex call item center so we can stack up the elements put it in center oh i also want to center it uh vertically push it down a little bit like that and then we can make that text bigger too i'm going to wrap our text or our number in this thing and then i'll do so I'll wrap it in a span and I'll add some styling. Something like that. Three. And right now you like you don't really know what's going on because we would need to add the icon to make it more appealing. So let's try to set up font awesome real quick. I'm just gonna look it up how to install font awesome. Looks like it already has a doc for it. <coughs> add the font awesome Ruby gem to your gem file free I need to use the free version font awesome sass the only problem is I don't use sass I don't use scss although can we just can we use it easily enough because I'm pretty sure scss needs a bundling step oh some guy's article install it using import maps let's try to do this without no js okay perfect and he even has a youtube video nice 
Let's do import map pin fort awesome. Okay. Let's go ahead and do that. So I'll go into the terminal. I'll just run a nice like that. Okay, so we should have it. Now we need to change the last file name. Wait, why? He's saying change it to all. All JS instead of just font awesome JS. Okay. Maybe that'll add some things that are needed for our app. I'm not sure. But I'll do what he says. So let's go to config import map.rb. And well actually there's <laughs> it doesn't even look the same as what he had. Okay, I'm just gonna leave it. I don't know if that's important because it looks like my code's different anyways. But it says include font awesome in our project. So in application JS we need to import font awesome. So in this file, app JavaScript application JS, which we do have one of those. So if we come to app JavaScript, we do have an application JS where we're importing a lot of the other things that we're using, like hotwire, tricks, action text. So we're also going to import font awesome. And wow, it looks like just like that you can start using it. No way. So let's make sure that we go back into the terminal, start the server again. And I'm going to reload and see if it's working, <laughs> which it's not working. At least I don't see it working. Oh, that's annoying. Yeah, there's just nothing there. Let's check console. There's no logs or anything. Hmm. Well, awesome free. Okay, I have an idea. Maybe it's maybe we're requiring the wrong file because we're using the free version. Let me check the config import map. No, it is using free. Well, awesome free. Font awesome is not working. We need to pin all of them. Wow. Okay, fine. I'll try it. Saying I need to import like three or four libraries. So I guess I'll delete the one that I have right now. And then just run this command, which is it's pinning font awesome free, font awesome SVG core, free brands icons, like so much stuff. Jeez, that's a lot. And then he says, then in your application JS, you need to add all of this. Wow. See, I didn't know we need to do that much work. <laughs> so this, like that's kind of insane. But let's see, that it might work. Start the server with bin slash dev. Reload and look at that, it works. Okay, I'll give you a thumbs up. I guess I need to sign in to do that. I'll give you a thumbs up. Oh yeah, nice. Hey, it looks like I helped somebody. Sweet. But this guy actually helped me. He's a legend. Now let's try to style this toilet so that it looks better. So let's go back to the listing show page. All right, so we have this toilet here and I think to make it bigger, we do FA 2X. Oh yeah, we made it a little bit bigger and I want to style it for sure. Like I think we'd style it by using just like the same way we'd style text. Text gray 500. And I don't really know what's gonna make it look better. So I wonder if we can do 3X because I want it to be like pretty big. It looks like I can. Yeah, I don't want it to be that dark though. This is kind of tricky. Like what te what color should I make it? I guess that's fine, right? I don't know what would look better. Alright, let's add let's at least add rounded on this box. Because right now it just looks too square. Three. Okay, maybe two X. And then I want to make this text bigger three bathrooms <laughs> it looks pretty bad I don't know how to f I mean I should know how to make it look better because I am the senior developer so we just figured out like 
what will make it maybe using the Airbnb red color to kind of make it look like it pops out a little bit. Let's do red. Makes red 600. Mm, I don't know. And maybe we can get an outline too. Instead of solid, we can do FA outline. Mm, no, that's not working. Let me know in the comments what you guys would think. What do you guys think would make this design better? Probably adding some custom font for the number. I just can't seem to figure it out. I'm gonna add semi bold on the number too. All right, that's a little bit nicer, a little bit like thicker letter. But I just don't like the coloring. Maybe let's delete the BJ Gray 100. I feel like that adds a kind of a gross look. Oh yeah, cause see with the shadow it already kind of sticks out. I like that. But I just can't get past the coloring. I don't know. Maybe we'll just leave it black. Okay, fine. You know what? That that actually doesn't look too bad. Now let's look for a bed one. So we do have a bed one. It's just FA-bed. It's usually pretty simple. So what I'll do is I'll copy this container that we have. I'll actually put the beds first. And instead of bathrooms text, we'll do bedrooms. Instead of toilet here, we'll do FA bed so we can get the bed icon. Let's reload. Oh, this is looking pretty good. So we have beds, bathrooms, and then we're gonna do finally the people limit. So I'll copy the div again. Change this to people limit, and then we're gonna need an icon of like a person. Person or like people. I think person fine. It's probably fine. It's just FA person. Like that. Reload. And yeah, this looks pretty good. So we have bedrooms, bathrooms. Now one thing I just noticed is when I resize to go to mobile. It looks like our photo preview feature gets kind of messed up and the images on the right side just get all squished. So I'm going to go ahead and fix that right now real quick. So to do that, we're going to go into our app folder views listings and then inside the listing folder, it's going to be on the show page. That's where we're rendering all that content. So we have to come in here and figure out what's going on so we can try to fix this. So actually it's right here how we have a div class flex. So what we need to do is we need to have flex call on mobile. And then we can have a medium breakpoint which changes the flex row. So it'll switch from being stacked on top of each other to being side by side. And now when we reload, we'll see something like this which looks a lot nicer. So we just kind of have this view, and then if you do want to show all photos, you could click here. All that page is kind of squished too. We can try to figure that out. So first of all, I think it would be nice if we could take this top image and make it stretch all the way. So that's another thing we could change up here, where we have that width 80. We can just do a medium breakpoint for that, and it should automatically do width 100, so you just like this. All right, and I mean, honestly, this looks pretty good to me. I don't know, you might want to squish this down even more and compress it, possibly, but I'm kind of fine with this. Another thing we could do is maybe like grid calls two on medium, but we could do grid calls four on small screen, and then we could just make these images kind of like smaller tiles. Instead of height 36, we do like height 10. If we reload, now we have something like that, so the images are a bit smaller, although they're kind of stretched weirdly, so we probably want to do a fixed width, width 10, and then medium width auto, so it's not going to affect the size when it's larger. See, it just goes back to the normal size, which is good. Uh, these images are still kind of weird, so oh, let's reduce this gap make that only on medium and there's still kind of a lot of space we could increase these images maybe height 20 there we go and that looks like a little bit nicer for a mobile experience 
and then we will resize it goes back to the original design all right i think i like that and then also on the photos page we could change this so these images don't look like uh, the way that they look like these tiles that are kind of strange so to do that we'll go over to this photos page and then inside of here we're going to add a breakpoint for the grid calls for so that only apply on larger than medium screens now we get something that looks like this which already i mean it looks not bad but i might want to change this width so that that only gets applied on medium and then maybe do width full Try to stretch it out the full width. There's still like a little bit of offset space. So I want to figure out what's going on there. Maybe I should do width full on this div too. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. It's fine though. <clears throat> There's just a little bit of space. Maybe I'll do a background to try to help me figure that out. Okay, I want to try to figure out why there's a tiny bit of space more on the right side. It might have stemmed from this top level div. Let me put some BG green on that. Let's see, okay, so let's see this div isn't stretching all the way. I guess we just need to give it a width full. Help it out there, and there we go. Now it, it, was, it was only like a centimeter, but it was kind of bugging me in my mind. It's like that little bit of offset. All right, so now we got this. Let's delete those greens. Cool, so now we have the like the expanded view of all the photos. And then also we have this little preview. And this is looking pretty good to me. So the next thing I want to go and focus on is this image select. I want to make this a lot nicer because right now it doesn't even show that we have any images selected. It just says no file chosen, even though we have multiple images. And then also when I'm creating new listings, I want it to be a nicer experience. So that when you like add the images, there's a little preview and everything, and then you can delete ones that you didn't mean to add. So let's get started on that. So what we're going to do to add that better file select is we're going to have a little bit of custom JavaScript that attaches to this file field. And then we'll also use active storage and a direct upload library built into active storage. So let's just quickly look that up, active storage with direct upload. And you'll find a good example on uh, rubyonrailsguides.com. They have this whole section on active storage. So to use it, we first need to add the package. So since we use import maps, we're gonna, instead of doing like a yarn add, we're gonna do an import map pin. So let's run that. So let's go to the console and I'll run dot slash bin import map pin rails active storage all right just like that we have active storage and then now we can go and import it into our application js so over here in javascript application js i'm just going to import active storage and i'm going to start it the next thing that we can do is add direct upload true to the file field now this is if you want to use the built-in file field like the normal HTML file field, but we could also use a library like drop zone, which might allow us to have a more customized UI design, but I'm fine with just using the built in and I'll just write some custom code to make it look prettier. Cool. So from there, uh, there's really just a few more things. So they have this example right here in JavaScript where they add an event listener and then they just do all this stuff from here. So I think the point is that direct upload will automatically be working when you choose a file. Like they even have an example right here. So actually, oh, it looks like when you create the document, then it uploads. Hmm. That's kind of interesting. see it again so they select the files and then they create it and then it does the whole UI 
See, I've done it differently in the past. You can use Direct Upload class for this purpose. Upon receiving a file, instantiate a Direct Upload and call it Create Method. So I guess there's two ways of doing it. We could just simply add a like some sort of event listener onto that element. But this is kind of interesting because then it happens after you press the create button. There's no like advanced UI that lets you preview the images or anything. So I think I'm gonna use this uh, example to use the class directly. And then we're gonna create a custom stimulus controller. So let's go ahead and do that. The first thing I'm gonna do is create the stimulus controller. I'm just gonna do that in the console because there's a nice command for that. Let's say rel stimulus image upload. That's what I'll call it. And then just like that, we can restart the server. I'll come in the code and then add that JavaScript. I think what I'll do is I'll just add it on this top level element and then I might have like the previews show up right underneath this file field. So to add our CMOS controller, I'm gonna type data controller on the div and then I'm gonna set it to image dash upload. And then what I'll do is I'll set the file field for images as a target on this controller. So to do that, I'll add a data attribute and inside of this these brackets, I'm gonna say image upload target. And then we could just put in like input or you could put file field, whatever you want to call your target. And now I have to go add that into our stimulus. So to find our stimulus, you can just go into the app JavaScript and then the controllers folder. This is added when you create your app, you have all your controllers, you'll store them inside of here. And you'll see with that command, we got this controller generated for us and it's an image upload controller. So this is already going to have JavaScript on it and we can add some code in the connect, which is whenever the controller shows up on the page. So just in case you wanted to see that it's working, you always have the JavaScript now since we added it. I'm just gonna do this message in the connect just so you can see that. If I reload, we get this hello message from the image upload controller. This is really cool. From here, I'm gonna add a target and do static targets equals input. So now we have that input target. And then I'm also gonna wanna add a callback for whenever a file gets selected. So to do that, I'll add action inside of this data brackets. So we're setting data and then we're setting these different data attributes. Because that's how stimulus works. It goes all through the data attributes. So we have our target and then we also have an action. So for the action, we just do image dash upload file added. Now we're gonna call it file added function whenever the file is selected. So all I'll do is I'll come back into here and I'll just rename the connected function to file added. And then we're gonna get an event in here. And I can just console log file added and I'll pass the event so I can look at that in the console. Now when we reload and we go and select an image, like this, we get this event file added. And then inside of here, we have the event and we should have a few other things. Although I'm not sure how we can get the file out of this from this event. Event.target. All right, it's temp one. Oops. Oh, we can, we can just say files and get it back as an array of files. So it actually is that easy. So inside of our code, we can get those files. Saying let files equals e.target.files. 
Now we can do files for each file. And then we'll loop over the files. And then inside of here is where we upload them. So we're going to print it out for now. Uploading file, file. And let's see how that works. So if we go to select our image, boom, we actually see files for each is not a function. Hmm. Okay, I think because it's not an array, it's just going to return like some sort of other structure. So we need to say array from the files. And then we can loop over it like that. If I come back in here, no, oh, just like that, we get our uploading file message. And then we have this file with all that different information. And if we were to select multiple files, you'll see that we get the event for each file. This is great. Now, inside of here is where we would do our direct upload and we start this whole process. So, what we're going to do is, I guess we'll just copy this class because they kind of have this whole uploader class thing. So first of all, let's import direct upload at the top of our controller. And then I guess we can do this loader class, although it's kind of a lot of code. I'll just paste it at the bottom after our stimulus controller. Now we have an uploader that we can call up here. We can say like let direct upload equals new uploader and then we pass in the file and also the url so the direct upload url we're going to get this from the input so actually if we still have that in the console Temple.target data set and look at the data set that we have. So we have the image upload target, so that's setting as a target. We also have the action, but the other thing we have is direct upload URL, which is where we have to send these files to upload them to our Rails app. So see, Rails makes a custom, or really the active storage framework makes a custom URL in your app that allows you to upload these files. So we just have to get that URL from this object, which is going to be direct upload URL. So that's pretty easy. You can just write it out like this. And then now into our uploader, we're going to pass that direct upload URL. And then this dot upload equals new direct upload. Okay, this is weird because why do they have a method called upload and then also a variable called upload I don't get it let's see what happens now let's see if this uploads without changing anything I'm kind of confused Looks like nothing happened. If we check in the network, we're not seeing anything getting triggered in the network tab. So I'm not really sure. Your console log here. Creating direct upload. All right, it says that it's creating the direct upload. And we also console log that object that we just created. So we have an uploader. It says the files undefined. Hmm. We should have had a file. Uploader. And we still get that like file undefined type of thing. I'm kind of confused about this. So do we also have to call upload? I think we might have to. 
So it's called direct upload dot upload and then pass in the file again. It's kind of weird. All right, so now we get type error, direct upload, upload is not a function. Which is weird because it looks like it's a function. Wow, this direct upload example needs some help because this doesn't make any sense. It's actually kind of confusing. I'm guessing that you mostly use it just for the callbacks. Like, why do we have two? Why do we have like this to upload and then? We actually have a method called upload. And then we're passing in file, but we're not even using the file. It's kind of weird. Hmm. I really want this to work. So we're supposed to be creating this direct upload, setting it as a variable this dot upload, but then we're overriding this function. So I don't understand. Let's try to change the function name, upload file, and then we could call direct upload upload file. Possibly this will work. We're getting cannot read properties of undefined reading size on file checksum. So, I don't know, is it just like the type of file that we're adding doesn't have a size attribute? I'm going to try to look this up. Yeah, I don't know. See, I'm wondering if it's because usually I've done direct upload with something like drop zone. I don't know if you have to process the file and do something to it. Although there is an attribute size, so why is it saying to not read properties of it? That's weird. File checksum. See, this size, we do have size on the file. Well, let's store this and just call about size. We do have it. So I'm really not sure what's happening. Oh, one thing, isn't it expecting a blob? Or that's what we're going to get back from it. Hmm. Yeah, this code's so weird. Also, why is it passing this dot file when we should just be passing file, right? And this dot URL again. I'm kind of confused by that. Right, like, wouldn't we have to set dot file equals file dot URL equals URL for this part to work? So I don't know why they left that out. All right, I don't see anything happening, but I think maybe if we call, we are calling upload file. That's strange. Let's check the network. Oh, we actually did get a request to direct uploads. Interesting. We do this again. Oh yeah, look at that. We're actually making the request now. 
I guess that was what was missing. I don't know why they don't tell you that in the example. This code is just wrong. This code is completely wrong. First of all, like there's so many things. So I guess I should try to make a contribution right now. But yes, I'm really excited to get to the part that I want to see, which is like the previews for the images. So let's get started on that. So first of all, a cool part of this is doing the direct upload progress. So this part is pretty exciting. Now we can do add the events. <clears throat> direct upload did progress events, so we can actually console log this and we should be able to see how our progress is coming through when we're uploading an image. So see it's actually working, we got this progress event, which since we're on local, it only did one of them because it's just like instantly. There's no latency since we're on the local computer. But we'll see how this will affect other things. So like when we call this upload function, we're uploading right here. And then down here at the end, we actually have like our uploaded file. The file was uploaded, and we have this blob with a blob signed ID. See, just like that, we get this event file was uploaded, and then we have all of this information about the file. As long as, and as well as the file itself, which is right here, because we're passing it in. So if we wanted to say like, display it right here on the page, we could do that too. So what I usually do is I do it from the back end because we do have the file. So we could say like console log file. We might be able to make something happen. Okay, so actually I've done this before and I guess you can do this. Although set the source, that's not what I was saying. How to display an image from a file input. See, I have done this before. Right, and it involves a reader. So you have to say like file reader, and then you read as data URL, and you have a reader on load. So this is essentially the bulk of the code right here. And then inside of here, inside of the onload function, is where we'd actually append it. So instead of document body, let's do uh, the controller, which we don't have set. So let's add that as another argument inside of our constructor we pass controller and we can set with our controller equals controller and then up here when we're initializing it we'll just pass in this as the last option so now we have a direct link to our stimulus controller so down here inside of the onload function also let's remove the function keyword because when we have a function keyword we're no longer allowed to use this to access things off the class. We're going to switch it to arrow syntax. And then now we can use this. So down here, when we're doing document body, instead of that, we'll say this.controller.element. We're going to append the child on that. And let's just see what this looks like, although it's not going to be anything crazy. But we're able to display these images just like that so, which actually that's pretty cool we just need to work on the UI design so since we have this image element that we're creating and we could actually do like a advanced JavaScript start adding styling here or we could do something like a like a preset inside of the HTML that we copy that's another option like imagine we had a template. Templates like a way that you can usually do things like this. So inside of a template, none of this code gets displayed on the page, but we can use it to like have some sort of like an image tag. That's not going anything to anywhere, but we can set some classes on it. Like width 10, height 10, object cover. And then inside of our image upload.js, we could access this image tag. 
So let me set it as a target on our image upload controller. So we do that by saying image upload target. And then we'll do a template image. So we have this one image tag and then inside of our image upload controller, we'll add that as target. And what we'll do is for our image, instead of being this image, we're going to say it's going to be this.controller.template image target. And then we're going to somehow need to like clone it. <laughs> Let me look that up real quick. Clone, oh, I guess it's pretty easy. Clone node. I'm also not going to use var because that's pretty outdated at this point. Let's use, if we're not going to change it, let's do const. So if we're not going to ever redefine the variable, which we're not redefining it, we're just changing an attribute on it. So that's fine. Now let's take a look at what this will look like. If we go upload an image. We totally get missing target element template image huh so that's not right I think maybe because we're inside of a template and it's not displaying we can't actually use that as a target so we might have to use the template element itself as the target we can add our data image upload target attribute on the template I'll still say image preview but instead of doing a clone node we actually have to do almost like an inner HTML or to get the actual I might have to say children zero to get like the first child I don't know let's experiment we still get miss missing target element template image oh template image I was calling it image preview okay I guess that wasn't the problem <laughs> Wait, actually, no, it wasn't working here, and we changed it, but then I changed the name because I kind of forgot or something. So we called it template image. Let's just call it template for good. Uh, templates, just so we don't get confused. And since that's actually a template element, where it's, it's not the image itself. And then just make sure to update in the other spots to the correct code. So now we're saying... We're going to get our template target. We're going to try to get the children off of that. Let's see what that does. It says, cannot set properties of undefined. So I guess it wasn't able to find the children. But let me count the log this. Children, yeah, it doesn't, it's not able to find that. So I guess template template element works kind of differently than I expected it's mostly for getting the inner HTML so if we were just to do like inner HTML we would probably see our image so yeah we have this like children image so I guess what we can do is let's have some sort of string inside of source that will replace so we can do that by inside of the image tag we could say like template image like this and inside of our JavaScript, we'll just say like comp preview equals template target in our HTML. And then almost like replacing that replace template image with. Well, I don't even know what was it. E target result. Oh, right, right here. And then instead of append child, it almost needs to be like append inner HTML. So you can do that by doing plus equal. This is getting kind of crazy. Oh, look, the asset template image is not present. Whoops. 
So I guess we can't use image tag then. This image tag is going to throw that error. This is already kind of getting out of hand. All right, forget it. Forget the template. Maybe the template was a bad idea. We can delete template because as you saw before, it was working. Uh, let's just forget. Let's forget about the whole template code, right? Let's go back to just creating the image. This was very simple. All right, it creates the image. Just like that, we have a working display, although the images just aren't kind of like the size or the styling that we want. But actually in this code, it's easy enough to change some things about the image. Like we could just say image.classList add, and then just add all the classes that we want. So like width 10, height 10, object cover. And this really isn't so bad. The only thing is it's not very friendly, like if we want to reuse this code, because we're always trying to force it with this one class. But that's really fine, like how many times are we really going to use this in our app? Let's just try to get something that works. So this kind of works, although it stacks it up in a row. So what we can do is we can have a certain section in our form that we display the images, and then we'll have some styling on that div. So yeah, I'm going to create a div, I'm going to give it, I'm going to turn it to a target, so I'll say beta image upload target preview. All right, it's just going to be an empty div where we're going to preview the images, but then I'll add some styling, like I'll give it grid, grid called 4, gap 8, and then instead of doing this controller element, we'll do it on the this controller preview target. We also have to set that target up at the top. So just simply preview. Now let me select a few images. Boom, they just get added like that. We can select more. So kind of like this sort of look, which it's not bad, you know. But we don't really have any like if we want to add more code on it like buttons that'll remove it like we definitely don't want to write that all from javascript that's where this sort of way of doing it just gets like it's simple but it's not good enough because as soon as we try to add more functionality it's just going to load up this function right here and it's going to be too much code and then all of this specific code for one page which we don't want to have that here what I think we'll do is let's definitely show a loader for the images but then we can once we're done like loading we can replace them from the back end that's how I usually do it so what I would do is let's just get started with doing that from the back end so right here instead of doing all this preview code on the front end I'll just post our server I'll post I'll send a message to the server with the blob signed ID. The blob signed ID is all is the only thing we need because we already have the blob stored in the back end. We have it in a database table. So we just need to send a message to the server. Then the server can look up the blob and it can render a template for that blob. Okay, so to start adding some of these things. First thing I'm going to do is create that route. So we're going to need a new route and controller action for the file uploads. We could create a new controller or we could just do it on the listings controller. At this point, it's probably better to just create a new controller. So what I'll do is I'll put a resource file uploads only create scope or no not scope module listings so what this means it's going to expect a file uploads controller 
inside of a listings namespace. So to do that, we have to go over over to the app controllers folder, then create a new folder called listings. And inside of here, we'll create a file called file uploads controller the RB. Inside of here, we'll have a module listings and a class file upload controller and inherit from application controller. And then we'll add a create action. Perfect. And then inside of here is where we're going to handle first finding the file. So the file is going to come from active storage blob dot find signs. And then we'll pass in the blob signed ID. And then now that you have this like the file, we could easily display it in so, some sort of template, right? And then we could render it on the page. So what I'll also do is uh, inside of this preview, we can give it ID, image previews. We could kind of use that to target from the file uploads controller. Uh, but let's not, let's just make sure that this is all working first. What I want to do is I want to pass the URL into our Sigmas controller. And I could do that by using a data attribute. So we can have data image upload URL value. And then we have to give it that, that route or that route to inside of here for the listing. So actually one thing about this is since we're using resources, it's going to expect that this nested resource has an ID of the parent listing. We actually don't want that. So to fix that, I'm actually just going to do a namespace listings. And then we don't need the module listings either. Uh, that way we don't need to have the listings ID passed in. And then to verify all of this, we can go into the console and do a rail routes which will display all the routes, and then we can look for that specific route that we just created. So down here, listings file upload path, you'll see that no ID is required anymore. There shouldn't, we shouldn't require an ID. All right, so then I'll go back to the form, and I'll set this listings file uploads path as this value. Then let's go into the stimulus. I'm gonna add a section up at the top static values and then we're going to have this URL string so that's what we called it and then way down here in the upload file function after we get like the file was uploaded we're going to make a post to that URL say post this dot controller dot URL value and for the parameters we're going to have just body and then we'll pass blob signed ID, which is gonna come from the blob dot signed ID, just like this. Now since we're gonna use async await, we have to say await post, and we also have to mark this function as async. I do see problem here. Oh, because we need to add request.js for post. So that's another library, just like all the other Rails libraries. Uh, to add this, we can do dot slash bin slash import map pin at rel slash request dot js. Just like that, we got request js. And then up here at the top of the file, we can import the method that we're using, which is going to be post from rails request dot js. Just like that. And oh, I'm actually still seeing add async modifier to containing function. Oh, I guess it's not this upload file. It's actually like this arrow function in here. This looks kind of weird, but hey, it's get it. It got it to stop. So I guess we just put async like that. And then we're gonna wait this post. Let's see what this does. <laughs> I'm kind of interested. Maybe I should have the network tab open so we can see all of our requests that get fired. So when we click this, oh, we have two requests. So we have one for direct upload. We actually have three. Then we have another one 
for the actual like direct upload complete or something when it stores the file. And then we have a third one, which is going to our custom route file uploads controller. This is pretty cool. And then inside of here, we would have the file. So what we want to do is just like render it into the form. Since we're using Turbo and everything, what we can do is we can have a matching Turbo Stream template. So to do that, we can go into the Views folder in the listings. Let's create another folder called File Uploads. So this will line up with uh, like the correct template because Rails will automatically look for a matching template for this name. So if we create that file inside of the right spot, which would be in the listings folder file uploads. We have the file called create turbostream.erb. It's gonna render this as a turbo stream. And inside of here we could do something like turbo stream append. Because we want to append it to that image previews div. Pass it a block. And then if you remember we do have the app file that blob. So I'm pretty sure it's as easy as just saying image tag at file and then any CSS that we want to add to like, as far as classes. If we want to do the, the height 20 object cover thing, we could do that. And let's just reload and see what happens. So should we be are getting a bad response from the server now? So to take a look at what's happening, we can just open up our Rails logs and it should show us what's going on. So it's saying the create is missing a template for the request format and variant. Oh, yeah. So actually, I guess it's expecting since we are doing a template now, it's thinking that we should have an HTML one, just the way that things are set up right now. You might want to do like respond to format format turbo stream. And just pass an empty block. Let's see if that fixes things. Still no. We're just getting like not acceptable inside the console. It says unknown format. All right. So the reason being is actually from our stimulus and the request JS. I guess what's happening is it's thinking it should return HTML or whatever, and it's not doing it. So what we have to do is we have to set the response kind attribute. We have to set it to turbo dash stream. So now it's going to expect a turbo stream as a response. Now when we go, we do it. Boom! Look, it actually popped up right there. And we could add more. You know what? This looks pretty good to me. The only thing is there is kind of a lot of space. So I was thinking. Maybe instead of grid, we could change it to flex. So if you go back to the form partial, where we have this preview section, we had we were using grid. We might just want to do flex and flex wrap so that if it does fill up the space, it will wrap around. And it will leave the gap too. And then what you see is it looks more like this, a little bit more pretty. Yeah, just like that, we have image previews in the app. Now, one thing I also want to change is the text on this, I don't want this to maintain like the three files text. I think to do that in the JS, we actually have to clear out the file field after we upload. So like right here, we're looping through. We actually want to, when we're done with this, we want to like clear out the files. So remove files from input JS. Like that. It looks like oh, we set the value to zero, so I think that's what we want to do. Just simply, e target value is nothing. So empty string. Let's take a look at what happens. We upload, but then the text doesn't change, which I think that's fine. Although the no file chosen text is kind of weird. So also, let's make sure that everything is kind of like tied in here because I think right now it's not a hundred percent so for one thing I mean like these images aren't gonna save let's go ahead and create a sample house so I'm gonna go to Airbnb and just 
get some information to use. Malibu Dreamhouse. This is interesting. This is no way this is a real place. That looks crazy. Right, and then I go with some maps. Whoops. I just need a, an address. Simple test address. Santa Monica. Pop it in. I'm gonna grab this. These images are crazy though, I don't know. I think it actually looks like that too. That's kind of gross. <laughs> I'm a Barbie girl. No, this is pretty gross. The funny thing is I'm doing all this work and then it's not even going to save because we don't have the saving set up yet, but that's fine. So when we go and select those new images, boom, they do show up as previews. And then we'll just set like the, all the other information, create listing, now what happens is the images didn't save. They just didn't get sent. Since we cleared out the input, we are showing them, but we're not saving them. And the reason being is we just don't have them sent in the request. We don't have them in the form. So we need to have a hidden field, basically. Hidden field tag inside of here would be the name of it, which would be, it would need to match up to the request. So if you look at the request, let me scroll down here. The actual request to like create the record. Maybe right here. Oh, right here, parameters. See, so we're posting to listings, which means this is where we're creating the listing. We have all of this stuff. So the main thing is we have a key a listing and then inside of it, we have all these parameters. And right here we have images set to empty array. So it's not coming through. We need to set that images inside a listing. So that's what the name of it would be. It would be listing images like this. And then also square brackets means it's an array. So there could be multiple of them. And I guess the value would be the file dot or size ID like that. And I think that should fix our problem. So it'll actually save the images. We update listings. Uh, we got mismatch digest. To make sure everything's good, let's look inside of here. Images. Oh, look, it's actually trying to pass in value. So maybe we don't need the value part. Let's delete that. So just hidden field tag, name, value. Let's try that again. Select our images, update listing. And, ooh, we only got one of them. That, that must have been an issue with this. Maybe that's not how we're supposed to do it. Listing images. Maybe we should put like a random ID in here. I've seen that before. We'll put like super random X6. Something like that. Select the images. Update listing. Oh, now it just didn't even work. The routing error. Invalid or incomplete post params, basically. So it didn't like my parameters. It's funny because I've done this before. I just need to figure it out. Even if we look in the documentation, I think they had a section on this. So it's like creating a hidden field. Value blob side ID. Hidden field names input dot name. So that is the thing. We need to have the same name as this image is. So what is this name? If I inspect it. It looks like the name is listing images square bracket, right? That should be fine. But I thought we just had 
we just had this and it wasn't it only uploaded the first one so let me quickly go and consult in my own code in my other app because i do have a similar thing like this I look for underscore audio fields let's see where the hidden field is file uploads audio file right so inside of here we do have the hidden field tag oh but it wasn't even a multiple situation looks like i haven't covered that yet all right maybe this will work with the square brackets who knows let's try it again update listing no it's only getting like one of the images So let's take a look at the HTML when we do this. Inspect here. Oh, oh, weird. <laughs> look at that, we get multiple images, but we only get one input with the hidden fields. This is pretty weird. Listing image, why are we only getting one of them? I'm not sure, but let's try to wrap these in a div just to be sure. And then take a look at what happens. Let's inspect. Okay, now we have a div wrapping each one and we have multiple hidden fields so I think maybe this will work update listing hey, and just like that it is working so I guess it's important for some reason to wrap these in a div because the hidden field is getting lost somehow I'm not sure how but something and something along the way in the process was breaking hiding the hidden fields or like removing it really all right cool so now when i go back to edit listing we can actually see that the images like we can't tell that we have four images already and we can't, can't append to them either because if we upload more images they'll just replace the old ones so to fix that we actually would need to display this preview so what i'll do is i'll move this into a partial let's just create a new partial inside of this file uploads folder i'll call it underscore image dot html that you're be and then inside of the image it's just what we have here and instead of file at file because that's looking for a instance variable let's just pass an image and then what we can do is inside of this template we'll just render image and an image is going to be at file just like that pretty clean and simple then inside the form inside of this preview what we'll do is we'll say we'll loop over the listing.images each do image Oops. and then we'll render listing slash file upload slash image and it's important to specify the whole path because we're inside of a different scope see we're not inside the file uploads controller anymore we're inside the listings controller so you want to specify the full path to the partial and pass an image as image actually i think i don't know if this is coming back as a blob or not we might have to say image dot blob it's coming back as an attachment, I think. And then we have to say blob to have the same like expected code. Let's go ahead and reload. And just like that, we'll see these are our current images. If we update the listings, they're still there. This is perfect. Now, if we wanted to add like a remove button, it's actually super easy since we have this organized into this nice little cute partial. Adding a remove button would just be as simple as 
adding like a link to and we'll use that font awesome icons since we have those in our app I love font awesome because it's just super easy so if I search up X it's as simple as a little X mark plop that in and then we might want to make it red too so it's like you know you're removing the image so already this looks like not bad and then if we want to position it on top of the images let's add a class of relative to this div and then on our link actually we'll add a class uh, so I think okay, that should be fine we'll just say absolute top zero right zero reload and now we have the red X button on top of the image although it is kind of hard to see so you might want to add a BB Ray 700 or some sort of background just to us okay that's probably fine let's do px2 pvi1 there's a little bit of well, that might be a little bit too much let's do rounded full so that's all the way around Okay, I mean, it's not terrible. It's a little bit large, though. But we can actually do, like, text small, which should make it a little bit smaller. Maybe instead of a dark gray, we could go with a light gray. Alright, I mean, that's not terrible, although I wish it was more properly rounded. That's fine. Okay, PX3 seemed to do it like rounded, but it's just like so large. It's a little bit too large. I don't know if I want to have all of this padding and making it into a fat button. I don't really know what the best UI for this is, but one thing is we can make it stick off of the side. So instead of doing zero, we can do like top two right four we should position a little bit more maybe top one right three even right two i know this is a lot of fine tuning but now we have like the x button but i can hardly see it That's the only problem so if i do add a background at least there's like a little bit of space maybe i'll just do p 0 0.5, there's like just a tiny bit of padding. EX 0 0.5. Round it full. Maybe PX 1. Something like that, but I still want to have it more like in the top right corner. So maybe actually we'll do top zero, right zero again. We can actually do negative to make it kind of like slide on the outside of the box. Okay, so now it's like at the top right corner. Actually, I like this a lot more. Uh, one thing is I want to add some space between the file field and the display. So to do that, let's go back in the form and let's just add a BR on top of our preview div. All right, and then already this looks this looks pretty good to me. We can add new images, and then right away it's just like looking good, looking clean. We have all these images. We have this nice preview setup. But when we click the button, well, nothing's happening. We have to add in the code for that. And to do that, it's actually pretty simple. Inside of this image partial, we just need this button to remove this element when we click on it. We can honestly create a whole stimulus controller for this. Let's do a data controller. Dismiss. Or we could call it like <clears throat> uh, well, there's a few ways I've done this. So we could have a whole like dismissible controller. Or we can make a util controller, which is like our our quick JavaScript. We can have like a bunch of functions on our utils controller and then we can reuse them all over the app. 
that's another thing that I've done in the past. So to do that, we would just go and create the single controller. So in the console, run Rails G Stimulus Utils. Right, now we have a new Utils controller. Utils, by the way, is short for utility. It just I've seen this used before, and then we could have like remove parent. It basically, just removes. How about we, let's just say like remove. All right, all this is gonna do is just say this dot element dot remove. We have the data controller. And then on this link, we'd have that data action. Data action, utils, remove. And then it's really as simple as that. So I like using utils because then we can reuse it all over our app. And if I reload, click on one of these. Actually, it's, oh, we need to prevent the default for the link. That's one thing to note. So we have to pass the parameter in and then just do prevent default reload and now we can delete the images that we don't want oops I can't really see the bottom of the page now we can go update listing and you'll see that it actually works this is awesome so just like that we have a clean front end file select feature for our app so I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It was kind of a bit of a longer one just because I was getting used to direct upload. I had to do a contribution. But just like this, we have a better file select for our form. Now one thing is I can't scroll down, I guess. So let me try to add some padding on the bottom of the page. That's pretty annoying. So on the edit page, we can do padding bottom. 20. So we have a little bit of you know, way room. Even on the new, there's not very much padding, so I can add some padding bottom 20. Now I can zoom down. And yeah, let's say we're going to create a new listing now. Just let's end the video off with this. So I think I want to do Austin. Let's go and find a nice house in Austin. Home in Dripping Springs. And then we're going to create this house. Let's go find a example address. <coughs> Obviously this isn't the real house. I'm just going to use it for my example. description and then let's also get some images and I'm just going to show you how useful this feature is going to be already so like let's go and select the images let's just select all the images for the day and then you'll notice like some of these these aren't right so I'm going to X out and now we just have the ones that we want right here now we can add the amount of bedrooms, bathrooms, and the people limit. Well, I don't like how the people limit is, uh, duh, duh, duh. you can see how it's like going on a new line, so it's kind of messing up the form. But anyways, the rest of this works really well. Short listing, so this all looks good, although <laughs> this is weird now that images are getting messed up. I think that might be because, didn't I set with auto on show page yeah, in this image tag we have with auto actually I want to do with full not with auto See, this looks better although it still looks kind of stretched oh so let's make sure that we have the object cover class so that it doesn't get stretched and let's also add it to the main like the large image oh, whoops, wrong place right here <laughs> on this image tag Boom. All right, this is pretty good. Ooh, maybe I'll add some padding on this show page too. I don't like how there's no padding. 
actually instead of adding the padding here let's just delete it from the new and the edit let's just add it in the application layouts if we go over to layouts application file inside of here we have this main container with the margin top i think we might as well do like let's just do padding bottom 28 we have a little bit of space to scroll to all right this looks pretty good Listing. We can clean this up, the people limit, because this is like, I hate how it's uh, overflowing. So let's go to the form, scroll down, and let's see how we can make this better. People limit. <clears throat> Even people limit is kind of like weird. You could say capacity. No, it's not really better. You know what? We could just delete that this message entirely because it's kind of messing up the form. Bedrooms, bathrooms, people limit. Hmm. And if we wanted to think rethink that design to make it a little bit better and still have a side message, we could do that, but. I just want it to look right. I'm pretty happy with what we got done today. Because now we have this better setup. We can preview the images. We can remove the ones we don't like. And just like this, it's pretty nice. So the first thing that we need to add really is the user accounts. So right now we don't have any way of like associating this house with an owner. And the owner like has to have all their information and also that would be good to have, like to show the owner down at the bottom, maybe and show like their name and about them and some things like that. So let's get started on adding user accounts to our app. So for users, I think I'm going to just use the standard device gem, which is a gem for adding users and authentication. And it makes everything super simple. So to add the device gem, I'm just going to go into the console and then type in bundle add device and bundle add just adds the gem to the gem file and it also runs the bundle install so now that we have that we have device the next step to do is to run rails view device colon install which is the installer for device that sets up a few things in the app and then it makes sure that we have everything ready to go it creates the config file and also like this local file and we also get a few next steps like setting the root and also adding some flash messages. So those are just like the alerts that would pop up whenever you do something on an app. So we can go ahead and add in these flash messages. And then the next step would be to generate the device views. But I'm actually going to use my own gem for this. I'm going to add, I'm going to do bundle add tailwind device, which is a gem I made in a previous video, just to style all of the sign in pages using tailwind CSS. So it makes everything look a little bit better right off the bat. And then now that I have Tailwind device, just run a Rails G Tailwind underscore device on install. Or, or no, <laughs> Rails G Tailwind device colon views. I haven't used it in a second. Okay, there we go. Now we get the views. We can restart the server. Although we don't have the user model, so I forgot to generate that. Let's go back into console and let's do a Rails G device user. Just like that, we can generate the user and then let's migrate the database because it did create a database migration. And after that, we are good to go. Although maybe we should add in those flash alerts. So to do that, let's just open up the code in Visual Studio. We need to get this app ready. All right, and then we can go over to the app views layouts and inside of the application file this is where we'd render the uh, alerts so that they show up on every page so what i'll do is i'll just render a partial at the top of the body i'll render layout slash alerts and then we can create a alerts partial inside the layouts folder so to do that just create a new file and name it underscore alerts dot and doing it with the underscore just makes it into a partial so we can re-render it on multiple pages. 
Then I'll paste in the code, which is just simply a P with the notice. So this is the part that's important. We're displaying the notice and we're displaying the alert, which we get from Rails whenever we like redirect from the controller if there was an alert or a success message or like an alert run notice message basically, but notices usually are for successful form submissions. All right, so now that we have that, we actually can go to users slash sign in. We have a sign in page and we also have a sign up page. So from here, we could integrate this a little bit more finely and add in a sign in button somewhere. So maybe a good idea is to add a nav bar because we don't have a nav bar yet. So we can just do a really simple nav bar at the top and then we can put the sign in link up there. So to add a nav bar, we're going to go into the views folder again and in the layouts. So right where we rendered our alerts partial, I'm actually going to put the nav bar right on top. So I'll render layout slash nav bar. This is going to be a new partial that I'm going to create. So we'll just create a file inside of the layouts folder called underscore navbar.html.erb. And then inside of here, we'll put all of our code for our navbar. So I'm just going to add a simple div, give it a fixed height that's not like too big. And then inside of here, the first thing I'll do is add a link to home. And this will just go to slash route, which a slash like this just means it's going to go to the main route. It's going to erase all the, all the parameters from the URL. So like if you're on listings, just go right back to the main page. So just like that, I'm going to reload and we should see it up here. So we do, but uh, it's kind of like pushed to the side. So I'm going to try to style it a little bit more. I think what I'll do is I'll put another div inside and I'll say like max width 7XL then MX auto. So it should position itself a little bit away from the edges. Let's reload. All right. So that's a little bit better. It pushes it into the center. And then we can also add a background around the whole nav. Actually, let's take a look at the Airbnb site just to get some inspiration because I want to make it as similar as possible. So it looks like the nav bar up here. It's actually like not really too obvious, I guess, as you say, like compared to some other sites, it's actually a little bit, they have like this rounded thing going on that looks kind of cool. And then it just like slides down into this. But this is basically the nav bar. It's like this giant white section with HRs. So that's fine. I guess we can do that too. Uh, but what we should do is we want to push it, position this middle section in the center. So I'm just going to do flex item center. And then see, it'll push it down a little bit. And I guess what we can do at the bottom is we can do a border B and then a border gray 100 that should give us that line effect like they have over here see that kind of works we have that line effect but if we want to make it stay while we scroll which right now we can't even test that out because we don't have any really pages that you can scroll i guess this show page you can and see how the nav bar stays at the top so if we want it to move while we scroll we have to add absolute top zero or you could do fixed which means it'll also it'll like stay up at the top when it can but then when you do scroll, it'll come with you. So it does kind of work. But one thing is we can see this link behind. So I think we should just add a background on the nav bar. So just BG white. And then hopefully it'll, see it'll cover up that link once we scroll over it. All right, nice. So we have this simple nav bar. We might want to implement something like, you know, their logo. We could work on getting a logo up there, but for right now, we can try adding a color so it looks a little bit more like that. Boom. And then it definitely looks like there's a font bold on that text. Make it a little bit thicker. And then really, we can say Airbnb, but whatever the name of your app is, you'd probably put right there. No. And we'll also notice that this links a little bit more off to the side. See, like our listings is kind of offset, so I do want to make it fit. And to make that work, uh, we basically want to make sure that our 
styling right here on this main class matches up to the styling on our nav bar. And right now they don't because we're using max with 7XL. So I could try using that container class instead and see if that doesn't like mess up anything. Okay, so that's kind of fine. We might just want to do some padding. It looks like there's PX5. So we're gonna want to add that too. So container and then PX5. See what that looks like. Now it does kind of match up to the to that right there. Okay, this looks good. We have our Airbnb text there. Also, obviously the font is a little bit different, but their font looks pretty basic at the same time. And we could add that in if we want to get to that. I think real quickly, I want to add a cool icon. So I'll go to flaticon.com and then let's just look up like house or something, you know, could even be this, but I want a more animated, cool one that matches the theme that we're going for. So maybe like this one is kind of red, but it's too circular. Let's keep going. <laughs> I want something like nice and bright. All right, I think I liked uh, this one could be good or this one. I think I like this one a little bit more. Let's grab this one. And then while we're at it, we can also set the favicon up in the top left corner like on the tab. Cause see how Airbnb has their icon right there. But for us, we just have like, it would either be not set or just use like the last one that you had for some reason. So what we're gonna need is two different sizes. We're gonna need one for the nav and then one for the top bar. So for the nav, we can go with 64 pixels. And then let's just work on, let's add this in first. So to add in an image to our app, we can put it in the assets images folder. That's a good place to put it because then you can easily reference it from your Rails app. Okay, so now that we have it downloaded, we're gonna take it right here, take the icon, drag it in. And I'm actually gonna rename it to um, okay. logo nav and then we can render that right next to the Airbnb text so to do this we're actually gonna change this from having the text just displayed in the link to we're gonna put it in a block that means I'm gonna add do to the end of the link and then it ends that way we can put the content that we want inside of this and organize it a little bit better then I'll wrap this text in a span that's like the usual convention for doing things like this. And then put the image right here. So we're gonna do image tag for logo-nav.png. Reload, and then let's go back in here and see what that looks like. All right, so the logo is obviously way too big. I, I think I picked one that was too big. Uh, so we can resize it, or we might just wanna pick like a new image. So if I give it a width and object cover, it will resize down a little bit. Oh, that's still kind of too big. Let's try width eight. All right, and then also let's make this be flex. So I think we can add flex to the link. We can see flex item center gap four. That should do what we want. Maybe even gap two. And we could go ahead and make the text a little bit larger. So to do that, we could even do it on this main link. We just say text XL. Make it a little bit bigger. You know, I guess that's fine. Although since like the house kind of sits down, I feel like it might look better if the text is sitting on the bottom too. So to do that, instead of having item center right here, we do item end. We can push everything down to the bottom. Although still, it looks like the Airbnb is kind of centered for some reason. That is interesting. Let's add a background on the link just so we can see what's going on. BG Ping 500. There's just like a little bit of padding on the text for some reason. Which I don't understand because this span should really be it shouldn't affect that. Let me try to delete that class. Or let me try to just have flex with nothing else and see what happens. Yeah, weirdly, it's still putting the text up at the top when I want it to be like down. Try adding 
and like margin top auto on the text sometimes that helps but uh that's weird i can't get it to like sit at the bottom <laughs> well honestly i don't even know if that would look better i was just trying to experiment this this actually doesn't look too bad right here there's something like this airbnb okay that's fine for like the first start right so we got the home link set up now on the other side i would put the sign up or like sign in so we can have first we can have a link to sign in this would go to new user session path now let's reload take a look at that so it's popping up right here so if we want to position them to the other side we have to add some styling on this container right here so this div where we had the container class we're going to do flex justify between an item center just to push them and make sure that they're all aligned in the center so that looks pretty good we have the sign in link and then we could think about how we want to style this like bg maybe we'll just do a shadow large rounded full <clears throat> font semi bolt It's kind of weird. <laughs> Let's add some padding. All right. Maybe I didn't want rounded full. I wanted like rounded large. Even maybe in order. All right. So we have sign in. With the shadow, it looks like so 3D, like it's gonna pop off the page, which might be cool if you're going for that vibe. But I think I just want a more Simple sign in. Okay, that looks cool. Sign in, and then right next to it, I'm just gonna copy this, and then I'll say create account, and then instead of new user session, it's gonna be new user registration. That's kind of important. And then as far as the background, I'm gonna change this up. So I'm gonna make the sign in the sign up or create account button just be more like bright. What we can do is we can add, let me move this to a new line. It's getting kind of congested. Let's do a BG gradient to right. And then it's going to go from Indigo 500 to 500. I love doing these gradients because it just kind of like makes it all bright like that. And then also we can change the text color to be like a pink. A really light pink or something i don't know and you'll notice that the signing gets pushed in the center that's because with justify between it tries to like space out all of our elements so since we have three links here it's going to space them out evenly so what we have to do is we have to wrap these last two links in their own container that's as simple as just putting a div around them and then this should just push them on their own over here although we do lose this the gap and like the item center so we might want to put our own gap in here so on this div we can do like gap four or you could have just added a margin on one of these links whatever you are feeling like all right so this looks good sign in create account i'm pretty happy with that so let's say we go to create our account I'm just gonna put in some, you know, random information. We only have two fields, like the email and everything. So like now we created an account, but we still show these links up and we still show like the sign in create account link. So I wanna go and change that. So right here inside of this container, we can just say if not current user, if the user isn't signed in, Uh, we'll show these links to sign in, but if they aren't, if they are signed in already, we won't show them. It's like that. We don't show it. We could actually have an else condition and we can display any links we want to show when the user is signed in. So I think I want to show like a little drop down menu. And then we can put, like, we can just show that the user is signed in. So let's go to Font Awesome. Let's find 
like a user icon. Just since we're using Font Awesome already, I feel like let's take advantage of it. So we have just the simple user person kind of face thing. We can drop that in here, reload, and then we see this up in the corner. So that kind of shows like that's your profile or something. And I'll do some styling on the div outside. So I'm gonna make it have a border, rounded full, and some padding. If we check that out, it'll look like this. Although the padding on the left, the padding on the side seems a little bit off. So I think we wanna do uh, like more padding on the side. So we could do PY2, PX3. Just like that. Now we kind of have like almost a perfect circle. We could try to increase it a little bit more like PX 3.5. There we go, and now that looks like a perfect circle. We could have also, instead of doing padding, we could just do like a fixed height and width, height 10, width 10. Simply, but then the icon gets kind of pushed out of the way. So actually, I think I want to do height 12, and then we could just do flex, item center, justified center to put that icon right in the middle. That kind of gets the same effect, but then we can guarantee it's an absolute circle. Alright, so that looks pretty good. We have this user a little pop up over there. And then when you click on that, we should have a nice drop down pop out. So to do a drop down, it's actually pretty easy with Rails and with stimulus really. So what I'll do is I'm gonna just add a div around our link. That's kind of like the drop down button. And then Let's put a class relative and then we can start building out the drop down. So for the drop down, we just have another div inside of here. And because of the class relative, we can put it absolute on this div and it won't go like relative kind of scopes it to only be like affecting that one element. So if we did do absolute, it would just pop up on top of that button. So let's give this a fixed height and width. And I'll also just change up the background a little bit so we can see it. Okay, so yeah, we get this like absolute position block right up there. We definitely want to move it around a little bit. So let's try left zero. I think it already might be left zero. Okay, let's try negative left 24. So we're trying to push it over a little bit. There we go. Also, this element's pretty big. Let's change it to with 40 all right there we go and then instead of top zero let's try like top 16 because if you remember our nav bar is 16's width so if we could do top 16 it'll just push it down so that should be right at the bottom of the nav bar just like that although there could be a little bit of like less space so we could try top 14 now it looks about perfect but we could probably do a little bit more to get it closer to that icon so let's try top 12 I mean, yeah, it's not bad. And I want to move it over a little bit more to the left. So let's increase from left 24 to left 32. All right. And I mean, I feel like that's a pretty good drop down. You know, it could be styled a little bit more. But that's fine. Let's try to make it rounded. So let's do a rounded large. And I think we're still going to have like a BG white. But I can add a border too. So now the drop down looks kind of like this. Right now we can't like click it to toggle it. So I want to add that in. For that, we're just going to need a little bit of JavaScript. Let's generate a stimulus controller. You can do that by going in console, type in Rails G stimulus drop down. Now we have a stimulus controller. And what I'll do is I'll add the stimulus controller on its div by typing data controller equals drop down. Then on the toggle button, we can have a data action. And because it's just a div, we need to specify the event, which would be the click event. And then we'd say drop down toggle, just like this, like pound sign toggle, to signify that we want to call the toggle method on the drop down stimulus controller. And then we're going to need a target to say like the menu. So I'm going to add the target right here. 
I type in data drop down target equals menu. All right, so now we know that this element is the menu. And then let's go and set up the JavaScript. So I'll go to app JavaScript controllers, drop down controller. And then inside of here, we're just gonna need to set a few things. So we're gonna have that toggle method. And we're gonna get event. Let's just prevent the default just in case a user or just in case we put this drop down controller on a link instead of just a div. I want to prevent the default event. And then we can just say it's not menu target class list toggle hidden. Hidden is the class that I'm using because that's a class in Tailwind. And then we also need to find the targets up at the top of the class. So static targets equals menu. Menu is just one of the targets. And then we're allowed to do something like this. And right away you'll see that now we're able to toggle this drop down just like this. And this is pretty nice. Although I would like there to be some sort of like fade in effect, which I've seen, like I've seen people do fade in effects for these, like a pop up kind of effect. Also, when we're clicking, notice over here, like uh, we can kind of select the listing. So what I'll do is let's change that div. It's because we're in a div. So when you click on a div, it thinks you're trying to select text. Let's just change this to a link. So actually we can just change it from a div to an A and then we can do an href equals just like pound sign. So that's just an empty href. Now it looks like it still works fine, but now we don't see any text getting selected. So I like that. And we also get the nice cursor effect. I think I like this. Maybe I'll move down the, move the drop down over cause it's a little bit too far now I'm noticing. So to do that, Let's go over to this drop down right here. Change it from left 32, maybe back to left 24. <laughs> you know what? That's fine, right? Like this. Okay, cool. And then also we want to make it so it starts off hidden. So to do that, we just add the hidden class onto this drop down. Right. So now we can click on the drop down. It pops up pretty nicely, and then we can put any type of links inside that we want to have. So we could start off with like a link to settings and this could go to the edit user registration path. Right away we have a settings link because this is built in with device. So if you wanted to edit like your email, your password, that's really all you can edit here. But if you wanted to add more fields in, you could obviously do that too. And then we can put also a link to sign out. This would go to destroy user session path. And really all we need to do also is set a data turbo method. The reason being is that this needs to make a delete request. So we're going to change it from the normal get request that a link would make to use a custom request, which we're going to use delete, which will make it sign out of the account. And also you'll notice that these links are like, they need to be styled a little bit nicer. So we could just do that on this div if we want to, or we can make a second div inside of it. I think I'll just do it up here. I'll say flex, flex call item center. It will center these links kind of like this. We could also put gap for, and we could do padding two. Let's see what that looks like. So now we have like the settings link, sign out. And if you want to style this more, you could obviously do that. But this is looking pretty good to me. So we added a nice nav bar, sign in links. We have user accounts, but now I want to make this more. Okay, I want to make this more featured. So first of all, we don't have any way for like a user to create a new listing. Oh, real quick. I'm going to add one more thing in the JavaScript. So you'll notice when we have the drop down open and we click anywhere else on the page, yeah, the drop down doesn't close. So that's pretty important. We're going to quickly add that in. So to do that, we're just going to have another event. We can do this right on the main element. Do data action equals click at window. We're going to go to drop down, close unless drop down. That's going to be a method we're going to make. So over here in the drop down controller, 
we're gonna create that close unless drop down and we're gonna pass in the event because then we can check if this dot element contains you dot target and we're actually gonna say if not this element contains it which means is that click did you click on something outside of the drop down and if you did we're gonna just basically run this dot toggle although this could have some unexpected effects because look oh actually yeah actually it's not even working let me check console all right so right off the bat we get cannot read properties of undefined oh because i'm calling this dot toggle but we're not passing in e okay yeah we don't want to call this dot toggle anyways because this is going to have some unexpected effects let's console log click and right now you'll see like Look, we're getting the click for every time, which means it would just be toggling the drop down. So actually we want to check for another thing. So if the target is not inside the drop down and this dot menu target last list contains hidden. So actually, this is gonna be another not. So if it doesn't, if we're not in the drop down and also the target doesn't contain hidden, then we're going to just simply add hidden so instead of toggling let's just add hidden and if you see what that looks like now we click on it we click off and it just hides it but it doesn't toggle it if like it doesn't do any toggling or any weird stuff even if we click like a thousand times this is pretty nice and that's just a simple thing I wanted to fix as far as like a transition to make this fade in I haven't really handled that but I think I know how we could so what we could do for a transition is, first of all, on this element, we can add transition all duration 250. This would set up transitions, but we still don't see anything, you know? So to do that transition, we'd go into the drop-down controller. I think what we do is we toggle hidden, but then we'd have to set like the opacity to zero maybe like zero percent then do set timeout and set it to 100 percent so now like it's visible again but then make this like a 250 delay let's just see if that works I uh, can't really show. Let's do a hundred millisecond delay. I mean, it seems like a little bit of a transition, right? Although it kind of just seems slow. <laughs> seems like a little bit of a lag. Um, maybe do a 50 second delay. Also only works for like, toggle it, I think. Or does it work for both? Yeah, since we're hiding it, like it, it automatically would do that. So we might want to check. We might want to check here, like if dot menu target last list contains hidden. We would do some special code. Otherwise, if it doesn't, we're gonna do this loading. Then we could say on the otherwise we're going to remove hidden but then if it if it wait if this menu if it contains so this is if it is hidden so we're going to want to do this code here so we're going to remove hidden then we're going to do the load in otherwise we're going to kind of want to do a load out animation and then we could just add back the class so i think we do style opacity equals zero percent i think that's actually fine and then we would add hidden right here and then we can reset the opacity now i don't know how that's gonna look let's test it out i'm not really sure 
maybe do a hundred millisecond delay. I mean, a little something, a little bit of an animation. We could also try to make it like move up a little bit. Although it's going to be kind of tricky to do that. Anyways, I feel like that's fine. I don't really care about the animation part too much and we could get into that. We could spend like a lot of time on animations, which I don't really want to do because now that we have this drop down and we have a user account too, like we have a user signed in. Let's first get to the part where they're allowed to create a new listing. Cause right now you could create a new listing pretty easily because there's this huge button, like create new listing. But I would think we want to get more information about this owner before they can create the listing. So we might want to add another link on the nav bar or something. Actually, what we'll do is we'll, let's move the new listing link up here into the nav bar real quick. So to do that, we can go to the listings index page and then let's just take that new listing link, copy it out, go over to the layouts nav bar, and then we'll put it up there inside of the nav bar. So right inside this top level, let's do it in the else. So this is when a user is signed in. We'll have the link to new listing. Let's take a look what that looks like. So now we have this new listing button up here. Now let's also style it up so it looks better. I think what I'll do is I'll take the styling from the create account link because I like that bright pink styling. And then let's just replace this styling from the new listing link. Then let's reload. Uh, oh, it does look a little bit off. Uh, wait, what did I do? To new listing. Yeah, it's like, weirdly it is a little bit off. Flex, let's add item center to this flex. Cause we're probably always gonna want our stuff to be in the center. Okay, so now it looks a little bit better. We have the new listing button. And I'll probably just, instead of rounded large, I'll do rounded full on this. So right here on the new listing, change rounded large to rounded full. There we go. We have new listing. You can come here. But what I want to do actually is when you get to new listing, if you don't have like, the information needed or whatever, it's going to show you like, do you want to sign up to become like an owner or like a lister? Because right now we don't even have any, any setup like that, but I want to create it. Okay, so how are we going to tell if a user is able to create a listing, right? Well, first of all, I think they're going to want to have more information about them. So I don't think we're going to have this here. Like we have settings, which is just like user settings. But I think we should have more than that. Like we should have profile settings and stuff like that. So I guess we can start off by adding some more fields to the database. Let's go into the console and let's do a migration. Let's do migration, add profile fields to the users. And then the profile fields we're gonna add is like first name, last name, uh, we are going to add a description, but I would think I'm going to do that later because it's going to be rich text. So we don't really need that in the migration. First name, last name. What else could, uh, like maybe like a profile picture, but also we don't need to add that in the migration. Maybe kind of like the address, but we don't really care about their personal address. Although we might want to. So adding address fields is actually pretty easy. We can do like address one, address two, because you know how there's usually like the, the main address and then like an apartment or something. And we could have city, state, even country. These would still all be strings, so we just leave it like that. And now we have like a bunch of fields to fill out for a user. Oh, and maybe zip code. All right, let's run it. I'm going to take a quick look at this migration by doing a cat on the migration. 
And you see we're adding all these different columns to the database. That looks good for me. Now let's just migrate the database with RailsDB migrate. And now we have our new fields. Now if I restart the server in dev, we can go back here and we don't really have any like option to see that, but I think maybe in the settings, I'll kind of like hide this away. I'll do a different, I'll do a whole settings page actually. Cause this, the edit user, this is more like the, those settings that you kind of hide behind like a, like the password wall, which right now we're doing it like all in one, which the UI on this just kind of looks weird, but that's what the buys gives you out of the box. So let's just go ahead and create a whole new settings page. To do that, it's pretty easy. Let's start in the routes. So let's go over to config routes.rb and I'll create the routes for a settings page. So let's add, I think I'll do a resource settings only new, or actually only show and create. So we have our settings page with a show page and then also a create action. Then we'll also create a controller. So up in the app controllers folder, we'll add the settings controller. And inside of there, we'll have a settings controller class that inherits from the application controller. Then we're gonna have a show action and also a create action. So right now there's no content in them. So a cool thing about Ruby is you can now do one liner uh, method since like Ruby three. So you can just add a semicolon and then end. It looks kind of weird. Maybe if you're a beginner. So if you don't want to do that, you can just have your, your old school method, just like this. That's empty. And we're going to put content into it. You can have both. So we have that show we have to create. And then what we'll do is <clears throat> inside the nav bar for our link to settings, instead of going to edit user registration path, we can just simply go to settings path. Now, right now we're not gonna have a template for that, but that won't cause an error or anything. If you reload, we still see our settings link. When we click it, then we get settings controller is missing a template. So we have to quickly add a template. You can do that by going to the views folder, create a new folder called settings, and then create a file called show.html.erb. Inside of here is where you'd add your settings stuff. So what we can do is just start off with a form with URL settings path and add a block with the form. So now we have a form that's going to the settings path, which will hit the create action in the controller. And that's where, when we like save the stuff on the user. And now let's start adding those fields. So let's do a label for the first name, f dot text field, first name, these are going to be really bad siloed, by the way, I'm not doing that first. Let's do last name, text fields. Then we have maybe address one, address two, we can do state. City. I think I'm actually doing this a little bit wrong. City should be first. Then state, then country. Then zip code. Now we're gonna have all these fields in the form. Let's reload. Oh, <laughs> that looks horrendous. Okay, so that's what you get when you don't style anything. I guess let's just uh, start off by adding a div around these. Flex, flex call, gap four. At least they're all gonna be on new lines and spaced out. Now we'll just end off that div. Boom, now we get something like this. This looks, oh, this looks pretty bad. Okay, so I guess let's wrap this form in a div. Do max width 7XL, width full. Next auto. I just want to center it in the middle. Okay, wow. And now we get this this sort of look. 
Okay, wow. There's so much here. We're gonna need to definitely refactor this. Maybe we'll do max with 5XL, make it a little bit smaller. And obviously the fields don't have to be that large. That's crazy. So inside of here, we can probably do like max width 2XL. I don't even know. Another MX Auto. So maybe we don't even need the outside layer. Something like this. And then let's just remove the gap. We're actually going to want to put styling around each of these fields. So I guess I should have done this first. You can just have the flex, flex call. Uh, I guess the gap could be fine if we if we wrap each of these in a div. We've done that first. Now I have to hit each of these. Let's get started with the first name. So we can style this a little bit nicer. And then we'll probably just reuse the styling to make all the links look the same. We can start like rounded large. That sort of look. And then I think we could have like first name, last name side by side. So to do that, let's leave these as like call for these, but then we're gonna put another div around these that are gonna do class. We can do flex, I think I'm gonna do grid, and then grid calls two. We have two columns for the first name, last name. And we can also make that last name have rounded. So now we get something that looks like this. I, I wanna put a little bit of space, so let's add gap on the grid, gap four. All right, now we get something like this, first name, last name, address one. We're also going to want to have a container around that. We can add flex, flex call. We can add some rounded on that address field. See, there's just a little bit too much space with the gap. <laughs> so instead, we want to just base out the links but then we don't need like space between the label and the field. All right, in city, state, country, I think it'd almost be like three of them on one line or at least city, state, and zip code could all be on one line. And then country could be like the last one. I'm gonna move zip code up a little bit above country. And then let's do this. Flex, flex, call, rounded. And we're gonna need a wrapping div around these, and we're gonna do grid calls three. It's kind of annoying to do all this styling, but you gotta do what you gotta do to to make these beautiful apps. Rounded, large. All right. Add the rounded large class. Boom. Okay, already we've condensed this so much. So much. Okay, another thing actually is address one could probably be like three quarters of the way and address two could be a small one because that's usually just like the apartment number. So let's do that. So we're going to add another container here. And... We can do grid, grid calls three, but then we just need to make it so that the address one takes up uh, two of them. That's one way to do it. So to do that, I don't really remember, is it? Uh, let's see. Set calls with. columns just like simply as that so we just say columns two if i wanted to take up two columns although it didn't really work no, i don't think that's right that must be different let's go look at grid Grid container. 
Yeah. But then I want to set like my own amount of uh, width. <laughs> Forget how to do that. I'm trying to figure it out. Because usually there's a way to say like self. Yeah. Is it called spam? Utilities for controlling how elements are sized and placed. Okay, perfect here. But look, like, number four has that call span two, which makes it take up two of them. That's what I was looking for. So I'm going to put that right here on address one. Call span two, so it takes up two of the grid elements, or two of the grid spaces, you know. And then we'll also put gap on the top level grid. I know it's kind of annoying, but boom, now we have a nice kind of look like this. This looks pretty clean. We were able to condense it from that huge, huge form into something a little bit more easier. All right, and then the last one that we have to do is the country. So let's wrap this in a div. Now we have this country, we can put a class on here. And obviously it doesn't need to be that big either. So why don't we just take that grid calls three and we'll wrap it around here. Or actually what we can do is we can just drop this inside and it'll already be positioned over to the next line. Interestingly enough, because it only allows for three anyways. So that's a pretty easy way to do it. But just like that, it automatically pushes over, squishes it. And then the last thing we can do is have like the submit button at the bottom. So we can just put that right here. F dot submit. Now, default submit is going to be really like ugly. Let's put some text like update profile information. Be like P2 rounded large. EG. I don't even know, maybe like a gradient. From pink 500 to red 600. Let's take red 100. Yeah, that's not bad. And then the last thing is to set cursor pointer, which kind of like makes it do a click kind of effect. And then when you click this, we would expect it to update the profile. Right now it is going to that controller action, but we don't have any code in here. So what we do is we just say current user dot update user params. And then we would define that in a private method. We just write private and then create a new method called user params. The reason why we're doing a user params is so we can permit the parameters that we want. We're going to say params dot require user, which actually we're not going to get that user uh, key unless we specify it on the form. So in the show action, since we're doing a form with URL, we never actually specified the model to use. So we could either just don't require the user. You just permit those attributes, which I'm fine with that. Just permit first name, last name, address one, address two, zip code, city, date, country. All right, so these are the all of the attributes that we want to let the user update. 
which means that they can't update anything else about their model if they tried to hack the page or something. And in the create action, we could say if current user update with the params, we can just redirect to root path. Now we'll add a notice, like your information successfully updated. Else, let's render show, which should just like render that page again. It should keep all of the information on our form just in case there was an error. Let's go ahead, click. And we did get this, your information was successfully updated. So I guess it did work, even though we didn't put any information. Let's go back here and try to set the information. Uh, let's, who is this guy? He's like, DHH. Rails man. <laughs> and then my address is like 8 Main Street apartment something. Austin, Texas. And then country USA. Which actually, like, there's not even states and city. Like, there's some things to realize about this. Maybe we don't even need the country field, but let's just put it anyways. It's like that. We have our information saved. Now, if I go back to settings, oh, it doesn't automatically fill. That's annoying. So I think the reason being is on this show page, we should set the model. Let's say model is current user. So then it would be able to remember this information. Like, see, now it fills it out. But this will change up the or this will change up the form a little bit. Another thing is that since we have a model that's already saved, it's gonna try to make a patch request. So when we the next time we go to update, it says it's not gonna work. See? And if we go in the console, we'll see there's there's a routing error because it's trying to do a patch request. Uh, the way to fix this is to just set the method it's gonna use. So just simply set method to post. Boom. Now it works. But another thing is those parameters didn't get permitted now that there's like an extra key. So if we look in the console, there's unpermitted parameters user because now all of those keys are namespaced in this user object. So that's why you put the require. Let's go back in the settings controller and we have to actually say require user and then permit the attributes. So just like that, if I want to change, maybe we're not eight main street but it's 108 update profile go back to settings and everything's working as expected that's cool we have their profile information and then also on this page we might want to link to like change the email settings and password so we can do that at the bottom outside of the form i think let's just have another div And we can have like a H3 additional settings. And we just have a link to change email slash password. And this will go to the edit user registration path. Now let's reload. It's a little bit too close, so let's definitely add some margin on this div. Margin top eight, maybe like margin top 20 something, push it down a little bit. And then even we can add the line by doing an HR, which will add like a vertical line, although that looks kind of weird. So maybe we'll just add the line as a border on this element. So we can say border T2, border gray 100. Okay, now we have a little bit of a line that separates these two things. And I think I like that. Although this link could be a little bit bigger. Do like rounded on this, adding to add a break between these. All right. And then also let's add border gray two, border gray 100. So we can actually see the border. Oh. Oh, I said border gray two. <laughs> And then border two. These classes can be kind of like funny to remember sometimes. You can even do like a BG gray 100 to change the backgrounds. All right, now we have something like this. Okay, that's fine. We have additional settings. Change the email and password. 
And even if the back button still works here, that's cool. And then if they wanted to cancel their account too, cool. Okay, first name, last name. The other things that we could add is like the profile picture and the description. So to do that, what we're going to do is, first of all, go into the model. So let's close all of these. Let's go to the app models user to RB. And then we're gonna set up uh, the active storage and rich text attachments. So we can say has rich text area. And then maybe it's just like about me. And then it has one attached profile picture. Now, if you remember, we already set up action text and active storage in the other video. Oh, it looks like that method's wrong. Has rich text area. It's actually just has rich text. Okay, that's not bad. So let's fix that. Has rich text about me, has one attached profile picture. But if you remember, we already added rich text and active storage in a previous episode because we had the description and we had the images. Right, so this is actually pretty easy to go and add it into our app because we already have those tables. So we just add these two little things into our model. And then now we can go and update the form. So inside of this settings form, let's just go after this read the column for all of like the city information. Let's do another one, another set of links. I'll just add flex flex call to space them out. And let's put an F dot label about me. And then the F dot rich text area about me. And I don't even think that's gonna fly. So let's take a look at this. And this actually looks pretty good to me. The about me section. And then we might just wanna add the profile picture as like another one. So profile picture. And it's actually going to be a file field now. Profile picture like this. And then if I was to set about me, like I love traveling, building cool apps and having fun. And we set our profile picture to some like random picture that I have. Actually, this isn't going to save unless we go and update the controller. So let me quickly go and update inside of the user params, because since we haven't permitted about me and profile picture, they wouldn't save, but I really want those to save. So let's add in about me profile picture. And if this is getting too long, you can always put it down on a new line. All right, and now let's update the information and it should have actually updated it. Like we see that this section did update. The profile picture isn't uh, showing because it's just like a simple file field, but we could show a representation of it real quick on the show page. So to do that right underneath here, we can just say if like if really we can do it off the current user. So if current user dot profile picture attached, and then I'll do a one liner actually. I'll do image tag current user profile picture. And we're only going to show that if it's attached. Maybe you can do a quick class with 10 height 10 object cover, rounded full. Take a look at what that looks like. But actually, oh, look, I'm missing the equal sign to display on the page. There we go. Yep, and now we have a little representation. Might want to make that a little bit bigger. It's 16. There we go. So we do have the profile picture. And then maybe I'll have it so that it's like on the side. So to do that, let's add an outer div. Let's gap four. And I'll put that image tag right here which will only show if we actually have one attached. Okay, that looks pretty good actually to me. And then if you did want to change your profile picture, 
just as easy as doing this. You have your new profile picture. And I think a cool thing we could do is we could show that profile picture up at, in our dropdown. So like if they have one attached, we can just replace that icon with the image. So to do that, we can go over to the navbar partial that we created over in the layouts folder. And let's go right here to this link where we have the icon and then we can just do a condition. If current user profile picture attached, then we'll do an image tag for the current user profile picture. Now, let's just do width full height full because the link already has a height and width defined. So we'll just try to fill that. Then we'll do an object cover so that it'll stretch the image so it doesn't look like distorted. It doesn't stretch the image, it crops the image and zooms into the center. But it tries to fit as like the best that it can. Now let's reload and well, we actually see that like the image is a square, <laughs> which doesn't seem right. But it's because an image will automatically try to like just go its full width, even though we have rounded full on the top element. So what we have to do is we have to say overflow hidden, just to make it so that. Uh, you know, the image can't extend over. And then look at this, this looks pretty good. We have this image right here. Yeah, this is awesome. We have the profile information and new listing still is like, there's no logic here. So I think what I wanna do is we're gonna add in Stripe. And I guess to create a new listing, you're gonna have to have a Stripe account set up to be like an owner, basically. And I think that's how we'll do it. So right now, we are just showing this new listing page. We might as well have another page, which is like set up owner or like sign up as an owner. So what I'll do is I'll go to routes and let's create a new resource. We'll call it like owner sign up. Let's do only show. This is going to expect a whole controller for owner sign up. Create that right now. Owner sign up controller. We'll create a class called owner sign up controller, inherits from application controller, and then it has a show action, just like this. Now we're also going to need a matching template. So over here in the views, we're going to create a folder called owner sign up, and then a new file called show.html.erb. And then inside of here, we would get started on that screen. Simply, we might start with like flex call, item center. Actually, we don't even need this. Let's just get started with. Actually, I do want to have that. <laughs> I just I can't see it yet. So let's do an H1, and I'll say like sign up as an owner to start listing houses. Something like this. All right, so now when you click new listing, instead of going here, like you should only see this if you have the owner set up. So we wanna actually redirect them to this owner signup page. So to do that pretty easily, we can just go into the controllers and the listings controller. And then inside of here, I think let's have a before action. Uh, redirect to sign up. And then we're gonna also do it only. I'm just gonna try to copy that, like the code that we have here to permit these actions. So the percent %i just means it's gonna take this and turn it into an array of strings. So we could also just do that if it's easier. Cause this is what Rails is expecting. <laughs> but they have these little like helpers for advanced developers, I guess, apparently. So let's do only new. Um, Create. So just in case they tried to hack it and like go to the create, you know, we're not gonna let them. And then these other actions, we're gonna do some authorization, but later on. Yeah, like we don't want them to be able to just delete any listing that they want. So we don't have anything set up right now. They could, right now they could update any listing, but let's just handle new create, redirect to sign up, and then inside of private, we have def redirect to sign up. We're just going to simply redirect to 
owner sign up paths. Just as simple as that. And then let's look at what happens. So if we go to create a new listing, we actually got uninitialized constant owner signups controller. Oh, right, because it's looking for a plural controller. But because I did a singular, see, like I called it owner signup. Uh, let's go to the routes RB and I'm going to fix that. So by default, every resource is going to look for a plural, even though I defined singular. So to make it use the singular controller, we have to manually set the controller like this to owner sign up. And we go reload. And this is what we see. So sign up as an owner to start listing houses. This is our message that we would display. Now, if we go back to that page, I'm just going to style this up a little bit nicer. Add a text 5XL. Oh, that's way too big. Add text 2XL. Text center. And let's also add width full on this div because it looks like the, the item center wasn't working. Okay, sign up as an owner to start listing houses. And then we might have like a P tag underneath. Text large. We could describe more about our offering, I guess. Like list unlimited houses and start making passive income from your properties. This is like what we're trying to sell to the owners of the houses and stuff. And then maybe we'll have a nice image underneath. Let's go to Unsplash. Unsplash is a great website for getting free to use images. The only thing you have to do is credit the author, which let's be real, how many of us are actually doing that? I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, so let's go in here. This is the image from my first video. I feel like people liked it, so let's use this. Although I still have it downloaded. Let's bring it into our assets images folder. So from downloads, we're gonna take this over here. Let's rename this to Fancy house. I mean, it's not like too fancy, but it looks, it has a pool. It has this, this would cost probably like a million dollars in my mind. It's crazy. It should only cost like 200K, right? All right, now let's do image tag, fancy house dot JPEG. And let's give it a set height, I think, 96. Object cover, so 96 should be big enough. Let's take a look, reload. All right, I mean, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. So we have this, maybe we can add some spacing between these links. So I'll use margin for that. I'll say margin top four, and then on the image, maybe like margin top eight. Something like this. And then we can even add some rounded on the image. Rounded large. So now it looks a little bit more like Nice fancy website. And then I think we could have our, like any further link to action, maybe we'll put it over the image. But from here, we're gonna probably set up Stripe. I think to be an owner, you have to have your Stripe account set up, which means you can get paid out. So let's go ahead and start adding in the Stripe connection. So Stripe is a framework. It's really like a platform that handles all of your payments, payouts, and all these different things. There's some really good docs and they have a Ruby library too. So it's kind of like really helpful. This is what most of the people use that I know that do some sort of payment processing on their Rails apps. That's what we're gonna be doing. So what we need actually is a Stripe account. So if you don't already have a Stripe account, it's pretty easy, you just go and sign up and then you get a like Stripe login. And then what I'm going to do is actually create a new account, but you can just use the account that you currently have. So I, I, I clicked up in the top right corner. I just clicked create a new account. And then I'm going to put the name of the account for us. It would just be like Airbnb Rails. I'm going to press create. And just as simple as that, we have this new account. You'll see that I'm signed in as the Airbnb Rails account. And then right now we're just using test data. So to accept real payments, you need to complete your business profile, which is basically just adding in your address and some information about your personal, like yourself, all the things that you need to do taxes and stuff like that. So for just this video, I'm gonna keep it in test mode because then we can just test out all of the different payments, make sure that our app is working. 
And then obviously once you go to production, you switch out the test keys for the production keys and make sure that you fill out your profile too. So really to use Stripe, it's as simple as just taking these two keys, the publishable and the secret key, bringing them into your app, and then we could start working with the docs. But for us, we're actually gonna use Connect, which is another library, a part of Stripe, which is gonna allow us to have users connect uh, their personal Stripe accounts, and then we're able to create a marketplace kind of vibe where they're able to get paid out, and then we can take it, we can take transactions like on behalf of that person. So it's really useful. And then like I said, the Stripe docs is just really helpful. There's a lot of information here for what you're trying to do. Like we can accept online payments, create subscriptions, receive payouts, all these different things. But for us, we'd actually be going over to the connect section and then we're gonna try to set up connect. So we can collect a payout, we can pay out money. I think we're probably gonna wanna do just collect and pay out. So we collect payments from the customers and automatically pay out a portion to your sellers or service providers, which means you can take an application fee for your app. So you can like take a certain percentage of the sale and then just pay out the rest of them to their account. So things like this is, are really useful and what a lot of the big apps that we see nowadays are built on. It's just using something like this behind the scenes. So we can accept payments by creating direct charges. So that's probably what we could do, although that's gonna directly transact with the connected account. So we might wanna do destination charges. So I think with destination charges, you can actually split the payment between multiple accounts. So if you have like users that, maybe you have two users who are sharing a product and then you wanna split the proceeds, you could do stuff like that with a destination charge. But we'll get into that later. But right now we're just gonna want to have the basic setup for Stripe Connect Marketplace, which would probably just be collect and pay out. And then we can choose what sort of code we wanna have. I'm just gonna go for the web because they already have this Ruby example. So we can get the Stripe gem, then create an account for the user. Create an account link so, this is so that the user can go and enter in more information. And then we get to the accepting a payment where we'd add a checkout on the page, which has a success URL, cancel URL, and just like a few different things. Also in here in payment intent data, we can do stuff like the application fee amount, and then also the destination, which this is actually creating that destination charge. And it'll go to that account ID that we created back up here, because you get an account ID or the account that we're going to create. So it's like a few different things that we're going to have to set up. And yeah, then we can put it all together and test this out. So it shouldn't be that hard. And we can just get started following this documentation. And yeah, get into the video. All right, so the first thing that we're going to do is set up Stripe in our app. So first thing I'm going to do is bring over the credentials. So to do this, I'm going to make a credential file using the built-in Rails credentials. So what we have to do is create a credential file for the environment that we're in. And we can do that by first specifying the editor like this. This is going to be a parameter into the command. So we say editor and then you could say vim. You could even say code. So like VS code if we want to do it that way. That might be a bit easier for beginners. And then we can type in Rails credential colon edit. Then we're gonna do dash dash environment equals, then this would be the environment that we're gonna be in. So for us, it's development. Just press enter. And just like that, we're inside of a credential file right here. And here's where we're gonna add our keys. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a stripe key like that. Then I'll go to new line and I'll set Public key, I'll just say PK for short, and then I'll paste in my public key. And we can go back here and we're gonna get the private key or the secret key. So you can only reveal this one time, so you kinda of have to be careful. But since we're just having it in our app, although this isn't visible, every time you open this file, you need to have the correct key or else you're not able to see it. So that's kind of the cool thing that's built in. 
So just like this, I have my public and my secret key. And then all we can do is just exit out. And it should have saved successfully. So see file encrypted and saved. And now we have those keys, which is great. The next thing is to configure Stripe. So we can do that by first getting the gem and then we're gonna configure it onto the Stripe gem. So to make this a little bit more helpful, I'm just gonna look up the Stripe gem and pull up the docs so I can see some more information. So we're gonna add Stripe like this. And then there should be a way to configure the Stripe library, set our key so that we don't have to do it every time. I don't see it though, whoops. All right, let's not worry about it. It's easy enough as just adding this Stripe gem. So I'll do this from the console by typing in bundle add Stripe. I'm just gonna zoom in here a little bit. So you'll see that we got Stripe and it installed that Stripe gem. That's perfect. And then from here, I just wanna figure out how I can set the Stripe. Let me look that up. Fill it with the following. So yeah, that's kinda what I was thinking is we need something like this. All right, so now let's go ahead and open up our app. So we can do code dot, open up uh, the code editor. And inside of here, I'm gonna go into config initializers and I'll create a new file called stripe.rb. And inside of here, we can paste in this information where we're gonna set, uh, this is actually interesting. <laughs> What is this? Rails configuration.stripe? I've never seen this. That's kind of weird. I don't, I don't really like this guy's way of doing it. Oh, also it was posted in 2016. Wow. Yeah, guys, be careful what you enter in. I know I've done it before. Maybe it's not that important. To create a Stripe initializer file. We really do it like this, Rails configuration dot stripe. That's crazy. Okay, well I guess we can do this, but we're gonna replace these values with Rails application credentials dig stripe pk for our publishable key and then sk for the secret key. And then apparently we set the API key just with the thing that we just set up here. It doesn't really make much sense, but okay. Now that we have the Stripe gem installed, the next thing would be to create a Stripe account for the user. So with controller properties, with account type. No, we don't wanna do account type. So I guess we have to do this somewhere inside of our app. So maybe on the owner sign up controller, we could have like a link that says get started. Oh, it looks like the server was off. So I'm gonna restart the server in slash dev. Yeah, so I think I might have a link that says like get started. And then when you click that, it will automatically create that Stripe account for you if you don't have it. We could probably get started with something like that. So let's add a create action to our owner sign up. And that'll be where the link kind of posts to. And then we can go into our routes, to owner sign up, and then let's permit to create route. Now, I don't know if this is gonna be the permanent flow for our app, because we might wanna do it right as soon as they sign up. But I think this is this will work for now. And then we can rethink it later if we need to. So go to owner sign up, show page, and I'm gonna add a link. Actually, I'm, I wanna display it on top of this image. So what we can do is add a div, put a class of relative, just do that around the image. And the image is gonna take up the space that it needs. Then we'll have our link to, which might say like get started. Now this is gonna go to 
just owner sign up path. And then for class, it'd be absolute pop zero. And then I think on this div, we also have flex item center justify center. Which in the past, I've seen this work to center the div, even though it's absolute. Let's see. Okay, no, we still get the link way up here. Get started now. Uh, what went wrong? Let's add a background on this too. EG white, rounded large. And then with the border. Oops. Whoa. Actually, I guess I have a few windows open. Let me fix that. Put it all in the same window. Okay, so we do see it up there, but it's not in the right spot. I'm gonna add some padding. And yeah, it looks like maybe I should delete the top zero and just go absolute. See what that looks like. Okay, now it looks like the centering does work. And then I think what would be cool is if when we hover on the image, maybe like the background changes. That would look kind of cool. So we could do a hover. Um, opacity 75 maybe so that's actually like decreasing the opacity so it makes it more transparent I guess that's not really what I was thinking I have seen something how do we do this make image darker brightness that's what it is Let me find the quickly I'll find the class for brightness. I think it's literally just brightness like that. So hover brightness 75. Yeah, I was remembering I've done this in the past. Okay, see, yeah, it looks kind of nice. And then it even it like kind of makes you want to click the button even more. Although I want it, it looks like when we hover on the button, the styling goes away, which I don't like that. I want it to stay. So what we can do to fix that is instead of doing hover, we need to do a group hover. And then on the element that's containing the items, put a group. So then even when you hover on the link, it'll still apply that effect. Kind of a nice thing as part of Tailwind. So yeah, you can see this looks pretty good. It might even be fun to make like the border turn a different color when you hover on the link itself. So we could do that by changing just simply the styling on the link, do a hover state border actually let me go to a new line that's the only thing with Tailwind is like it's fast I guess but and it takes up so much space on the in the HTML oh okay that changed something unexpectedly I think I accidentally got rid of the P2 for the padding all right there we go okay hover it goes to a new color that's actually not too bad Maybe even doing a shadow would be nice. Shadow. Something like that. It's kind of a lot. <laughs> it's definitely a lot. Maybe just only the shadow. I don't know. And then if we want it to be more smooth when it comes in, we could do transition. All. And it kind of just pops in. We could also have it affect, we could have it come in when you hover on the image as well. If we did a group hover instead of hover, just simply this group hover, group hover. And now it comes in when you hover. And then maybe when you, when you hover on the link, we could change the border or something. I don't know. We already tried this, but like we could try it again. So it's it's kind of like showing you, you should click on it and then you hover and it actually changes. Or we could change the color too. We could go crazy. I know we're kind of going crazy on the UI right now, but sometimes it's fun to do this. So maybe I'll invert the colors. So we'll have like red text and then like light text and then a red background. Oh, wait. Hover. Whoops, I need I meant to do a light red. This looks so crazy. It looks kind of like evil or like because it's all red, you know? 
Some people think differently about it. This is interesting. And there's like really so much styling that you could get into. I don't know if I like this. And then obviously it takes up so much space on the front end. Like this is just insane. Maybe we'll do hover, border, or no shadow, transparent, not border shadow. <laughs> Shadow transparent. Hide that red shadow when you hover over it. It's like it pops up, but then it goes away. Although I don't think it actually goes away. I think it's still there. Anyways, when you click on it right now, nothing happens. I don't even see anything here. I think it just goes to the same page basically. But I'm going to turn it into a post request. So right now it just makes a get request like every other link. But if we add data turbo method that that's a post just like this now it's going to make a post request so when you would click that started post to owner sign up and then we could do whatever we need to do there so i'm going to go over to the controllers go to owner sign up controller and then inside of here i'm just going to say like current user dot create stripe account and then this is going to be a method I'm going to define on the user model. So we go over to models user. And inside of here, I'll do def create stripe account. And this is where I'm going to create the account for the user. So let's come back in here into the guide. And it was just this part right here. Or go ahead and paste that in. Stripe account create. Controller. And then... I guess there's like some parameters that i don't even really understand oh one thing is type express we don't actually want that so we might need to look into more about this information specifying the connected account properties let's right click on this open a new tab and let's look more into these properties because i haven't seen these before these must be new to the stripe see it says migrate your connection or your connect integration to use controller properties. I guess that's like the new thing. And that essentially it just goes over like a few things like what would happen if there was, let's say losses uh, for like credit fraud, whatever uh, we could say Stripe. <laughs> I don't get it. We could default value is Stripe. Well, what do you what do you guys think? I think it would be better if Stripe could handle that type of stuff, so I don't have to worry about fraud. But we're still liable for a negative balance. Okay. Well, let's try not to go negative. Controller fees payer. Either application, the Connect platform pays all Stripe fees, or the account pays all Stripe fees directly. So we might want to think of that. By default, it's the account is the Stripe fees. The Stripe fees shouldn't be that much either. It's just like a little bit. But that's interesting how they have all these different settings. Then we have dashboard type, express, can access the full. The account can't access the express or Stripe. So one thing to note is that uh, we should leave it at full. It looks like a lot of these are defaulted anyways. But if you go express, they charge you like $5 for each account per month or something crazy like that. And if you're not ready to do an ex express, I think it's like it allows you to, or maybe it's custom. Anyways, one of these options, they cost a lot more money than just standard. So type. I think we might just want to like get rid of these controller actions and just leave them to default. Stripe account create. There's definitely more options to choose from than just those controller types. So we want to look more into the account create itself. Like this is just with nothing. Oh, that's kind of what we have right now. But I want to change this. And then this is what we get back. Let's look more at the Stripe account class. So we can see what other options we have. Like maybe we can pass in some of the information we already have about the user. 
So let's go over to the accounts API and we can take a look at what's going on here. So create an account, this is what we're looking for. So we can put in country, email. So these are some things that we do have. Like we definitely have their email. Although we don't know if they want to use like a different email for their strip account, but it would probably be the same. I guess it's really not that much information here when you think about it. So I don't know. Let's just see what we get back. We get this response with an ID. And that's probably like what we'd mostly need. But obviously, we'll take a look at that once we get to it. But we should have the ID. So I guess we can just do something like creating the account with nothing right now. Direct account equals this. And then I want to take a look at this afterwards. So I'm going to do binding pry. Now, the thing about binding pry is that it doesn't work with bin dev. It's kind of annoying. And I'm still looking for an option that will work. I just haven't found it. But we can add pry by adding bundle add pry rails. And now we have pry, although to test it out, we need to do rails s, basically. And then I'm gonna come in here, reload, click this, and then right away, no API key provided. So we did set the API key. Maybe I just forgot to restart the server. Although no, I definitely just started that. So why did the Stripe initializer not go through down here? Secret key. Let's try to access this in the terminal. And then if we're not able to access it, it means it's not set properly. But yeah, it's not set properly. Are we able to access this? No. Weird. So the credential doesn't have access to Stripe or anything. So I'm gonna quickly go and try to open the credentials. I'm gonna do it using Vim. And there's nothing there. Oh, I wonder if using Visual Studio Code actually made it not work. That's what it's looking like. <laughs> we can open recent and we might be able to find it. It looks like right here, open. But apparently there was no way to like, oh, maybe I forgot to press control S to save it. Cause I just kind of exited out. I didn't know what to do, but we definitely need to right quit. All right, now let's reload. Get started now. It says you can only create new accounts if you signed up for connect. Oh, so we haven't signed up for connect yet. So at least this message is pretty helpful and just tells us to go to this URL to sign up for connect. Uh, although I don't see where we sign up for it, but I guess let's just click on here and then choosing the onboarding. We can send connected accounts to a Stripe hosted onboarding flow. This is probably what we want actually, because or we could do an API, we could do an embedded. If we want to keep the user on our site, which maybe we want to try that because I haven't tried that one yet. As long as it's still free. I, I just feel like I tried to do one of these a few years ago and it, they started charging me for the accounts and it was really annoying. But I think that's just because of the Stripe or Express kind of thing. So I think we do want to provide them to the Stripe dashboard just in case they want to, you know, like check more about their payouts, refunds, whatever. Because if you do none, that means that they just don't have access to it at all. So we could do both. There's, it's cool that there's so many options now. I'm probably just going to have to walk through here and then choose what I want to do. I kind of want to do embedded because that means we could just display a little pop-up for Stripe inside of our app, which would probably be the best way to do it. All right, everybody. So back to where we were with the app. I was just resolving an issue with the Stripe API key not showing up. So now we should be able to access that. If we go into the Rails console, 
and then we try to get this key. Okay, you'll see that that is the secret key. You're not supposed to share that with anybody. But I'm letting you guys see it because, you know, I'm not worried about that right now. So now that we have the key coming through, it means that stripe is set up. Oh, and then, so the other error that we were seeing when we tried to create the Stripe account from this method was actually that we hadn't signed up for Connect yet. So we have to go to Stripe and go to our dashboard and make sure that we're signed up for Connect. So right now, I don't think we are. Let me try to find that section. So it's right here, Connect. When we get in here, okay, we don't have it. It says Get Started which means we need to set up the connect side of things. So I'm just gonna go through. It says the first thing, how will funds flow on your platform? So sellers will collect payments directly or buyers will purchase from you. I think sell to buyers yourself and then send payouts. It would probably be the latter because the buyers aren't gonna go directly to the seller you know, they're going through our platform because we have the Airbnb platform. So let's choose the second one and then I'll continue. So it says we have some responsibility. We have to confirm if the buyer purchased from you, you'll be liable for refunds and chargebacks. Oh, OK. So that's kind of how it works. Uh, so if they need to do a refund or if they charge it back, it means like the charge goes on us. I guess you could choose whatever you think is right for your business, but I feel like for a platform, you're usually handling all of the payments for the seller. So the seller doesn't have to worry about that stuff. And also for other reasons like taking application fee, stuff like that. So these are our responsibilities, onboarding, a few other things, that's fine. Let's connect. And then it asks, how will sellers be paid out? By the way, this setup process is way different than it was a few years ago when I last was working with Stripe. Now it's more like GUI and this whole like step process they have to go through, which is kind of different. So it says send individual payouts or split them between multiple sellers. Okay, so are we gonna pay them individually or are we doing multiple sellers per product kind of thing? Now for us, we're just gonna be paying out to one seller. So that's all we need. Although I don't know why we have to select this now. It never used to be like this. And then it says select the industry that best matches your business. So are we doing, well, it, the funny thing is it has all the names of the companies. They literally have an Airbnb one right here for travel. So let's click on that. And it says, where will sellers create their account? Onboarding hosted by Stripe. Yep, I think that's what we're gonna do. The other ones are embedding an onboard component, which I guess we kinda, I did wanna do that too. So we don't have to redirect on the Stripe. And then there's also build your own API and then so like use their API to build your own front end for signing up, which might be cool if you're trying to have total uh, control over the sign up process, which a lot of apps do like that. I don't really care. I'll just go with the embedded option. So it still is inside of our app, but we don't have to do very much coding for like custom front end like we like that one would be. OK, and then where, where will sellers manage their account? So we can choose one of these, express dashboard or embedded account components. Ooh, that's another good one. How about we go with the embedded because it'll stay inside of our platform, but we don't have to do a lot of front end code. All right, then I'll continue. Let's keep continuing. Hopefully that was it. Okay, so we got through, tell us about your platform step. Now we have to activate the account. So let's do that get started with activating. It looks like they might ask me some personal information. Also, it looks like they're talking about a bank eventually. Okay, guys, I finally finished with all of the personal information. They basically asked me about like my address, my personal social security number, and then also about the business address, the business name. They told me to add in like the domain. So whatever domain you're planning on using for your app, just put that in and then like this doesn't really matter because we're just testing right now. But for some reason they still want you to add in all this information. But after we added the bank too, 
So I had to put my real like routing and account number in here. And then now we get on to the next step, which is like tax calculation, climate contributions. So these are if you want to like, you know, take care of taxing and then also contributing to climate. So this one might be good, like see, because everybody cares about the climate and I personally do. So I think I would donate like 1%, 1% sounds so small. You know what I mean? I would probably do more than that. But it looks like they can just automatically do this if you want to take care of climate and then also tax, basically. Like, do you want to tax your items? Because we're going to need to do this anyways. anyways. But I'm just going to skip for now because that's an option. And then I guess for climate, I'll continue with 1%. All right, so now that we got that all sorted out, I just submitted that. And it looks like we should be good to go. So now to figure out if we have connect set up, we can try to navigate back to the connect area and we should see some new things. So I'm actually feeling kind of lost. Where's the connect area? Yeah. Even though customers, oh, right here. Okay, so they moved the connect area out a little bit and it looks like we actually have two steps left. So it's a verify an identity document this is all new. I've never had to do this before. So I guess I have to con uh, continue. Yeah, I'll be right back. I have to put in my ID basically. Hello, everybody. All right, we're going to continue on this adventure, trying to set up Stripe Connect in our app. And we essentially already have it set up. We created an account for that user. But from there, we need to link a few more things. Like we need the user to go and fill out their information and like set up a Stripe account and everything. So I'm gonna sign back in to the account I created yesterday because that one already has a Stripe account ID. And then I'll go to the new listing page. And what I wanna do right now is update this UI when you've already filled out some information. Like when you've already clicked this button and you've created the Stripe account, from there, we need to show different UI and just tell them that they need to go and fill out their information. So to accomplish all of this, let's go into the views. Let's go to the owner sign up view that we created on the show page. And then inside of here, we just have to change a few things, which maybe we could just change this bottom section. We can check if current user .stripe account ID dot present. This is going to check is it not nil we don't even really need the present part we could just say like if the extract account id because otherwise it would be nil and then already we're going to show something else so we're not going to show this image anymore unless we wanted to i think from here i'll probably just have like another div maybe like a little div with a slightly darker background And then inside of this container, we could put like another P and just say to some information. Just uh, set up your payment processing. Obviously, this text could be fine-tuned to whatever you whatever type of message you're trying to display but yeah, that's probably fine for now let's reload we get something that looks like this okay it's pretty ugly let's try to squeeze it down it looks like there wasn't really any fixed width on this which is kind of interesting but it did do a flex justify center but the image doesn't even have any fixed width which is kind of interesting Let's just do a max width 2XL. And then we can do MX auto, which should push it into the center. All right, so that looks like okay. And then we can do some padding. Accomplish that with a P2. And it should look great. Okay. So that looks fine. Maybe we can add a break. So inside of our conditional, actually, I'm going to add a break. So inside the if. So that it only displays it when it's showing this other element. 
we're gonna have that little bit of break in between the content. It says you need to fill out some information to set up your payment processing. And then we can have a link to finish sign up now. Now I don't know where this link's gonna go. Because we need to do, we need to create that Stripe account link. So we might just have to already like do this inside of here. Let's add some styling at least. For this, I guess maybe like BG White. Since it's Airbnb, we're gonna try to make it like red. So we do border of red and see what that looks like. We have this finish sign up now. It's kind of sticking to the text, so let's add another break in between these elements. Alright, now it just says you need to fill out some information. Finish sign up now. Weirdly, the padding's not really taking effect on the link too much. So maybe we'll increase the padding to P4. Hit reload, and this looks fine. So finish sign up now. And then we click on this, it should redirect us to Stripe, which right now it's not. So I'm gonna quickly pull up the Stripe Connect documentation, just so I can take a better look at this. So I don't think we're gonna do it here. Let me try to figure out where it is. Embedded onboarding. Isn't this where we are trying to do it? Show a localized onboarding form that validates data. I guess that is kind of what we're trying to do because we need the onboarding section. So we could either redirect them to Stripe or we could do it embedded. So I kind of want to do the embedding. So let's create an account and pre-fill information. So see, create a connected account. And it's just as simple as that. So we already did this. If you know the country for your connected account, you can provide that information when you create the account. Okay, so that's pretty easy. And we do know the country, but we can get to setting that in a second. Now I have to determine the information to collect upfront or incrementally. Upfront onboarding collects the eventually due requirements for the account, while incremental onboarding only collects the currently due requirements. So, and then there's some like advantages and disadvantages. <clears throat> disadvantages of incremental onboard connected accounts quickly results in a higher onboarding rate. And then we just have to get more information about them later. <laughs> so I guess there's two options, either get it all at once or just get it incrementally, which means you can get a little bit of information at first and then later on you can get more. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create another method on the model and I'm just gonna call it like, you know how we have that create Stripe account method on the model? I'm going to have another one called Stripe account link. And then we should be able to just pass it in right here as the URL to this link too. So now we have to go over to the user model and define that new method. So I'm going to go down to a new line and I'm going to create a method called Stripe account link. And then inside of here, we would take the Stripe account that we get with the ID and we would get the account link. So to do that, I'm gonna go back to the docs. Let's see, Stripe posting. Oh, so this is what the Stripe posting is. We get the account link. So I guess that's what I was looking at before. But if we do an embedded onboarding, I think we'll do it differently. We actually create an account session and then we initialize some JavaScript with the session. Okay, that is a lot different. Okay, so it's really up to us. Do we want to like, redirect them over to Stripe or do we want to do it embedded? I'm actually fine with doing it either way. But I guess let's do it embedded because that's just more fun. 
Alright, forget the account link. Let's just delete that. And then what we'll do is we'll just have a div right here that we load that stripe onboarding session into. And to do that we'll use stimulus JS. So let's add a data controller and we'll just call it like I don't even know stripe stripe onboarding onboarding controller. I guess that's fine. And I'll go to the console. I'm gonna run the Rails feed stimulus command, which all it really does is create the stimulus controller. It doesn't even like uh, there's a few different ways you can set up your app. But right now, because we're using this index.js, we're just eager loading the controllers. Uh, sometimes in Rails apps, they have to like manually basically name each of these controllers. They need to import them in this index file. But the way that this app is set up, we don't have to do that. So actually, we don't need to use the generator command if we don't want to. But it'll just give us like this basic setup like this. It'll give us a connect and it'll also create the export class, like the basic framework. So I guess I'll do it from the command. I'll just type Rails G stimulus and then stripe dash onboarding. This will create that stimulus controller. And then I'll go ahead and start the server again. But let's go into the code. Let's go to stripe onboarding controller and the stimulus controller. And then right here on the connect is where we would start working on loading this stripe session. So what we need to get is we need to get this account session and then we need to pass. Basically, if you see what's happening is we do this in the back end, we create the stripe account session. And then in the front end, we're actually creating like Stripe Connect instance. After creating the account session and initializing ConnectJS, you can render the account onboarding component. So I don't know what initialize ConnectJS is. It looks like that's pretty important. So we need to set up ConnectJS. Wow, I've never done this yet. That's interesting. It's saying that we should use npm, but we're not using npm because we're using import maps. But we should be able to use import maps. It looks like what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to return this client secret after we create the account session. And then on the front end, we fetch the client secret. And then basically initialize or we, we load connect and initialize with the publishable key and the client secret. There's actually not too much, just a few things that we're going to implement. So first would be the route for creating this account session. And then also we need the Stripe ConnectJS library. Let me try to add this library real quick using import maps. So I'll type dot slash bin slash import map pin Stripe slash ConnectJS. Okay, perfect. So it worked. We were able to get ConnectJS. No problems there. Now for the account session route, let's go and create that real quick. So I'll go to, I guess I'll leave this for now Let's Stripe Onboarding Controller. And let's go over to the config routes.rb. And inside of here, we need to figure out where we want to have that route for the account session. So we could have a full controller for it, or we could just make like a method on the owner signup controller. There's a few ways that you can do it. Usually I would create a whole controller because it's not that big of a deal. It's just like one more file to have in your app. And then it can organize things. So let's do a whole controller. We'll just do a resource account sessions. Actually, we might want to do a namespace for Stripe if we want to organize it more. So we do a namespace for Stripe. So then the URL, here I'll do a comment. It'll look like slash Stripe slash account sessions like that's where we're going to be posting to and then let's say only create and then since we're already doing a plural controller name that's really fine now we just need to go and create a stripe folder for that namespace and then inside of there 
we create a account sessions controller to RB and inside of here we need Stripe module which actually I don't know if this will interfere with anything hopefully it'll be fine and then account sessions controller I'm just saying that because I know there is like a Stripe class I wonder if it's gonna throw an error because of this it probably will and then let's do that create action and inside of the create action we would simply run this code for the Stripe account session say like account session equals this but then you'll notice we have the Stripe class like I don't know if this is gonna break it probably might okay and then for the account ID we're gonna get that from the current user Stripe account ID and then we have the different components external account collection I don't I think this should be fine now let's look at the example looks like all they're doing is returning this client secret to JSON so let's go ahead and do the same just like this and let's put it in a render JSON like here and I don't even think we need to JSON client secret account session client secret okay that should be good now on the front end we would make a, re a request to the server and we'd get that client secret back and then we're going to load connect and initialize okay and then we also have to import it so let's go ahead and add this into stripe onboarding controller right up at the top we're going to import this load connect and initialize and then inside of the connect is where we're going to run that code so let me just copy both of these things all right so where we create the payment component and then first we have to initialize so we're going to use the publishable key so what I usually do for the publishable key is I'll just put it up inside of the meta tags in the HTML and then I can read it from there. We can just say publishable key and then we can say let publishable key equals document head query selector maiden name right PK and then dot content. And then what we're going to do is we're going to pass that into the header section. We go to the views layouts application.html.erb. Inside of here, we can do meta up here, right? PK. And then content would be that publishable key that we can get from Rails application credentials.dig right pk let's close it off and just like that we're going to be able to pass that into our javascript code we could also pass it directly through like a data attribute but i'm just doing it like this i guess now we have the publishable key now for the client secret we're going to need to have that real quick so client secret we're going to get this from hosting to the server so I'm pretty sure we already have request.js. We used that in a previous episode when we're implementing direct upload. So let's import post from browse request.js. And then we can just post to get that client secret. So let's do a async. And then we'll do const response equals await post. Like URL. So now we need that URL. I guess we can just hard code it right here. Just say like slash stripe account sessions. And then, right, we're not even going to pass in a body or anything. It's literally just going to post and then we're going to use the current user that's already signed in via the cookies to authenticate and get their correct stripe account. So, like, it's pretty simple actually. And then to get the JSON, we just say await. Oh, JSON. I'm gonna call it JSON data, I guess. And then to get the client secret, client secret equals JSON data. Whatever we called it back here, we just called it client underscore secret. All right. Pass it in. Then we create the payment component, 
And what we could do is we could just say this dot element a pen child paint component. So now we're gonna add that embedded component onto the page. So let's put it all together and see if it works. Let's reload. Inspect, look in the console for logs. Okay, I don't see anything. Alright, right, now we get an error. To initialize connect embedded components, you must either provide either a client secret. Oh, do we not? Let's try to log the client secret. Main request. Client secret is let's paste it out. It does have it, look. It's actually the client secret. That's crazy. It's still being annoying. Fetch client secret. Oh, because I passed in fetch client secret. It was expecting a function. So maybe we should make it into a function. Hey, what is this? Okay, let me install this because I've this has been bugging me in every video of whenever I've been editing. Okay, don't show again. <laughs> fetch client secret. Okay, let's try to just instead of fetch client secret because we've already fetched it. Let's just pass in client secret like that. Now let's reload. It looks like it was working, but then said the Stripe Connect payments component is not enabled. So we'll make authenticated requests on its behalf. We are interrupting the request and will not send a reply. What? The Stripe Connect payments component is not enabled. What does that mean? Let's look that up. I guess we have to request the appropriate capabilities. Apparently we weren't doing it yet. No, we said embedded components. Search thing. Let's look at our customers. Do we even have a... Oh, let's also make sure we're in test mode <laughs> before we do any of this. And I just want to look around and see what we have. Like, Let's go to the connect section. Oh, we actually have two accounts right here, but they're both restricted. Maybe that's why it's not working. So let's view the requirements. Add missing information, onboarding and verification. Okay, so I know it needs information, but that's why I'm trying to render the onboarding form. <laughs> it just says the Stripe Connects payment component is not enabled. Data layer disabled. Let's look that up. Error codes. Let's look up Stripe Connect JS. This error. I think Stripe Connect JS is really new because I haven't even heard of that. So look, it was just implemented like barely six months ago. So I don't know, we can look in the issues. This is kind of weird. Stripe connect instance, create payments. So that is what we're doing. Oh, wait, why are we doing create payments? We're supposed to create onboard. Okay, so that does make sense, actually. The payment component. I wasn't trying to do payments, so that's my bad. I must have those docs get started with connect embedded components. I don't know what the payment component is, then. Capture payments true, see? So, like, it must have been something else. Whoops, okay, let's reload with the onboarding. It actually worked, wow. And it's funny that the styling looks pretty similar to just a basic Tailwind type of app. And we don't even need our text up here anymore. Or maybe we should hide this. What we can do is let's put it inside of the div and then let's just replace the content after we load the account onboarding. So we can say this element Inner HTML equals an empty string. Now, oh, 
Maybe we should do it after we create the onboarding element. So we know that it's all loaded. And then, okay. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. Add information to start accepting money. <laughs> okay, so let's click here. And it does the little pop up. I mean, it probably, I've never seen Stripe be this simple, but it's just like right inside. Now it says you're ready to use Airbnb. So just like that. So now like our account is basically updated and saved and everything. That's so cool. So it was that easy. This is crazy because I just haven't used it in so long. So like from there, I mean, we've already onboarded them. We don't need to show them this page anymore. So how do we check? <laughs> I don't even know. Let's go to the Stripe dashboard. We can look in the connect section and see if we can find any more information. Oops, I'm in the wrong app. Connect, so one thing is the status. See, before it was restricted. So we probably wanna listen for that status. And then there's also gonna be really just the status that complete. We have to listen for that. So we have to find the, we have to set up some web hooks and then just listen for updates on the user account. Okay, so I think that's how I wanna monitor the account status. So let's see if we can find some information about the connect webhooks. So right here, after looking up connect webhooks, it's right away we have some information about this. So it says Stripe uses webhooks to notify your application when an event happens in your account. All connect integrations to establish a webhook endpoint. Okay. There are special, there are several events related to accounts that Stripe recommends listening for. So, when a connected account disconnects from your platform, occurs when a bank account or debit card is updated. Account updated, status changes. So that's probably the one we'd listen to for is like account updated. Now I just need to see does this happen? Does this automatically happen? Or we definitely need to set the web hooks up for Stripe for sure. But then what would happen is we construct the event. We also do some authentication. And then we can check the event type finally. So let's try to set up the web hook first. So to do that, let's go over to the developer section and then we can go over to webhooks, add an endpoint, and then, oh, perfect. So they do have two options, listen to events on your account or events on connected accounts. So let's do a connected accounts. And then we're gonna need a URL. So actually, I think this is where we might want to use the Stripe CLI to listen for new events locally because we can't really add a URL unless we have a public site, which is not a production, it's local. Oh, so we also have this option. Oh, look right here. So add an endpoint or test in a local environment. We can do Stripe login and then we can forward it to the webhook route and then we can trigger events with the CLI. So that's pretty easy. Let's do this. The first thing we need to do is log in with Stripe. So actually you need to get the Stripe CLI. So that's the first step. Download the CLI. I already have the CLI, but it's really as easy as just doing, if you're on Mac, it's a brew install for this Stripe slash Stripe CLI Stripe. And then for the apt, you just run these few commands, which will set up Stripe CLI. It'll add it to your local repositories and then you can install it just like this sudo apt install stripe 
and then the next thing is to do a Stripe login. So we're going to have to log in with this account. So I'll do that right now. Type in Stripe login. Now it's going to give you like a pairing code and now it'll tell you to go to this URL. Just like open it up in your browser and then we'll click allow access. So now access was granted and we have Stripe logged in. Let's get to the next step, which is to forward to the webhook URL. So we're going to need to create this URL. But if we type in Stripe listen dash dash forward to, we're going to do localhost 3000 slash webhook events. Let's just forward it to that. So right now we don't have webhook events route, but that's very easy to set up. Like you've already seen, if we just go to the routes, the RB. Oh, we might want to namespace it too, like we had for the Stripe namespace. I think I want to do that. Let's go back. We'll do slash Stripe slash webhooks like that. Okay, so now we do have it in the namespace. It would be as simple as just doing a resource webhook events only create. And then we need a webhook events controller. You can create it right now. So in the app folder controller stripe folder where we have the account sessions controller, but from before we're going to create a new webhook events controller. And then inside of here, we're going to have that, what we call the module stripe. It seemed like that could, that actually did work. It, there wasn't any problem by using module stripe. So that's good. Then we're going to have a class webhook events controller, which you can inherit from application controller. And then we just have a create action. Just like so. Inside of the create action is where we would process the webhook event. So if we look at the example code right here, we get the payload and we get the sig header. And then we do like this kind of whole bit of code, which we're doing a begin so we can rescue just in case there is an error. We're going to rescue for specific errors and return the status 400. So we're going to construct the event with the payload, sig header, and endpoint secret. So endpoint secret is the secret that we get right here in the console since we're doing it locally. But if, if you were doing it, like if you were adding an endpoint for production, you'd also get the secret. So what we need to do is we need to take this and put it into our app. So I'm just going to do the same old credential way. So if we open up a new terminal real quick, we're going to need a new terminal anyways. And then let's edit the credentials by doing, setting the editor to Vim and then typing Rails credentials edit environment development. That's the environment we're in. And then right inside of here, I'm going to add the webhook secret, paste that in. And just like that, we have our webhook secret. We actually need to start the server again because I'm using one of these windows for the Stripe listen. But just like that, we will have the secret. And then we can get it by doing Rails application credentials dig Stripe webhook secret WH secret. And then we'll be able to get the event. And then if there is an error, we'll just return that status and everything. And if we really want to, we can organize this, but I don't really care. I'll just leave it there for now. It's kind of a lot of code, but we can even collapse this maybe. I don't know. That's fine. Okay. So then finally we handle the event right here. Do like a case event type payment intent succeeded. Well, actually, I want to listen for the different events type. So actually, the connect webhooks, I wanted to listen for event type account dot application dot the authorized. And then we also had this list of all the events. So account dot updated. Let's listen for that. Account dot updated. But eventually, like this is getting pretty bulky. We might want to move this into a background job. Because we don't want to also we don't want to hold up the server at all because our stripe our app could be receiving multiple webhooks and we don't ever want to like make this server jam up. 
So we kind of want to pass it off to another method once we figure out what we're going to need to do. So for this, I wanted to check some stuff about the account. It looks like we actually get the account passed in with the event connected account ID we get from account. Okay, and then we could do stuff like whatever we need to do in the back end. So account updated, we, we might just want to have like a job for this. Like account updated job perform later and then pass in the event. Something like that. Now I don't know if we can actually pass the event in just as simple as that. Like it might get we might lose some stuff in the conversion process because this looks like yeah, like I don't even know what this event is gonna be if I'm being real. Still gonna need to debug a little bit. Maybe we'll do a binding pry. And then we can just pry in there and then to use pry we have to go and use Rails S instead of bin dev. And then to get that event we need to actually trigger it. So we need to go into a new window. And we can just type in stripe trigger account updated. It's gonna trigger the event. At least it should. And then in the other window, we should be getting that request in. Um, trigger succeeded, but over here, oh, we get an error. Um, invalid authenticity token. Okay, so that's because in Rails, we're like by default, you're always looking for an authenticity token. So make sure that you know requests are coming from the right place from inside your app but we actually need to skip that before action so we do skip before action verify authenticity pretty sure like that and because we're already using a stripe secret to deconstruct this so it's already secure we don't have to worry about this, the authenticity token all right, so I'm gonna try to get this to work. Let's trigger another event. Before action, verify authenticity has not been defined. Whoops. Let me look up the code that I need. Skip forgery protection. So maybe just like this, I'll restart the server just in case and let's see what happens. All right, we actually got it. We actually got it. Now we're inside of the pry. If we try to access the event, it looks like, let's try to get the class. It says it's a stripe event. So it's not even JSON event. JSON. Let's try to access that. What methods does it have? Maybe dot data. Event dot data. Dot class. Stripe object. Okay. So the data object dot id. So like it allows you to access everything pretty easy. What if we say event dot data to JSON? If we just say event dot to JSON, we get the JSON data. So what I'm thinking is we probably want to save this event in our database. So we could have like a webhook event model that we save the JSON to, and then we, later on inside of the background job, we could pull up the data and make sure it's all like it's already going to be safely secured in our database. It's going to be saved, so we don't have to worry about passing it through like the Redis and things like that. So we're gonna need a class for this webhook event. And then also the webhook should have an ID. We do have an ID, so we can use that to kind of organize it. So let's go ahead and create that class. So over here in this other terminal, let me make sure that I'm in my app. 
and I'll just do a Realty model webhook event. We're gonna have data type text, and then we'll serialize that into the JSON. And we're also gonna have the, I guess, event ID, which can be a string. And I really think that's all we're gonna need for now. And we can just do Rails DB migrate to migrate to the database. And then we're good. Now inside of the models, we're gonna to need to go and go to the models webhook event. And inside of here, we're gonna add the serialize method. Serialize data. And then it does work a little bit differently now. I'm gonna need to look up the reference because they changed it recently. You have to pass in the attribute name and then the class name or coder. So I wanted to just do like what JSON, right? But I don't think that's gonna work. So to test it out, let's do rel C, go in the console. And then let's do webhook event dot count. Oh look, so we actually it's not an error, but it's a deprecation warning, I guess. Passing the coder as positional argument is deprecated and will be removed in Rails 7.2. Oh, so there was just a deprecation warning, but like that's still kind of scary. So it's saying you have to pass it like this coder. I don't know why they changed it. Apparently you have to use the keyword coder now. If you don't want to get that error or that warning. And then eventually it will be an error. Right, so what we're gonna do is in the webhooks controller now, you can just do webhook event.create. We're going to have the event ID. It's going to be event.id. I think, I don't know if we can actually access it like that. I think we can, event ID. And then for the whole data, we're just going to pass in data will be event to JSON. Just like that, we're gonna create the event and then we're gonna take the ID so we can get the webhook event equals this. Then we can access the ID for our internal database and look it up later inside of our background job. So I'm gonna quickly generate a job in the console. I'll type in Rails G job, account updated. Now this is kind of just like a broad job. We'd have account updated job to form later, pass in the webhook event.id. And now we have this job over here, account updated job. We're gonna expect the event ID. Then we can look up the webhook event. That finds the event ID. And now that we have the webhook event, we also have the data which is in JSON. And I think, I don't know if we can actually reconstruct this class. Construct event, Stripe webhook. Stripe util convert to straight object. <laughs> so this is kind of like silly, but if we don't want to just work with the JSON data, we can actually convert it back to the Stripe object. I don't know if this will actually work, but there's no harm in trying. So what we'll do is, I guess we'll just do that from the console. We'll go rel c in this terminal and it'll say webhook event.last id. Webhook event.last. Oh, we don't have a webhook event. So we're actually going to need to just create a new one. And then we should get to this process anyways by doing the job. Yeah, that should be fine. So from here, we're going to run a stripe trigger account updated event 
and then let's just watch the show begin. Boom, so now we're inside of our background job. Funnily enough, let me try to see what the stripe object is. And I mean, it just looks like a JSON stripe class. It's just a string. So really the stripe object didn't really get created apparently. Oh, maybe we need to pass in the object itself. The event.data would appear to take objects. Wait, that's weird. <laughs> it looks like it's actually a string. What the heck? So the serialize isn't working. Serialize data coder JSON isn't actually working. Maybe I have to do like serialize as a hash. I don't know. Try to reload. Webhook event dot reload. Still a string. Alright, let's try this again. Let's trigger another event. Over here. Oh, we get all this stuff. Can't serialize data. It was supposed to be a hash, but it was a string. Oh, okay. Well, it was supposed to be JSON. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? Okay, I'm saying event.2JSON. But because I'm trying to save it as JSON, right? Like, that should be fine. Let's try to pass in event dot data. I don't know. Let's do this again. Let's do the stripe trigger. Okay, so now we do have a stripe object. We got to that point. And look, it's actually a stripe object. So that's what we have to do is just pass in the data. Everything's working perfectly now. And if we get like the ID. Well, I guess we don't have that. What do we have? We have the object itself. We do stuff like dot object dot ID. And the object ID is, look at what that is. It's the user's ID. And then we could grab dot object dot, we look for other stuff like payouts enabled is whether the user is able to pay, like whether we're able to pay the user or not. So now that we have this object ID, I want to see if we can query for the user and like find it by Stripe account ID. So it looks like, no, that didn't really work. Let's try to just view our last user Check out the Stripe account ID. It looks pretty much different. So I guess we're not going to be able to use that to look up the account. But it's just because I tested it with this random thing. And I think it just like gave it a test account as a parameter. So really the way that we're going to be able to test this is to disconnect our account. So maybe we should do that off the Stripe dashboard. Let's see, okay, let's make sure that we're in test mode. And then, oh, we got all these accounts. I think these are from our test creations. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to this account back here. And let's see if we can like delete it or something. And then we can have the user re-auth. Remove account right here. So it says account removed. And then we're gonna come back and now it says you need to fill out some information. But in the console, I think we actually have to recreate the account since we just removed the whole account. Oh, but we don't have our server 
Like it doesn't know that since we don't have our connection set up correctly with those web hooks, we need we aren't even listening for like what's happening on Stripe. So I actually have to manually remove that Stripe account ID. So I can just do it by update Stripe account ID to nil. All right, so now when we go back to that page, we actually just see the original UI. We can click get started, which is going to create our Stripe account. Just like that, and then we can reload. We get the onboarding page. We can go to add information and then see how this all works together. This is pretty easy. Just like that. Okay, now it's, yeah, yeah, we still have to answer a few questions, but it's embedded into our app. So they don't even have to go to a whole new website. They can just stay in the platform. They see all their stuff that they're signed in. I really like this flow right here. And you see, it's pretty easy to skip through a lot of those things. Information submitted, just like that. And then from there, oh, we actually have some stuff going on. I forgot, because we're supposed to be waiting for a webhook event. Oh, right here. Host to the Stripe webhook events. We actually got it, and I can't see what type of event it is, though. Oh, but since we we should have created a webhook event record, looks like there's a bunch of posts. So let's go into the Rails console. Do webhook event count. There's six. Let's check out the last. Let's also do created at time ago. In the second. New time helper. <laughs> I don't even remember what <laughs> time ago in seconds. Okay, maybe time dot time dot now. Or time dot now minus that time. Eighty nine seconds. So that that's that probably made sense. What was this webhook event about? Let's check out the data. Type is standard. Still doesn't really answer what I'm looking for. We're still looking for like the type. So let's try to grab that code from the job. We'll get the Stripe object. We don't have webhook of the event defines. Can do it like this. Okay, now we have Stripe object. We can get like the type, but I guess we can't. <laughs> we get object. Oh, this is annoying because I guess that's what happens when we just send the data and not the full event. We don't get the type of event that it is. I guess. Okay, we were gonna need to fix that code. <laughs> Let's go back into the webhook events controller and then let's just pass in the event itself. I don't know. I feel like that's probably the best way to do it. Let's try it out. I guess we can try it out with a strike trigger. Just check for any errors. In the console. Oh, we are in a pry. Oops. Actually, in a bunch of pries. So I'm guessing that would be in the account updated job. Oh, 
we actually have the stripe object ID and can we find find by stripe account ID hey we did find it so we can already implement the code where we update but I just want to quickly test out this new way of doing this so let's exit out let's remove the whole binding cry thing too let's just try to reset this and then I'm gonna test it one more time just see if there's any errors in our webhook event. No, it looks fine. So let's go look at that webhook event. Webhook event last. Check out the data. And now we get, well, a lot more information, I think. So I'm going to set this to a variable. And I'm going to go and grab that code again. We can create the stripe object. And just see what our stripe object looks like now. It's a stripe event. And then can we ask like the type? There we go. So that's what we we're missing. Now we can get the type off of it. Even though it just doesn't say type, it's probably somewhere nested inside. But it is the account updated type. And that's we should probably expect that since that's what we were already scoping it. But anyways, now I feel more comfortable with this setup. So once we get the stripe object. I want to get like the data. I don't even know how can I get certain things that I need. The account. Okay, so that gives me the ID of the account. Data. How about just typing objects? Okay. <laughs> You have to do all this nested stuff, data object dot now I have to look and see like which capability are we even looking for? We want to see if like their status. Let's go check status. Maybe status somewhere in here. See, I need to really find out more about the account. So if we reload in our Stripe dashboard, we should see that, oh, this is weird. I got signed into the wrong account for a second. Let's reload. We should see that my account that I did go through the process with, it says its status is complete. So how can I check for this? So from the connect webhook, I just need to see more about this in the webhook documentation. Or possibly there's another link down there, event object reference. Because I'm I am kind of looking through the event object. And I need to see more about it. Like how do I find status? So I'm just gonna search for status. The status of the webhook, it can be no, not that one. Or maybe like the account. The connected accounts. Hmm. It might just not have the information that I need. I really just don't know what event I'm looking for. for updates count requirements and status changes but how do I actually check like the status check status of accounts right
Okay, someone on Stack Overflow. He's trying to get it too. There's no status field on the account objects. Those status are likely inferred by looking at whether an account has charges and payouts enabled. Uh, <laughs> so charges enabled right here, payouts enabled, they're both to false. Oh, but the account, that's not my account ID, that's why. Okay, this is starting to make sense, because this account, if we go back... It doesn't really say the account ID, but it should somewhere. Account ID right here, it ends with a Q. It's actually different than this one. So... So that makes sense, actually. What we need to do is... Off of the Stripe object, we need to figure out, I guess first I need to figure out which webhook event is the correct one. This one ends in the, with a three, or it ends with a Q. I think that's my one. So I'm gonna set it to variable, and then I'm just gonna look through here. See if anything looks like enabled. Payouts enabled false, or just enabled false. So it's not even enabled. Just need to figure out which field to use. Like payouts enabled, charges enabled, or is it both of them? I'll just say like if stripe object dot where would it even be nested in inside of like data dot charges enabled. And we're gonna wanna find data the ID. Or do we still need the object, the data object? So we're gonna find the user by the stripe account ID. And we can update stripe status to complete. So right now we don't have a stripe status field, but I'm gonna quickly add that with the migration. So add stripe status to users. And stripe status is gonna be an integer. All right, then I'm going to, I just exit that, but I'm gonna go find that in the db folder and I'm going to add a default zero then in the user model I'm going to add an enum we're going to do right status and I'll just pass in an array which would be pending complete so it defaults to zero which would be pending and then complete is just going to be one that's kind of how it works. All right. So once it is complete, we'll just update it like this. Should be fine. Okay, now we can go and test this out. Let's run that migration. Now it's already this, but I think if I confirm it, it'll actually send another event, maybe. Probably. It should send a webhook. 
Let's see. I mean, I didn't really see anything. I wonder if there's a way we could trigger a webhook event. <laughs> or like, can't you resend events, I'm pretty sure? If you go over to developers, webhooks. Yeah, I don't know if we can do that. Logs. We have the logs for the webhook events. Yeah, I wish it had a history of the webhook events. Which maybe they do up here. I guess they do. Hmm. Count updated. When was that? 1848. That was like a a little bit ago. Scrape event. Scrape events resend. Oh, we can if we have the ID. So I'm going to go do that. Scrape events resend. This resource missing, so we couldn't really do that. This is interesting. If I just come back here up into the, for the last time that we updated it, grab that event. No, it's still not working. Okay, fine. I guess what I'll do is I'll go and I'll disconnect this account again and I'll just have to go through the process one more time. Remove account. Account removed. And then, oh, right, we have to manually go remove it from the console. So it's updated the Stripe account ID to nil. So now when we press this button, it'll create a new Stripe account which we're going to have to fill out the information for. I'm starting to get into the process and it's pretty clean, simple. All right, so I'm almost done setting up this account. It's really just a few steps and I'm gonna skip most of them. And we're gonna agree. And this is where the webhook should hit the back end and update the account, which I don't know if it ever did. So we can check in the console. Oh, the Stripe status is still pending. Look at that. So it looks like whenever the account, oh, there's actually an error in here. So something must have happened. Undefined method charge is enabled. Oh, let's try to figure out what the webhook event was. Like what the What the webhook event ID was. Job ID. I don't know if we can pull up the job ID. But we do see the webhook events controller has this event ID. So let's try to look for that in the console. It's going to reload. Look for <coughs> webhook event where. The event ID. Right, so we actually found it. And then we can check look event.data. See we have this. Now there's something went wrong in this check. So we forget the stripe object. And then we are checking if charge is enabled, but I guess that method's not defined, so we got this error. I never got to test with it yet. So let's see where is the real method. 
for charges enabled. I don't even see anything. Charges enabled is right here. So we should have been able to do it. Charges enabled, but apparently it's in. Oh, look! So. That's weird. Data object. Charged. Oh, there's just a typo. That's my fault. <laughs> I didn't even see the typo, but sometimes that happens. So, but then, yeah, we could just update the status. We can actually do that right now with the new code, but we can be confident that future accounts will update. Oh, undefined method object. So I guess that was the inner code. Got no object, so maybe just data. Oh wait, webhook event. Oh, don't use the webhook event, use the stripe object. Data dot object. There we go. So let me go place this code back and then I'll actually just run all this code in the console real quick. We updated the user. Now if we check user dot last stripe status, it's complete. It's perfect because then we can do some more stuff on the front end to let them know that they're ready. Actually, like once they're complete, it means they can start listing houses. So we've already completed that portion of the logic, which is adding Stripe accounts, connecting, and then you having an embedded form too. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the owner sign up show page. Actually, I'm not. I'm gonna go into the controllers. Uh, listings controller right and then inside of the redirect to sign up let's say if current user dot uh, we actually should have this method complete completed right if we called it no we called it complete <laughs> so it's not completed it's just complete if current user complete which that doesn't really make sense so it might be better to just say current user stripe status equal complete about the stripe status equals pending then we redirect to owner sign up path basically otherwise we don't do any sort of redirecting let's see what that looks like so if we go to new listing boom we can actually create a new listing so I'm gonna create a listing inspired by some houses. I don't know where I'm gonna do them. I'm just gonna look for, let's do lakefront. Okay, here's a little house. So I'll save the images. I'm just gonna take this title Put it in there. I don't have the address, so let's just do Lakeway maps. And I can just come in here, grab a random house address, and for the description, and take some of that description. Then let's put the images in. You can select all of these: five bedrooms, three bathrooms, eight people, maybe. Boom, just like that. We created a new listing. This is pretty exciting. And then from here, we can do more styling on this page. But the next thing that I really want to implement is the booking feature so that people can come and book stays now that the user has the stripe off. And we might also add some more styling or like add some more UI to show like a way to interact with your stripe account and then if you want to like unenable but honestly this is pretty exciting so far just getting it this far where you can connect to your account and start accepting payments so i want to get to that to accepting payments and doing the bookings right away all right let's get back to where we left off and the last thing i was doing was i set up stripe accounts and then once you do have your stripe account set up you can go and create a new listing so this is a pretty big step in this guide because that's kind of like the main point of Airbnb is it's a platform 
to rent houses and it allows the owners of the houses to make money off the listings. So that's actually the next thing that we're going to want to add in probably is when you edit a listing to add like a price to it. And then also, I don't know if we've ever set like owners. We never associated an owner to a house because in the past we were just creating listings. And that also means that as an owner who doesn't own this listing, I can go and edit the listing, which shouldn't be allowed. So overall, I'm probably just going to transfer all of these houses over to my user right here that I have created. Which right now we don't have any information filled out about the user, but we're able to find them if we go into the Rails console. So I'm going to open up a new tab, make sure that I'm inside of the app, and then I can do a Rails C. And if I just type in user.last, we're able to find that user. And then if I was going to say like dot listings, we don't have any method called listings. So we really need to add this all together and make this work. So what I'm going to do is I'll add a new migration. So I'll type in Rails G migration, add user to listings. And then user is going to belong to. This is going to add a new field if we want to check out what the migration generated. We can look at that file and it's just adding this code to basically add a new user reference, which just means it's going to add like a user ID. It's also going to set the foreign key. So now we know about a user on the listing. The next thing we can do is go into the code and go to our models folder. And then <clears throat> the next thing we should do is go into our code and then head over to the app models folder. And inside of here, we're going to add the code that connects the user to the listing. So inside of the user.rb, we're going to add has many listings. So a user has many different listings. And then inside of the listing.rb, I'll set the association to the user by saying belongs to user. Now you can put this wherever you want in the model, but I usually try to organize these together, like all the associations together. And then I probably do the belongs to before the has many because the belongs to is like your parents and the has many is like their children, if that makes sense. So you can only have one, but when you do a belongs to, you can only have one item. But when you has many, you have multiple associations. And then if you did want to tie in like, you know, one model, but having multiple different parents, uh, I will get to that later in like other tutorials, but I've done that. I think I did that in maybe like one of my other tutorials where I was talking about creating likes or something. Or I don't even know if I have went over that yet. That's still a topic that I'll have to get to. Anyways, with this done, we have the code in place that associates the user and the listing. So now I'm going to just go and update all of those listings that we already have. So I can go into Rails C. I can just do a listing.all. Let's count them first. We have four listings. And then what I can do is just do listing.all.updateAll. User is going to be user.last. And we get this error. That's kind of weird. Can't cast user. Okay, maybe we can't do an update all. We can't put in like a model. So we have to say user ID is user.last.id. Now I run this and it says column user ID of relation listing does not exist. Oh wait, did I never migrate the database? I think I only looked at the migration. I never migrated the database. So you have to do a Rails DB migrate. Okay, and we still get an error. Column user ID of relation listings contains no value. Oh right. Because so basically our migration is saying that in the last migration, we said no false. So when we're trying to run this, it's getting an error because there's already listings that don't have a user. So the user ID would be null. So actually we're gonna have to, I think we're gonna have to allow null true just for a second. <laughs> now we can migrate the database like you saw it worked. Now go into the console, or else see, and I'll just update all the listings with the new user ID. Okay, perfect. So now all those listings will now belong to that user. And any future listings we can make sure belong to users too, but we're gonna have to go and update the controllers. 
So inside the controllers folder, we have to go to listings controller and I'll have to change how the listings are getting created. So the first one is the listings index. This is what we use to show all of the listings. So actually this should stay the same because we're going to want to show all the listings that are available. But when it comes to the new listing, we're probably going to want to initialize this off of the user. So you can say current user .listings new. And more importantly, when we're doing a create, we're going to do current user .listings new also here so that it'll have the user reference. And then for update for set listing, I think this is fine to just find the listing by the ID. Although we're going to need to add some authorization now so that only the users that own the listings can actually edit them. Because right now anybody can go here. If I go into a new incognito window, I'm still editing this and I'm not even signed in. So see, that's a bad thing. We're going to need to add some authorization. So let's do authorization, not on the show page, because that's fine, but on the edit, update, and destroy, we're going to need to definitely authenticate the listing that we're on. So what I'll do is, oh, and on redirect to sign up for a new listing, I don't know if that's taking effect. Let's go back into incognito. So what happens if I go to slash listing slash new right away it says undefined method stripe status for nil so we're gonna need to go into that method because we have this other method we created earlier redirect to sign up if current user stripe status equals pending we probably want to add another condition in here so really we want to redirect to root path if not current user and then we can even put a message in like alert, you must sign in before you. Or actually, we don't. We probably don't want to redirect to root path. We can just redirect them to new user session path, so they have to sign in. And then we'll just say you must sign in before you can create a listing. Now let's reload over here in the incognito browser. Let's see what happens. So we still get. Oh, it's still going to the next step. So actually we need to add a return and here in the listings controller. Funny enough how the methods work is even though we redirect the page, right? It's still going to go to the next code and then it would break here because of the syntax. So there we go. If we tried to create that new listing like we did before, let me just do it. The weird thing is I don't see an alert. I wonder if we skip that if I skipped showing the alerts real quickly. Let's go over to the views layouts application. No, we are showing alerts. Oh, I know what's happening. So they're getting hidden by the nav bar because of the nav bar's absolute position. It's actually hiding the alert behind it. So what we're going to want to do is go to the alerts partial and then honestly, we're going to make these absolute as well. Absolute and then it's gonna have to be a larger or like more top because top is gonna push it down from the top of the page It needs to be a little bit more than the nav bar if we want to see that message So let's take let's check it out now I'm gonna go to the new listings page and boom just like that. We see our error right here And it's actually like absolute Positioned which means Well, I thought it would scroll To add some blue backgrounds on here. But look, we do get the error, invalid email or password. But it kind of like it also goes over the nav bar. We'll do the zero. Try to push it under. And then we can also go to the nav bar and make uh, like increase this z index. 50 okay look and now the nav bar is actually going over the alert but my question is why is the alert not staying like because our nav bar we're doing fixed maybe it's fixed maybe i have to change absolute to fixed let's see 
Oh yeah, there we go. Do we really want our alert to follow us though? Not really. So I guess absolute is fine. And then what I'll probably do is I'll style these alert and notice uh, different divs a little bit differently. Like I'm still gonna use the base styling. We can uh, have both of them be like rounded with some padding, but the notice should be a little bit more like happy. We do text green 500. And then let's add like a border green 500. And then we can do the same styling, but I'll just change it to red for the alert. And let's take a look at what that looks like real quick. Oh, <laughs> so you have this kind of like funny look. Now it kind of looks like Italian because it's like green and red, but I need to add a conditional around the P because what's happening is even though there's no text inside of the notice, the styling is getting applied and because of the padding, because of the border, we're just seeing an empty div that's still showing. That's why we do a conditional around the HTML content. So we can say if flash notice dot present is usually what I do. Then we would show the notice and then the same thing for the alert. Alright, so now it's not showing, but then we do get an alert. Uh, well, it should have popped up. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't use the present. Oh, <laughs> I forgot to change this to flash alert present. There we go. So now it pops up, although it looks kind of like a button. Maybe we should do top 16. That might fit a little bit better. Okay, that's good, but yeah, it's still... <laughs> Let's get rid of the border because it looks like a button. What I'm really going for is like a white alert. Let's add BG white, BG shadow. Well, actually, that's on the notice. We don't really see anything. Wait, BG shadow, that's not anything. I meant to say shadow large. Right, so it's just like a little pop-up. I don't know, I might put it on the right side. So we can say, honestly do width full flex justify end. I think that might push it over. There we go. And then we might want to do a border, just like a really small one. We do border and then border gray 900. So then an alert would look like this. It still kind of looks like a button with the border. <laughs> huh. So we might want to think like maybe only doing a border bottom, the border B. Just how can we make it look more like an alert? Well, that doesn't really look right. Valid email or password. Well, one way to make it more look more like an alert is to add an icon. So since we have font awesome icons, why don't we just find an error icon for the alert at least? And then we can find something else for the other one. So maybe like exclamation point. We could try this. So I'll just put it in here right before the alert. I might have to change up the styling a little bit. check it out so yeah that looks pretty much like an alert we might want to add more padding and like push it over a bit so let's do a max width on this MX Auto. Well, I don't know if MX Auto is gonna work in this situation <laughs> it kind of just pushes it into the center uh, yeah we might want to do flex justified center and then have another div inside. Probably a good way to do this. With the max width. And then I'm just going to quickly add a background to test. Alright, so now it looks like the size is right, but now our alert is just taking up too much of that div. So I'm going to go back into the code 
and I'm gonna try to figure this out. So really what we want to do is this inner div, because it's stretching 5XL, that's what's giving it the size. But what we need to do is say flex justify end. So we can push that alert over to the right. Now when we reload, we'll see that the alert pops up right there. There is still the green background. So I'm gonna delete this BG green from this div. And now we get this nice alert kind of pop up. And I think that looks pretty good. We can always work on it later. And if we go to try to create a new listings, we get this nice pop up that says I need to sign in. Okay, cool. So now let's get to the rest of the authorization. So I forgot we're in incognito. I'm gonna go back to this listing. And now I just wanna make sure that only the owner of the listing can actually edit this listing that we're on. So we're gonna do some authorization in the listings controller. What we're gonna do is we're gonna add another before action, which will just be called authorize owner. And then we're only gonna do it on the edit, the update, and the destroy. Also, another thing to note is I'm, I'm doing it after set listing because I want to already have the listing, like the at listing available. And then we only need to do it for these edit, update, and destroy routes because those are the ones that we want to hide from anybody who doesn't actually own the listing. Then down in the private section, we can define that method, authorized owner. And we'll say redirect to root path. And let's add an alert that says like, you are not allowed to uh, view this page or something. And then we'll say if current user not equal to at listing dot user. So we're comparing the user that signed in with the listings user, so the owner of the listing. If they're not the same, then we're gonna just redirect. So let's take a look at how that works. So if we reload right here, I am the owner, so I'm able to edit the listing. If I wanna change something about this, let's add a smiley face. Update the listing, you'll see that still shows that smiley face. But if I go into incognito window, and go to the same route, and edit listing, we get this alert, you are not allowed to view this page. So that's perfect. We've already implemented authorization. Although really we shouldn't show the edit link unless you're the user who can edit it. So we can quickly change that. If we go to the views listings, the show page, then we can look for that edit listing route, which is right up here. And let's just say if current user equals at listing.user. So that's how we authorize. And this condition on this link what it means is that now when I reload in incognito, or even if I sign up as a new account, let's sign up as a new account, and then I go and try to, like even if I hack the URL, go to the edit page, it just says you're not allowed to view this page. So I'm not able to do it. And then if I want to create a new listing, I can, but I have to go through the sign up process. This is already... This app is coming along, like it's actually looking pretty good. We have the settings page, we have this new listing logic. And uh, yeah, the only thing from now, from here is just adding the booking section so that you can book or you can reserve a spot and then probably like some more improvements to the app from there. All right, so now that we have the user accounts associated to the listings and we also set up the authorization, the next thing that I'm gonna start working on is adding the booking section. So that's a pretty important part of this series and it's gonna be exciting to add. So really the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a price field onto this form so we can set how much uh, listing it should cost per day. And then actually for Airbnb, sometimes they have weekly or they have like deals where if you stay a week or if you stay a month, there's a different price. So we might want to have prices for each different, like we might want to do a price per day and then a price per week and a price per month. And then those will automatically get set. Like if you don't set them, then they'll just go to the price per day. We can do something like that. But I guess what I'll do is I'll go into the console and I'm going to add, I'm going to create a new migration 
for these changes. So right, Rails G migration, add price field to listing, and then I'm gonna add per day. Maybe like price per day, or we could call it day price, and this will probably be type decimal. And then we could have week price. Or we could have weekly price kind of better and then also monthly price these are all going to be type decimals because just in case the owner wants to put like 99 cents or something i don't know we could force them to use decimals too but or we could force them to use integers so that they can't have it they can't put like the amount of cents so i think it's fine to just do decimal and once we have that migration we can just let that go through and if we wanted to also edit the migration that might be a good idea. We can go in here and then add, I guess, step. I can get in here. I forget how to do this too. I'm gonna have to look it up real quick. Add step to decimal. This is like this, precision 10, scale 6, for money. So it says precision 8, scale 2. Scale is the number of digits to the right of the decimal point. Precision is the total amount of numbers. Uh, what if there's more than just 8, though? This is much safer and easier to use an integer in combination with Axis dollars. That's what somebody else says. If you need a number greater than a million, then increase the precision. Precision eight is only a million, but there could be potentially there could be Airbnbs that are listed for like more than a million dollars per day or per month or per definitely per month. So we can't use precision eight. Maybe we'll just do scale. We'll just leave it at the using scale. So I'll go back into the migration. Just put scale two. All right. And then I'm just gonna migrate the database. What Rails DB migrate? We get an error. It says error adding precision cannot be empty if scale is specified. Whoops. Okay, I guess. <laughs> I'm actually gonna just remove this scale. I don't want to set precision because I don't know if we're gonna really have a max number. Now I'm gonna migrate the database with Rails DB migrate. And then I can start the server with bin slash dev. Now when I reload, I see something like this. Oh, we don't have any price field on the page. So I'm gonna quickly add that in the code. So to do that, I'm gonna go into our code for our app. And I'll go to the listings underscore form partial. And then what I'll do is I'll just copy one of these other number fields we had, for like people limit. And I'll just change this to our new attribute which is, we actually have a few of them. So day price, let's just see how that looks real quick. So we can do like 15.99 if we wanted to. Now day price, it doesn't really read that well. Like, so we might wanna add a custom label, price slash day, we could do something like that. And then we could also do a placeholder So placeholder is just like some sample text that'll show up. And it could be like 15, or no, <laughs> I don't even know. Just like some money, just to show off like what you're supposed to put in, price per day. See, that looks pretty good. And then what we can do is we can just copy this div, and I'll change it from day price to 
monthly price, and then price slash month. And then for placeholder, I guess it might be more like, who knows how much they're gonna pay for, for a month. Actually, I forgot the week, so I'm gonna copy this, drop it in the center and change it to week. And then weekly price. And then we might change the placeholder. Thousand. Nothing. But they can obviously set this to whatever they want. And then to get it to save in the back end, I need to go quickly edit the controllers. Let's go to controllers and listings controller. And then inside of the listing params, we're gonna allow these new attributes. So day price weekly price and monthly price. And just like that, we're gonna be able to fill in this form with this information. Maybe it's like 150 a day, 1,000 per week, 2,500 per month. So there's like a little bit of a discount. Although, <laughs> wait, is that a discount with 150 times seven? 150 times five is 750. So it's like a tiny bit of a discount. It doesn't really matter though, right? We can help them figure that out later. But what we're gonna do now is, well, they don't really show like all the stuff right off the bat, but they might have like say, they might say something like starting at this much per night. We can go ahead and add that somewhere into our page. So first of all, we might want to think about where we want to put that. And maybe we could put it at the end of this description or we could also put it after these cards. I think I'll put it after the cards, like just keep it simple. So I'll go to the listing show page. Then down here we can go after this div. I might just collapse that code for a second. And then climb down here and just create Let's just get started by saying Starting at listing dot pay price per day or per night. Like you're gonna be staying there for the night. Starting at 150 per night. Okay, so we can make that look a little bit better. We could have a number for currency. Use that as a helper. So it'll transform it into like a money sort of value. And then we can also do some more things like add some margin on the top to push this down. Starting at 159. And we want to make this like pop out. So I think I'll make the text larger. And then we could put like the money. We could put that inside of a span. And then we could put some styling on the span. So span is just like another type of element that I use when I don't know. Like it's not a div and I'm also like putting it in the middle of text. So I just call it a span just for different reasons. And then we might do like, let's do a gradient actually. PG gradient to R to the right. Um, the red color to like a pink color. We can also make this rounded large and add a little bit of padding. You know, what? I'm going to do rounded full. I like where this is going. And we can do text red 100 for like a light text starting at, there we go, starting at 150 per night. And like it looks kind of bright, happy. Now I think the span, having this is kind of interrupting the text. So I might want to add some margin, MX1, so I can push the text on both sides a little bit. And yeah, this looks pretty good starting at, you know, 150 per night. We might have the text inside of the little button looking thing. I might make this a little smaller, text small, since we have the padding just so it fits in. And then, you know, like you scroll down here, you see like starting at this much per night. We might even want to put this somewhere up like more visible, maybe on top of the cards. Let's try to do that. Go back in the code, let's take this div and let's put it right underneath the description. And just like a little pop up yeah, I think that looks a little bit nicer. We might even center it on the right side. I think I might like that. We can do ML auto. 
Boom, okay. Yeah, that's cool, starting at this. And maybe we don't even need this whole margin thing. I mean, there's probably going to be some third space. So let's do like M margin top four. So I want to keep this space kind of condensed. Also, these cards are doing a margin top eight, so we might want to decrease that to four as well. Yeah, this is kind of easy to digest. From here, actually, I might want to center this, see how this looks in the center. So let's do MX Auto. I mean, yeah, it looks kind of nice because it all flows together. And then any further styling from here, uh, we could work on. But really from here, I think I want to add some sort of calendar that will show the available days, like the days that aren't booked. And then it'll also show you how much it is per day. And then if you select like a few dates, it'll show you the weekly price. All right, so previously we were just adding in this fields like for how much it would cost to stay per night. And then also we have the weekly price. And the next thing I wanted to do is have some sort of view where you could schedule your booking and then you could see like the full price. So obviously this UI right here, uh, it's not looking correct if we haven't set the price. So we might just want to hide that. So what we can do is we can just go ahead and hide this field if we don't have this listing day price. So I'll just wrap it in a conditional. If listing day price, then we'll show this content. And if I reload, you'll see that we don't see that um, anymore. But if I were, if I was going to go and edit this listing, which I can't edit it because I need to sign into the account. But if I was to edit that. And add a price then the link would show up just like this house we see that it's starting at this much per night yeah that's how I have it set up <laughs> so from here I want to set up the booking page or at least like some sort of preview page to see what the like what it what the timeline looks like for available bookings this is gonna be a really exciting part of the video where we get into building this logic for doing a booking, showing like which nights are already reserved, and just all different things like that. So let's just go ahead and get right into it. I think what I'm gonna need is another page for booking, and then I'll just leave it as like a booking page for right now. So the first thing I'm gonna do to create a new page is I'll go to the config routes to RB, and I'm gonna figure out where I wanna have the route. So up here we had this resources listings do, and then we had to get photos, which we had like this photos method on the listings controller. So we could do that for bookings, but it might just get kind of, it's already pretty congested inside of the listings controller. You know, like there's a lot of stuff going on. There's even like all this stuff that we have just from the scaffold, like doing the format JSON, like you don't use this unless you're using an API. This doesn't really make sense, but we already have our app set up like for APIs, so I guess that could be cool. But this photos method, see, it's just kind of like out there. We could add a booking method too, but I feel like it'll just clog up the controller. So we might want to go and put a new controller inside of the listings folder. Like we have the file uploads controller, and we can put another one, but the difference between file uploads and photos is that file uploads just using listings as the namespace if you look at this so it's not expecting an id so if we want to actually get the listing id in the url we're going to put our route up here inside of this resource and you know what i'm going to go ahead and drag this resource down next to the namespace just so we can see like this is the resources this is the namespace so if you want to see what that looks like, URLs that go slash listings. So this is what the URL would look like, slash listing slash file uploads. 
But up here, URLs that use the listing ID. Which could be like listings. And then actually gonna use Right, so now I think you can understand why we'd want to add the booking route onto this resources so that we can get the house that it's supposed to be at. And then we can have our route that'll look like listings, and then the house, and then booking slash new. Kind of a long URL, but at least it's easy to understand. And like when you're sharing it, it'll kind of make sense. And then if we wanted to override some of these routes and have them like a little bit more cleaner, we could do that too in the future. But what I'm just going to get into is I'm going to add our nested resource for the bookings. But I'm actually going to first do this in a scope. So scope module listings. And that's just going to mean that it's going to look for this resource inside of a scoped module which is basically the same as just having like a folder. Remember how we have a module, it's a namespace, different things. So having the scope module is just gonna namespace it in the listings, like as that's the parent. And then inside of here, we can do resources, bookings, only new and create. And now the reason why I'm doing resources instead of just resource is because I actually wanna have possibly like a, a booking object we're actually going to create a booking object so we could also have like a show page and then it would pass in the id whereas the resource it doesn't have any sort of like model that you're creating it's just a one-off route that you're going to use as like or like a one-off controller that you're not actually going to have like an edit or an update or a show so that's kind of the difference but now that we have this resources bookings uh our app is going to have a new route for bookings but it's going to expect to have a bookings controller. So we can just go ahead and create that real quick. So we have to go over to the controllers folder and then inside of it, we do need a listings folder, which we already have. So we can just go in here, create a new file from the bookings controller. And then remember inside, we're gonna have a module for listings, because that's the namespace. And then we're gonna have our bookings controller which can inherit from the application controller. And then inside of here, I'm just gonna put a new, and then also a create. And I'm just doing a one-liner, which means like you can put a semicolon and then have the end on the same line. This is just some syntax in Ruby. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. But now we have a new and create action. Then there's also gonna expect to have a view that corresponds. So what we have to do is we have to have this namespace also in the view. So we have to have inside of the listings folder, a bookings folder. And then inside of here, we can have that new template. So we'll create a file called new.html.erb. And then inside of here, I'll just put a little message, create new booking, just like that. Now, what I'm gonna do is we don't have any like link to create the booking. So we're gonna have to add that in somewhere maybe right next to this link, like starting at this per night and it'll say like book now or like check out bookings or something. So let's go to that page. So inside the views folder in the listings folder on the show page, this is where we're gonna go. And then I'm gonna find that message, which is right here, if listing day price. And then what we can do is let's just put another link at the end, link to uh, book now. And this is going to go to the new listing booking path. So I know this looks weird, but this is just kind of how it works in with the URL helpers. So you put the new first, and then you have the namespace, which is listing underscore booking. And then you pass in the listing because it's going to expect that ID in the URL. And then just like that, you're good to go. And we can add more styling. So for this, I might do like, 
we already have this whole gradient thing on the span. But we could do maybe like a green. Maybe a gradient also to R. Maybe to bottom. 300. And we can just see what that looks like. Probably going to look pretty bad at first. And I'll put a margin on the side. Let's take a look. Okay, it's starting at 150 per night. And then book now. So that's kind of like <laughs> pretty big text. I don't know. It looks kind of weird. Maybe we could get rid of the styling on this. Because I don't think this should pop out as a button. I do like the colors. You know what let's do is instead of having like a pill background, you know what I mean? Like the circle background that makes it look like a button. Why don't we take the same gradient and put it as the color of the text? So you can do that with styling and also with Tailwind. So what we can do is let's get rid of text small. So it's still going to be regular size. Let's get rid of the padding. Leave the margin because we still want to push like margin between the sides of the like the other text. And then also get rid of rounded full. We don't need that. And then leave the gradient. And then what we're going to do is BG clip text. So this is going to make the background, like it somehow makes the background work as the color of the text. Or maybe, I don't even know what it does. It's just like, maybe it makes a mask around the text and it inserts the background into it. And then you do text transparent. So we also have to get rid of text red 100 because we're going to make the text transparent and then so yeah you make the text transparent and then the background of the element fills where the text should be which gives you this nice custom color for the text and it's cool because this would work with anything like I'm pretty sure you could just put a background image inside of text and I've done that before if you want to get really artistic but now this kind of looks like a little bit different and then we could make this book now button a little bit less pronounced we can make this we can give it a text small class book now and it says like starting at 150 dollars we could also try adding a border border b and i really don't know if we can do the whole like gradient thing on the border i would like to but let's just do like border uh pink 500 or pink 600 like the same as the end of the gradient. Okay, something like that, starting at $150 per night, book now. And then I was just having the idea, it's maybe it'll be cool if when you hover on this section, it kind of like highlights the book now. Because we can do that with some styling with uh, Tailwind CSS. So what we can do is add the group class to this element. And then whenever you hover on the group, I want to add some custom styling to book now. So we can do that right here at the end. We'll add the group hover modifier. So maybe I'll put this on a new line. But whenever we hover on the group, think about what type of styling we could have. So there's some animate stylings. And with animate tail and CSS that I might look at real quick. We have ping, that's a good one, although that I think that affects the size. We have spin, so we can kind of take a look at what this looks like. See right here, kind of makes this element ping. I like that for notifications. We have pulse, which makes an element gently fade in and out, which that could be good for loaders. Oh, we have bounce. I think I want to use bounce, animate bounce. So group hover, animate bounce, and this is going to give us a kind of a funny effect where when you hover, Oh, it's not working. Group hover. We have the group class. Let's just try animate bounce without group. Oh, it's not even bouncing. There's, there's some problem. Like moving it to a new line or something. I don't see it bouncing. How about animate pulse? Look, the pulse one works, but the animate bounce didn't work. That was weird. 
Just don't see it bouncing. We are doing bin dev, so it should be working, but I don't know, it's not. Uh, okay, what's another effect we could do? I really like the animate effects, but I think you can do custom animations too. I just don't really know much about it. I'm gonna look up some Tailwind CSS custom animations. It would be cool if there was a library or like a framework of already pre made animations. Oh, yeah, because you can do, I forgot about this, but you can do keyframe transforms and like just make stuff happen with different keyframes. That's pretty cool. Look at all these animations they have in here. Not only is really not that much, just like this simple stuff. audio player animation for the play button. Pulsing. It's pretty cool. Yeah, there's just like so much to get into with animations, although I do love animations. I don't know. You see, it'd be cool to have like, we could do a scale type of change. 105, like imagine you hover and then this link just suddenly gets bigger. That'd be kind of weird. Let's try it out. Group hover, scale 105. So by like 0.05%, it would get bigger. Although it's not working. Let's try just hover. I don't know why some of this stuff isn't working. Look, like the hover class, that's kind of weird. How about hover yellow 500 or BG yellow 500. So I'm going to change up the background when you hover. Look, nothing. So that kind of gives me a sign right there. I mean, I was already seeing it before, but I think there's an issue with Tailwind. Maybe from what I did earlier, how I was starting the app with Rails S. I don't know how that could be a problem, but I'm guessing that there's some compiled Tailwind class that's overriding the custom styling. That's kind of what it looks like to me. Because nothing else would explain the hover to yellow not working. So we're going to have to basically do a rail to assets clobber. That should do it. And then we can also do a temp clear, although that'll, if we remove the temp, it'll remove our images that we have already in our app. So I don't really want to have to do that. Let me restart the server. The hover still doesn't work. This is pretty strange. What if we just do BG yellow 500, no hover, not yellow. BG yellow 500. This one's yellow. Hmm. get it BG yellow now it's yellow <laughs> so like it's just weird I wanted this to work with my group hover but like it's not working group hover BG green 500 I just want something to work. Come on. All right, look, our booking page actually did work. So I spent all this time trying to get the styling to do something magical. But when you click on it, it does work. So we don't really have to get too caught up on a little thing like this. Although I think it would be nice if we could color this element. How about we try to change like the two red 500. So we change the gradient. Oh, look, that works. Maybe we should have to work with what we have. Group hover from pink 600. So I kind of want to go with the same styling that we had. 
Oh, that looks kind of cool. So it goes from green to red. And then we could also do other animate pulse. Although the pulse might be kind of weird. It's like book now. And maybe what should happen actually is that when you click, how about when you click anywhere on this, like this text, it brings you to the booking page. Cause that kind of makes more sense at this point. So to do that, I'm actually gonna have to change this link and just wrap this whole div. And I do want to still have this button here. I just want to swap this out pretty easily. So I'm going to go with content tag, span, and this will actually allow us to create like a span, the same as the one that we have here, but with Ruby code. And then let's get rid of this route. Actually, I'm going to relocate it. And just like this, this is another way to create a span with Ruby code. If we reload, now we have just literally like a, a, a thing that doesn't do anything. You click on it, it doesn't do anything. So that's an easy way to switch a link to just to like a regular element. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wrap this whole div in a link to, add a do to make it a block. And then we also need the end, like always. And just like that, we have a link that's wrapping this whole section. Oh, and look at that. The styling got a little bit messed up because we were using the div to position this element in the DOM. So like in the HTML, in the page, I guess. <laughs> I don't know why I said DOM, I haven't said that in forever. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the MX Auto and the margin top four actually. I'm gonna take both of these and put it onto the link itself. Hope that that'll affect the styling good enough. Let's take a look, oh, it worked. And now when you hover on this whole section, it lights up. Another thing we could do is add an underline on the rest of the text when you hover. That might be kind of cool. So we could do like a border to border pink 600, but we want to do it on hover, right? Whoops. And border B2. Let's do hover. That kind of looks weird because it goes across the whole element. So I guess I didn't want to do that. But let's copy this code. And oh yeah, because I want to affect these two pieces of text. That's what I want to do like mostly. So I guess we should just put a span around them. And then just add the class. But instead of hover, do group hover. group hover and then make sure to end off the element. So we just wrap that text in a span. And now if I reload, take a look at what happens. It's not really the same as that one though. So let's make sure that that border is the same. I think it's because I did border two. Definitely, we're just trying to do a smaller border. It is kind of weird how it doesn't connect. That's the only thing. So we might want to just wrap this, like all this text in a span, which is kind of what we're doing with the div, but not really. So maybe we can just have like another div actually. Starting at, we have the span thing. And then that's it, we end the div. And then we have the link. And then we can get rid of the border on the number, unless we always want it to be showing. Ooh, and now our book now is on the other, we need to do flex, same page. But then I also have to do item center, push that button in the center. There we go. Although the border kind of pushes away, look how the border resizes the text. I think what we need to do is have a border bottom, but then have the border transparent until we hover on it and turn it pink. And just like that, you'll see that the text does not move when you hover. Now this, we did all that work just for this like simple effect that's kind of weird. 
Like the green to red looks kind of like Christmas, which I don't know if that many people are feeling. I'm not really feeling it anymore. So let's get rid of the green. So instead of green, let's do like some sort of bright color, like from purple to pink. There we go. And boom, starting at 150 per night. You click here and then it's like, boom, you're going to book your listing basically. So on the booking page is where we're going to get into like creating a fully styled page to book your listing and then choose the nights that you want to stay and create your whole plan. So this is going to be really exciting to get into and to just see like maybe we're going to use a library, maybe we're not going to, maybe we'll do it just by hand. I don't know, I'm going to have to think about it. But let's just start styling this so it looks a little bit nicer. And we can even probably do like the most basic setup first and then kind of get into a more advanced workflow. So let's go back into the code. Let's go to the listings folder, bookings new. This is where we have all the code set up. And then I'm just going to wrap this in a div. Max with 5XL. Max with 5XL. And then really in its most simplest way, we have a form with the model. Is going to be the booking, which we don't even have like a booking model yet, I don't think. So we define the booking inside of the booking controller in the new action. So I'm going to get rid of that semicolon. And then we just define it right here. So the booking would be off the listing, which we don't have the listing either. So actually, let's define that first. So in this bookings controller, I'm going to create a before action set listing because we're already getting like the listing ID in the params. We just need to set it. So I'm going to go into a private section by writing private and then underneath the private, I'm going to create a method called set listing. Inside of set listing, we're going to get listing from listing dot probably friendly finds just like we did in the other controller. And then it would be the listing ID. So we're going to be able to grab the listing and then on the new, we would set the booking equals at listing dot bookings dot new. Right. So we don't have a booking model though. So the last thing that we were going to add or what I was working on last time was adding in the bookings. So I created this bookings page where you could go and then view the booking, but there's not really anything there yet. I'm just adding a simple form. But we don't have a bookings model right now, so that's where we were at. I, would, I needed to add bookings and connect it to the listing model so that I'm able to create a new booking on this page. So really what we need to do first is generate the model. So we don't have any sort of booking model in our app yet. So I'm going to go ahead and generate the model. Okay, we're going to create the model for the booking. So to do this, we can use the Rails G model command and then put the name of our model, which is going to be a booking. And then we're going to add the associations, which is going to belong to a listing. And then it's also going to belong to a user. Then additionally, in like the most simplest way, we could just set the from date. Because like the night that you're going to check into the Airbnb, and then this would be type date time. And then another field which should be the to date, which will also be type date time. So then when a user would create a new booking, they would select the from date to the to date, but that would be like the arrival date to the departure date. So maybe we want to do that actually. I usually do like from and to just because it's familiar, I guess. We might want to make it more easy to understand by doing like arrival time. And then, how about check-in? Check-in time, or check-out, check-in, not the, not the time really, but the date. Check-in date and then check-out date. That sounds good to me. And then I think that's good for now. So I'll just press enter, it'll create the model, and then all we have to do is migrate the database with the RailsDB migrate command. So I'm gonna type in RailsDB migrate, and then I can just restart the server with bin slash dev. Now we still don't have the bookings association on the listing model, 
but they are connected. So it's what, the only thing we have to do is go to, to the models folder, the listing model, and then add the association for the booking. So a listing is going to have many bookings. So we're going to add that, as many bookings. And then inside the booking model, we can just take a look and it just has the class booking. It belongs to a listing and it also belongs to a user. Now let's go over to the user model and it has many listings, but it's going to also need to have many bookings. It has many bookings. So a booking would be like one that you're renting and the listing is one that you own as an owner. So this would be like your property that you're renting. All right, and then the booking model itself is just really simple at this point. So let's go back to this page and it should uh, not show this error anymore if we reload. So I reload and we actually get an undefined method bookings path. So because I'm doing a form with model for the booking, it automatically thinks it's going to just have like a simple plural bookings path. But since that's not how, what we have, we need to define our own path. So I have to go over to the bookings page on the new page and inside of here on this form with model booking, I'm going to set the URL to, it should be listing underscore. Oh, so actually we can fix this by doing a nested route. So we have to pass the listing. We can say at listing and then also at booking. This will know that it's supposed to be namespace and it will set up the URL correctly. So if we reload, now we don't get an error. We still have this text at the top, which is kind of like small, so I can add some styling here. Maybe do text center, make it a little bit bigger. And how about the title will say like, book your stay at, now let's put the name of the listing. So listing.name, whoops. Reload, it says undefined method name for listing. Ooh. It must have, it must be something else. <laughs> Did I call it like title? Yeah, probably title. So book your stay at, you know, this cabin. All right, sweet. And then underneath we would have the rest of our form. So really all we had was the from date and the to date or like the arrival time. So in its most simplest way, we could just do first a label, arrival date, and then we could do a f dot date field. Now this is like the most basic built-in date field, but it does work. So you'll, this is what it looks like, arrival date, and then you get like this built-in calendar, which is <laughs> pretty ugly, and that's why we might want to look at other like JavaScript libraries or just build like a uh, HTML full calendar view. I don't know, but let's try to do something with this for now. So the first thing I'm going to do is try to like space this out and maybe put this in some sort of like card on the page. Do max with two XL rounded large data large. This is on the div that I'm going to wrap the form with. Reload, okay, there's not much different. I'm gonna put these fields in the label into their own div with flex call, just to try to organize them a little bit. All right, so there we have the arrival date. I still wanna style this a little bit differently. I don't like, I'm not really liking this. Maybe I'll make the label a little bit larger. I don't know what's up with this max width 2XO. Oh, shadow large MX auto. I think, let's see what's going on. All right, so we have something like this. I still want this part of the form to be a lot smaller. So we can go inside, put a div max width, or how about width three quarters MX auto. And definitely going to need some padding inside of this card as well. All right, that's getting somewhere. So we have the arrival date. There's a lot of margin between these two. I think it's because of the gap. Let me reduce that to two. And I'm just going to copy this set of label and fields, and I'm going to change it from arrival date to our 
Or wait, didn't we call it check in and check out? Let me fix that. Check in date. So we have the label and the date field for the check in date, and then we also have one for the checkout date. Perfect. And the last thing I'm going to add is the submit button. And then I'll just put for the custom text, I'll say book your stay. And then let's try to add like a little bit of padding. I'm doing green. I don't know if I want to be doing green though. Let's reload. Okay, I mean that looks fine. Oh, I definitely want space between these different fields though. So on this top level div with the three quarters, I'm gonna add flex, flex call, and a gap four just to separate these all. Okay. Hey, there we go. That doesn't look too bad. All right, so you just choose the check-in date and the checkout date. Now, real quickly, I want to make it so that you can't submit the form without filling out both of these fields. So I think we can add a required true. That's just a built-in HTML field. So before you can submit the form, you actually have to fill out these fields. That's pretty useful. And let's just see. Let's try to do like a date for Friday and then check out on Sunday. Well, next Sunday. How does that look? You just click book your stay. Now right now nothing's happening. But it would be posting to the bookings controller. So we have to go and add the logic in there. So let's go over to the controllers folder, the listings, and then the bookings controller. And then inside of here we have this empty create action. So I'm going to actually add some code in here. So we're going to take that listing and then we're going to do a bookings.create with the bookings params. So that's a method that we're going to have to define down here where we'll permit the specific parameters that we want. So I'm going to require booking and I'm going to permit check in date and check out date. Those are the two fields that we want to update on the model. In this case, we're creating the booking. You can, you can define a booking variable, say at booking with this, and then redirect to the booking. Although, uh, let's check our routes. So we did use a resources for bookings, but we never defined the show page. So we probably want to do that as like a show page. Or maybe another idea is to have like your own personal bookings page that shows all of your trips that's probably a way better idea so we might want to create that route for now why don't we just redirect back to like the root path root path and then we'll do notice your book your stay with books i'm just going to add a little bit of information like the listing dot title And then also I can put the listing, or wait, the booking check in date. And then these are also things that we might put in like an email and send to the user. This is just a little bit of a confirmation message. So for the check in date, I want to do a surf time. So surf time is this is a way that you can format these date times into readable formats because usually they'll look like something crazy. In the, if we look in the back end, which is kind of difficult right now, unless I go to the Rails console later, I'm going to look up surf time for Ruby, and there's a few good websites that I use. Surf time. So there's one called surftimer.com, and you can put in the way that you want it to look. So if it's like this, how about me? We're already in June, June fifteenth. Oh look, and it gives you like the Ruby code, ordinalized. I guess that's what adds the tith or the second or something. And the fifteenth. Well, let's keep this simple. First of June. What happens? Oh, that's kind of cool. But then if it goes to like 15th of June, it doesn't really make sense. So what we want to do is probably just like uh, 06. Zero 01. 
what year are we in? <laughs> 2024. So just like the most simple kind of date format, that's fine. Give me admin that stir time. Okay, that looks good. Now let's try this again. So I'm gonna book my stay. And just like that, we actually get two alerts. I didn't notice that until now. So we're getting the top styled alert that we added earlier. And then we're also getting the one that shows on the listing page. So let me quickly go and remove the one from the listing page just because it's kind of redundant at this point. So I'll go to the listings folder, index. And I think this, oh, right here at the top, if note is present. So this was added by the original scaffold. I'm gonna reload. And yeah, now we have a booking. So this is pretty exciting. We booked a stay at one of these locations, which I already forgot. So we're definitely gonna want to add in some sort of UI to show the user that they have bookings. Probably in this drop down or maybe up here at the top. But let's go ahead and add that in since now we have bookings. So I'll start in the nav bar, I think. Let me quickly close all these open windows. I feel like it's kind of cluttered. All right, and then let's get started on adding some new UI. So I'll go into the app folder, the views, layouts, and then into this nav bar file that we created. Like a few episodes, now it's been like a couple. And then inside the nav bar, I want to add the bookings link, not current user. So when there's a current user, probably next to the new listing link. And now I don't know if I want to even show this to everybody, like new listing, because a lot of our users aren't going to be owners. They're just going to be booking. But we can try to think of the solution to that later. Right now, I want to add a new link. Let's say like bookings. And then this is going to have to go to some path that we're going to create. And then for the styling, I really want to just take the styling of the new listing uh, button or link. And then I want to change it slightly. So we have our gradient. So for the booking gradient, I want it to be a little bit different. So instead of indigo, let's do like a green color. You just bought the, you know, you just paid, although we didn't add the payments part yet. So that's actually kind of important. All right, here we have this little bookings thing at the top, although that kind of looks weird. It's a little bit too dark or too light, I mean, for the yellow. Okay, I mean, it's still a little bit, it's like a mango kind of vibe, which isn't too bad, but it's it can be weird. So on that bookings button, it does look kind of weird next to the new listing button. Um, hmm. How about instead of to right to bottom? We have like our little mango button. Maybe I need to change the text from pink to yellow. It's like slight things like that can help. Also the border is indigo. Which I'm gonna change that to yellow or maybe green. Very cool, it's like a little mango, I like this. And I wanna do like a, like a little pop-up kind of alert. Like you know those pings that you see sometimes on buttons that make you, that like show you there's something important about it. Like you have a new message kind of thing. So to do something like that, who I'm actually going to add a block to the link. And then also let's add a relative class to the link. And then to add a block, you just put do at the end of this Ruby code and then make sure to have an end. And anything inside of this will get put inside of the link. So I'm gonna do span where I'm gonna put the text of bookings. And then I'm going to do another span. That's just going to be absolute top zero, right zero. I'm going to give it a fixed height and width. And do rounded full. And then give it a background color. So this is what's going to give the appearance of like a little circle ball. Oh. See what happened. There's actually like a weird one over here. But there is the one that I created, which is up here. Correctly. But there's like a second one. I want to figure out why that is. Oh, it looks like the span. I forgot to close it. Slash span. And then the second span, I used a, I used a div. It's embarrassing. Sometimes it just types too fast and it kind of confuses things. All right, so we do have the little circle thing, but it's kind of like on the, it's too much on the button. I want to push it off the button and I also want to make it lighter. So I'm going to quickly add that, those changes. So instead of the yellow 600, which is a little bit darker, I'm going to switch to a 300 
and then for the absolute positioning for the top zero I'm gonna switch to top I'm gonna do negative top two negative right two so that should kind of push it out of the way it's a little bit too out of the way now so maybe we should go to one reload and that actually looks pretty good to me now the last, last thing that I want to do is add an animate alt blast so that's a part of tailwind and it kind of adds like this ping Although that does kind of add some sort of uh, like urgency. It gives you this feeling of urgency. And looking at your bookings isn't really urgent. So maybe I shouldn't make a pulse. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't even add that at all. See, there's different, there's like, sometimes there's better ways to do this. Maybe we don't even have this span up there because it's not urgent. Also, maybe we don't want the, the background either. Um, there's a lot of things that I'm thinking right now. I think the problem is it's conflicting with the new listing button. So I need some way of, uh, you know, differentiating the owners from the bookers or from like the regular users. So actually as an owner, I just created a booking for my own listing. Now that's not a problem or anything, but it is kind of weird. So what we probably want to do is have a new tab. So I can go to incognito window go to localhost and now I have a fresh window and I'm going to sign up as a new person. So here I'm signed up as a new person and now as a new guy I probably don't want to see like I don't want to see bookings and I don't want to see new listings. Uh, it doesn't really make that much sense to me you know. So what I'll do is I'll come back into our nav bar and then think about this real quick. So new listing, how about we only show those to the owner account? So if we go back to the user model, I want to take a look at what we're, what we're looking at. So we have Stripe status. So maybe we'll only show new listing to people who have a complete Stripe status. Maybe that's good. So the way that we can check for this is do like if current user dot stripe status equals complete. Then I'll show a new listing. Alright, let's come back in here. So then in my new person's account, we only see the bookings link. And that kind of looks good, although we don't have any bookings, so that doesn't really make sense. And I think I'm kind of done with the mango styling. So maybe I'll take the same styling from the new listing and just put it right on bookings. So we can put that back to how it was. So it's going to be like a bright blue. Although the bookings text doesn't really make sense either. Like what this is going to go to your bookings. Maybe we don't need that. So we can just delete this link entirely because we haven't even defined the bookings path yet. All right. So let's reload. This is what a normal user would look like. And then somewhere around the app, we'd have a link that says like, do you want to create a listing or do you want to become an owner? Maybe we, for now we could put that in this little profile dropdown. So on the same nav bar, we can just have a link to maybe underneath settings. That'll say like, become a, or how about like, list your house <laughs> okay, I don't know that's just the text I'm going to use for now and then this is going to go to well, like the owner sign up path I think that's what we had called it let me reload list your house okay that looks crazy how about start listing Houses. I don't know how this is going to look in the UI of things. <laughs> it looks so out of place. So you have like settings, start listing houses, sign out. I think I just need to style this a little bit better on this drop down. So right now we have like this flex, flex call item center, which is going to push everything in the center. I think we definitely want to change this up a little bit. Yeah, let's get rid of this. Let's just take the flex stuff. I'm going to add a second div inside. 
Good. Then I'll add like the flex flex call classes. I don't think we really need gap. Because I'm going to start styling these links a little bit too. So I'm holding alt on windows to actually like select the end of each of these links. And then I'm going to add a class. So I can do like padding with full hover BG gray 300. So it's going to get a little bit darker when you hover. And then, ooh, look at that. We have this little bit of a change in UI. And then for that start listing houses text, I don't know what we want to have it like become an owner. Let's just have something like that for now. Okay, that looks good. Settings, become an owner, sign out. Become an owner brings you to this page, which was like our advertisement or like our you know landing page for owners. And then once you get started, once you click this, it actually creates the Stripe account and then you have to fill in your information. So for this user, I don't want to become an owner. I just want to book my rental, right? So to book a rental, you have to first find one that has the price and then you can go to the booking page, which we still probably definitely want to update the booking page a lot. Uh, there's a lot to do from here, especially like getting a custom calendar would, could be nice, especially when there starts to be like certain days that are more expensive or like days that are already reserved and they have to get canceled out. I don't know if you could do that with the built in day select. Now I'm excited to find out but I'm just not sure what the limits are right now. So what I want to do is add some more styling improvements to this bookings page. And I already kind of have some ideas. So let's go to that bookings new page. And I'm thinking what we can do is we can kind of like push this form over to the right side. And then on the left side, we can have some images of that property. And that might make a pretty good look. So to do something like this, we actually need to change up the styling a bit. So we have this top level container, which is max with 5XL. So that's making that's like what causes this to be this size and also in the center. So we can remove that. Let's remove all this. Let's actually just do width full flex. So when you say flex, it means you're expecting that the elements are going to be side by side. So that's already going to change up the styling a bit. And I think that looks pretty good. So we'd have like the title and the image on this side and then the form on the right side. So let's work on adding that. So we're going to have one div on the left where we have the title. And then let's also go ahead and add in an image tag for the listing images first. So we're going to grab that first image reload it's like really huge so we're going to work on styling that for the title we're going to get rid of the text center so we're actually going to want to have it on the left side and then let's add some styling on the image go add a class and then let's do like height well at this point maybe like 500 pixels Could probably think about how, how big we actually want the image all right that's fine and I could do a BR between the title and the image. That looks good. Reload. And then for this div, I probably want to have these take up like equal proportions. So I can do width half. And then let's get rid of the, the max width 2XL and instead do a. Well, actually, we can leave this. We just need another div to take up like the width half. And then inside of it, we could have the form. Let me reload. All right, and we already get something that looks like pretty decent, although I might want to push down the form a little bit. So on this other div with the width half, we can just do a padding top 40, which is kind of a lot, but it's just gonna like push it down a good bit. Okay, there, I like this checkout page. The only thing is I already know on mobile, it's not gonna work because it still tries to keep this position. So we're gonna have to fix this up right away. So we're gonna have a breakpoint. We're going to do flex call, but medium flex row. And then immediately if we reload, uh, at least it's kind of like one on top of each other, but the sizing is still way off. 
So we need to do we need to change these from width half to width full. So that's gonna be another breakpoint. Width full on the small screens, and then as soon as we get to medium, we're gonna to go to width half. So then if I reload, we'll get something like this. Now it's still a little bit off because you have to scroll all the way down to see the form, which is pretty weird. So for our options there, I mean we might want to have what's crazy is we might want to have absolute on small screens and then the form could go on top of the image. That doesn't look that crazy. Actually. That looks whoa, except for it doesn't fix when you go to larger screens. But that's an idea though. I don't think I wanna do that idea though. So maybe on small screens, let's just get rid of the image for now. So what I'll do is I'll have a hidden, and then medium flex. So this will get rid of that image on smaller screens, and let's also get rid of that huge bit of margin. So we're only going to have that on medium screens and higher. So then if we reload, we'll get this nice, kind of simple check-in page on mobile. Now another thing I want to add is a link back to the listing page. So maybe you want to like cancel and not book your trip right now we could have like a little link at the top just like we had in the rest of the places so I might want to take that same styling we have like for example on well the show page we have that back to all listings link right here we kind of have the signature style so I'm going to copy that and then add it to the top of the page it can just be right here in listed I'm going to reload and then we get something that looks like this. Okay, that's fine. Back to all listings. I might want to add another VR for some space. Reload. Oh, doesn't look like it's working. Let's just do margin top instead. There we go. Maybe margin top eight. Okay, back to all listings. Actually, but instead of going back to all listings, we want to go back to listing. And then go to, instead of listings paths, we can just pass in at listing. Reload. So then when we're down inside of our app, and then we go to well, one of them that we could book. And then we say like, oh wait, we're not ready to book it. We can just easily go back to the listings page we have this simple UI. So this is pretty cool. We've implemented booking, although there's no logic where like you can definitely, oh, you can double book right now. I'm going to book for one week, book my stay, and then boom, we get this message. Your stay was booked. Now I don't have anywhere that shows like my booking. So let's go ahead and add that now. Let's get back to the nav bar and we can take a look at what we're going to do. So up here, we got rid of the new listings link when you're not owner. Well, I'm going to quickly look at the other page. So if we reload with the owner profile, we see that new listing link right there. Oh, but we also see become an owner in the drop down. So that's not good if we're already an owner. We don't want to see that link anymore. So let's make sure that we go to that bar and then have some logic in here. So we'll say if current user dot stripe status equal pending so that means like they it's not complete because the default is pending then if we go back in here uh, check in the nav bar in the drop down there's only settings to sign out so that's fine and if we want to create a new listing the button's right there all right sounds good so right then the thing i was going to do is add the bookings page so right next to the new listings if current user stripe status equals complete, that's fine. Uh, let's do an else. So if they're not an owner, I guess, then we can have a link to bookings. And now we don't have that bookings path. So I'm gonna need to add it right away. But we can also check for if current user dot bookings dot any are we gonna do that in a one line or two it's like inside of the link too so we'll only show it if the user has bookings if I reload I don't have a booking 
Or wait, didn't I just create a booking? That's not right. Oh, I think I forgot to set the user on the booking. So that's okay. That's just a little error that we have to fix inside of the controller. So inside of the controllers on the listings folder in the bookings controller, right here in the create. So we're doing a listing.bookings create. So we do have the listing on the booking, but we don't have the user. So what I'm going to do actually, instead of creating right here, I'm going to initialize it with dot new. And I'm going to do a booking.user equals current user. And then a booking.save. And I can actually do a condition on this because booking.save. Well, actually, I did bookings, but if booking.save will return or booking.save will return true or false if it saves correctly. So if true, we're going to redirect and show that message. Else, we can actually just render new and that'll re render the form and show any errors if there is any. Or won't really show any errors because we don't have code for that, but it will re render the form. All right, I'm going to reload. So we still don't have any button there. So let me quickly go and book our listing. Book now. Let's do from Friday to uh, the other Friday. I reload and now I see bookings right here. Boom, we, we see bookings in the nav bar. And then this needs to go to a page. So we don't have a page for this. I'm going to want to create one. What I'm going to do is go into the config rs.rb. And I'm going to create a new route to view your bookings. So we don't have anything like that yet. We have a bookings controller, but it's nested inside of listings. We might want to do just an overall bookings controller by adding, you just go at the bottom, do resources bookings, only, Ooh, that's a good point. Do I want to do a resources or a resource? We could do a resource bookings. We could do a resources bookings and then use an index action, or we could do a resource bookings and use a show action. It's like two ways to do the same exact thing, which that's what I love about Ruby. I think I want to do a resource because the bookings is just like an overall overview of your bookings. Although it might, it's also, it's showing like your personal, I don't know, this is weird. Fine, let's do a resources bookings and then index action. And then inside the app controllers, I'm going to do a new file, bookings controller, RB. I'm going to do a class booking controller, then hair term application controller, and then index action. And just so you know, now we have two bookings controllers. We have our bookings controller just in the main level of our controllers. And then also we have a listings bookings controller, and you'll see that it's namespaced by a listings module. This might seem confusing, but it's just how Rails works. And it's because we defined it as, or because we called it bookings, we could have called it anything. And if you want me to kind of explain like how the routes are different, I can show you real quick. So with this resource bookings controller right here, it'll be like slash listings slash the house and then the bookings slash like whatever number booking it is basically. Well, we don't have a show action, so it would just be bookings new. That's what the URL route looks like for that bookings controller. But for this just main level one, it's gonna look like slash bookings. Like that's the path that we have, uh, which is now defined. And we have the bookings controller. The only thing left to do is add the view. So we have to go in the app views folder, create a new folder called bookings, just right in the top level. Inside of there, put an index.html to your B file. And I'm going to put an h1 to just say, like, your bookings. Just like that, you have a new page in your Rails app. And if I reload, uh, our link still doesn't go anywhere, but I can go in the URL to slash bookings, and we'll see your bookings. So that page is now defined. So what I can do is set up this bookings link so that it actually goes to the bookings. So let's go back to the nav bar and then in this link to bookings, we're going to change this to bookings patch, just like that. Reload. And now bookings goes to the bookings page. Cool. So now for styling the bookings page, I'm just going to do something simple. Go back to this index. And I'm going to make the text bigger, center it. And then there's a few ways we could do this. We could do cards. 
or we could do like row. Hmm. I think I want to do cards. So for cards, I'm just going to do like a div and give it a max width 5xo, mx auto. There's going to be like a little bit of space that we can work with. Now I'm going to add a grid. Grid calls three, gap eight. And I'm going to go over the current user dot bookings. Each do booking. And then inside of here, we can add the styling. There's like a simple card. Rounded large, height 64. Then we can do an image tag for the booking dot listing images first. Give it a fixed height. And of course, we want to check if the booking dot listing dot images dot any just to avoid any errors. All right, and then we get something that looks like this: your bookings, and then we see this sort of image. And underneath the image, we can put the name. So booking dot listing dot. We actually call it title. You reload entire cabin in this place, and then we can put check in. And then we can do booking dot check in date, and then I want to do the surf time again. So we might want to take the same. Derf time code we had inside of the listings bookings controller. Right down here. Or we might actually want to have like a method, but I'll just copy the code for now. So we're doing surf time and then we're just showing like that pretty simple code check in on this date. Now to organize this more, let's put these all into their own elements. Be like a span, I guess. Reload. Okay, they're still kind of jumbled, so I'm gonna do flex flex call gap one on the div. Reload, and now we get something that looks like this. Okay, and then I also want to make it so that the bookings text is on top. So to do that, I need to wrap all the elements in the div and do flex flex call with full on the div. And end this off. All right, perfect. So this looks pretty good. Your bookings, and then we see like this booking. Maybe I'll add some shadow on the card. Shadow large, and then like, we do have the rounded, but we can do overflow hidden. So it'll actually have that rounded effect on the image. All right, this looks pretty cool. And then maybe I'll do some padding for the text. But other than that, it looks pretty good. So for the padding on the text, I don't want the image tag to get padding, so I'm actually gonna wrap these spans in the div. And then I can add the styling on the div itself. Do like a PX2. Maybe Y, but there's already like a little bit of space. All right, and that looks good actually, entire cabin. Although now the check-in text is still kind of jumbled, so we also want to have flex flex call on this div. We can make sure that these stay on their own line. So check in. And you could say like on, and it's just like this date. All right, that's fine. So that shows our bookings. And we could definitely style that link up there a little bit better. I just don't know what type of styling we want to do. Bookings, so we could do class, text large, font semi bold. So at least it's kind of like more bold and like so if they like your bookings. Your bookings, I don't know. It kind of seems out of place bookings we could also just stick it inside of this profile drop down that's probably a better place to have it uh, we might want both too i don't know let's just put this link inside of the <laughs> drop down for now so right on top of become an owner 
and just put your bookings and we still have that condition that only shows this link if you actually have bookings defined. And then I'll take the styling from the other links, apply it so that they will look the same. And I'll reload. Now we get this your bookings section right here in the drop down. That's kind of easy enough to navigate your bookings. And then we'll see that there's an upcoming booking. This is pretty exciting. We've implemented bookings, although we have not implemented paying for the booking. So that's pretty important for this video, actually, in this whole series. So I'm going to need to add that in. All right, so now to accept payments for the booking, what that would probably look like is you would click book your stay, and then that would actually go to like step two of this form. We could even keep the image and text and everything, but then we could show the payment form with the credit card. And then they just have to fill that out and then boom just like that you charge their credit card for the amount of money like based on the per days you know you multiply that by the amount of days between the check-in and checkout and then you charge them for that with a straight form so to do that i'm gonna have to look into the docs again so we have collect and payout we also have payout money i think what we're going to do is collect and payout so this method and then there's a few options like no code. We actually do, like we don't mind adding code, but let's make sure to select the web version, which conveniently enough, it uses Ruby as a backend by default, but they also have like options for all these different popular backend libraries. Cool, so it's, this guide is gonna explain how to accept payments and move funds to the bank accounts of your service providers or sellers. So what that means is you can have a form where you accept a payment from a user, and then we can pay out to the owner, so the person who created and like person who put their house on the mark. We already took care of step one, which was creating a Stripe account for the owner, and we don't need the account link because we already did the onboarding process. We don't need any of that. There's also enable payment methods. We don't have to worry about that. Accept a payment. So this is the part that we're on. Number four, so you have a few options. Do you want to do a Stripe hosted page or an embedded form? We've already done the embedded form for the onboarding of the owners. Let's also do an embedded form for the checkout. So what that's going to look like is just simply we're going to create a checkout session where we're going to set the price of the item that the user will be purchasing. And then we also add this payment intent data where you can set the destination. So like who's going to get paid out. This is just simply the connected users account. So like all this is really simple and it's, it makes it easy for us to implement this in our app. Now, one thing to notice is the line items. There's a price, price ID. So price ID would, is supposed to be inside of our app already. So what we could do is we could create a price for the Airbnb stay, or we could work around this with the line items API. So I'm pretty sure with line items, there's a way to work around it. I've done it before. Session line items. So there's like optional parameters. I don't know if I can pull it up. I definitely did it in another video on this channel. That's back nice. here it's actually seven months ago that was the last time i was messing with stripe and, then, and i showed how to set up level. a stripe form and it is funny back then i had like this, this huge this section of the element doc where i kind of get all the comments now. in this element now but i actually show like the whole process with the publishable now inside of here which we'll have check to it. all right so what i do here is i set the unit amount instead of a price id that's another option so that's all we have to do. We don't have to worry about creating a price because the problem is what if the listing, what if they change the price per day, then we'd have to like update it with the Stripe API and it'd just be kind of messy. So I'd rather just do a unit amount and then we can do it on the fly. So what we have to do right here is create a checkout session, then pass that ID. So we get a client secret back from it. And then on the front end, we do a little bit of JavaScript to initialize that embedded form. We're gonna have a whole stimulus controller for this. 
and it'll be a pretty clean and simple process. All right, so simply all we need is a page to redirect the user after they create their booking. So they click book stay right now, they just get redirected to the main page and it says like your stay was booked. But I want to fix that and then actually bring them to a payment page. So we're gonna need a new uh, route for that and a new page. So to start, we can go into the config routes to RB, like usual. And I'm gonna see where we're gonna put this in. So we have this resources listings, and then we have the resource bookings. We could always do a method on this bookings controller, where it's like bookings payment. That's an option. So we could do like a resources do, and then get payment to bookings payment controller and then on member which means you're supposed to pass in the bookings ID so that might be kind of useful and I can go inside of the controllers on the listings bookings controller on a payment action right here and then we'd actually could set the booking equals booking dot find current ID and we might actually get it off the listing that's a safer bet so booking is the listing dot bookings find for the ID and what I could do is just reload uh, and then let's go and create a booking but real quickly I want to update all of these listings so that they have a price since I own all of them, I'm just going to quickly go and add a price to these so that any of them can be rentable. All right. I think we got them all. Perfect. So then I can go back to incognito where I was going to test out this form. So I'm going to book this house. It's kind of fun. Book my stay. Oh, right now, so we're still showing, we're still redirecting them to the main page, but I want to redirect them to the payment page. So right here in the booking save condition, I'm going to change it from root path to listing booking payment path. So that's kind of a lot, but I think that's what it would have generated. Oh, or I might have done payment first. So let's test this out. Reload. Actually, we can check in Rails routes. If we go in the console and we type Rails routes. Actually, I'm going to grab it. And we like search through it because that's kind of a lot of stuff. You can do it like this. You can grep for payment. That's the keyword I'm looking for. And then we'll get the path that we're supposed to use. So we're supposed to put payment first. So payment underscore listing underscore booking path. That's a lot, but it's just what I'm doing. I'm going to try this out. Okay. I'm going to have to restart the server. And I'm going to go in here. Oh, I forgot to set a price on this one. Thought I got them all. Just the Barbie house. Cause I don't even know why I put the Barbie house. It's just It was actually on Airbnb. That's where I got all these images okay let's go reload i'm gonna try to get the barbie house i'm gonna select the date click book your stay and what happens is we'll actually don't see anything it looks like we did a get request for payment but oh there wasn't anything there there wasn't a view to render because i didn't create that page yet so to do that, I have to go into the views folder, listings, bookings, and then create a payment.html.erb file. And then inside of here, you just do like a simple h1 at the top that says complete your payment for this booking. Now that's not the text I'm gonna have uh, forever. I just wanna see how this works real quick. So I'm gonna put my date. Book my stay. All right, and then we do see the text, so that's good. 
What I actually want to do is go back to the new form. I'm going to copy all this because I want to keep the same styling. And then I'll just delete the form part because that's where I'll put the Stripe embedded form. And then if I reload, we'll see something like this. Oh, this looks pretty good. Back to listing. It says like book your stay. Well, we've already booked at this point, so we can change that text to like complete or like you you're so close to being at and then we put the title. <laughs> it's kind of like telling them, hey, that that's kind of nice. Like you're so close to staying at Barbie's Malibu Dream. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, and then inside this div is where we load the payment form. So I'm gonna do some stimulus. I'm gonna add a data controller. And then we can just do Stripe payment. And this is going to post to another route that we're gonna have to create. So that might've been a good reason to use a separate controller. But regardless, we can have a post route. I'm just gonna go to uh, like Stripe. Session. Let's go to bookings session on member. There's going to be another method inside of this controller. Usually I don't do stuff like this, but it just feels kind of easier right now for the video. Just do a method. And then the Stripe session method would have that Stripe code. Now, this is the reason why it's kind of worse because we add more code. I have to take this whole section of code right here and drop it in. Not too bad, actually. And then we'd render like client secret is we have to set this to a variable. Check out session client secret. I think that's how you do it. And then inside of this checkout session, we're going to change price to unit amount and this would be the booking dot price per day times the booking dot amount of days now to get the amount of days we don't have that yet so we're going to define that method on the booking model let's go over to models booking we're going to put our first method inside of this model it's going to be called amount of days and then we're gonna need to take like the check-in date and the checkout date and find the amount of days different between them. So I think that might be as simple as just saying, well, it is kind of confusing. Let me look it up because that's the easiest way to do this logic. Find out amount of days between check-in or between, not check-in and check-out, between two dates in Ruby. Difference in days equals date two minus date one, really? Or when I thought that would return like a some sort of weird integer. Well, we can test in the console. Let's do rail C. Oh, let's make sure that we're inside of the app. Let me in. Ah, now let me type in rail C. Go in rail console, and then I can do booking dot last. Let's say B equals booking dot last. Then we can get b dot check in date with minus let's do b dot check out date minus b dot check in date and yeah like i said we get this whole huge number so that's kind of weird let's check out the other answers it says subtract but then it just gives us like this whole object it gives this whole like huge number Oh, it says call to date on them first. Like their date time. Maybe that's why. So it's called dot to date. So we only want the day. Oh, that's weird. What the heck? Why is it? The, what does that mean? And then it says call dot to i on it after to turn it into there. Seven days. Okay. Hey, I think that sounds right. So let's take this code and just basically plop it into the model except for we can remove b because now that's already like the model that we're on we subtract these two things and then we turn it to an integer 
That sounds good to me. That's the logic we're using to generate the price that we're going to then have the user pay. And then the application fee amount. We probably want to take the unit amount and then take a certain amount of it. So we can just set unit amount as a variable. Unit amount equals this price of so the price per day times the amount of days. And then the application fee amount would be the unit amount times a certain percentage. So maybe like 0 0.15. So maybe taking 15%. Let's check out the Airbnb percentage. How much percentage does Airbnb keep? 5% and 15%. That's actually not that bad. Fourteen percent of the total booking. Alright, let's say because our app is like super helpful and new and like luxurious or whatever it's going to charge 30 percent and then the transfer data destination that's going to be the owner's stripe account so to get that we're going to take the booking or no not the booking we're going to take the at listing dot user stripe account id what simple is that and then they're going to get the rest of the money we're going to take their application fee amount and then they'll get whatever's left over and we're also going to need a return URL so this is going to be the page that they're going to return to after they're done paying so we have like a success page I guess we don't have one of those yet so we can define it in the routes why don't we just do like a get success to gain success on the member and then the booking controller we'll just do a def success we can set that booking but why don't we just we might as well put this into a before action and then define it at the bottom so we can do before action set booking but only on payment and success and down here at the bottom can have that set booking method. So now we're going to have booking available. And inside of the success page, we're going to also have to go and create that. So inside of the views, listings, bookings, right next to the payment file, we're going to create a success.html.erb. And I guess we can have different styling now. Why don't we just do like max with 2xl auto that are large and we can do a pretty big text that says like the booking has been confirmed and then maybe we'll have some confetti or something like we can do we can go to giphy and then find like some cool confetti gif Or like celebrate gif I don't really know we don't know what what gift the user is gonna want to see right so we, were, we probably want to keep get something that's like kind of simple and most people would be okay with seeing they really know which one that is sometimes the gif isn't the best <laughs> Booking, wait, why not the booking gif? This looks like ads now. Alright, I think confetti might be cool. We can just take one of these confetti gifs, do it embed, and then just copy that code. Drop it in. We can't actually see it yet because we have to go and test this out. So let me reload. We're gonna be getting an error with the syntax in the bookings controller, I guess with my code in here i'm trying to render this json and it's saying it's having a problem maybe render oh i forgot to render i forgot to say json and then put the object okay that should fix that there we go 
but on this page so this is the payment page and nothing's happening right now because we haven't even like done anything yet on that payment page so let's go back to the payment page I set the data controller but we still have to create that stimulus controller and I'm actually gonna set the data right payment URL value there's gonna be a way that I can pass in the URL to our JavaScript and I'm gonna put that path so the that'll be success listing booking path and I'll put listing this URL is insane but this is what I'm gonna do for now it's fine it's not too bad actually it's pretty easy to remember now we have to create the stimulus controller so to do that I can actually do it from the terminal Doing a RLG stimulus, strike that payment. That'll create our stimulus controller. And then over here in the code in JavaScript controllers, stripe payment controller. Now inside of here, I'm gonna import post from rel slash request.js. This is the library that I installed in a previous video. But if you don't have request.js, it's as easy as just doing a dot slash bin import map pin and the name of the library. So any library that I'm using in the videos, I, I downloaded it by doing this command, bin import map, and this will set up the library for you and you're already gonna be good to go. So with this post, we're gonna do a post inside of this connect. I'm gonna turn it to async method so that we can get a response by waiting posting to this URL value. We get to define the values up at the top. So we're gonna have a URL, which is type string. Now we can post to the URL value. Uh, that's basically all we have to do. And then we get the const JSON. We also have to wait that, or okay, not const JSON. We have to define JSON by awaiting response.json. This doesn't look right. Oh, I need the equal sign. This JavaScript code is kind of weird. So I don't usually do that space aligning. Right, and then now that we have JSON, we can get the client underscore secret and initialize that payment form. <laughs> so you have to go back to this code in here and then I'll take this example, just pretty simple. A few lines of code. Let's check out equals await stripe with the secret. So we have to knit it with the secret. That's right here. Find a secret. And then once we get that checkout, we're going to mount it on an element, which we can just pass this element. All right, cool. Wait, this doesn't look right because there's brackets. I think I messed up something. Oh, fetch client secret is a is returning that's like a callback and then the brackets I guess are to I don't even know okay init embedded I'm gonna look at the doc for that initialize embedded checkout Fetch client secret. Does it have to be a const? It says it's deprecated. So you're supposed to add a callback function that resolves with the client secret. That's crazy. I guess that's the only way, huh? So we have to do init like get client secret. And then that's gonna be equals what an async function that returns JSON client secret. Is that really what they want? <laughs> that looks crazy. Okay, let's reload. Let's go in console. It says stripe is not defined. Okay, that's probably fine. Maybe I have to define it. Oh, up at the top, we get Stripe by initializing it with the public key. So 
I think we did that on Stripe onboarding. Yeah, we did it right here. So, it's weird actually. We get the publishable key, but I don't see where we use it. Load, connect, and initialize. Okay, so that does it all at once. Let's grab that public key and put it in here. And then we're just gonna take that code from the example here and then oh it's my public key we're gonna put it like that publishable key then we're gonna get stripe and then we can do the rest of our code. now let me reload it says oh capital stripe is not defined stripe oh we don't even have stripe let's go back to that's interesting actually so I guess we added Stripe Connect, but we never added the Stripe library itself. So I need to install Stripe. Uh, let's see, I don't even see where we do that. Checkout is available as part of Stripe.js. Include the Stripe.js script on your page by adding it to the head of your HTML file. Oh, so they show it right here. Just add it into the head, that's it. So let's go to the views layouts application and then up here in the head we can just add this script for stripe and then that should fix those errors let me reload and we still get an invalid init embedded checkout parameter so the function i guess is not an accepted parameter apparently so i did this wrong it doesn't want a function let's go back and look at the code Although it is an async function right here. No, that's initialize. Const fetch client secret. Oh, that does look just like my code though. Const client secret. Oh, but they put it in brackets. Maybe I have to do that. That seems kind of the same. Just go like this. Wait, how did it look again? Client secret. Oh, like that. Equals. And then the await. And then return client secret. Oh, I'm never returning anything. Forgot about that. In JavaScript, you have to return a value if you want it to be used. Uh, yeah, and then client secret. That's not going to be right because... In our controller, we're doing the underscore, so I'm gonna have to change that. And just do like client, and then do, it's called camel case. That's what they do in JavaScript, I guess. So I'm gonna do that, it's fine. Now let me reload, see. We still get an invalid parameter. Get client secret is not a parameter. Maybe it has to use that specific name then. I can't do any anything I want. So it has to have fetch client secret. That's funny. So we have to rename our function from get client secret to fetch client secret. As silly as that is. Okay, let's reload. Look, Stripe's actually pulling up. Although we get an error. Fetch client secret failed with an error. Expected a JSON response, but got text plain instead. Ooh. Okay, so I'm gonna do in the body. So this is on the post request. I'm just adding a parameter by adding the brackets. And then inside the body parameter, I'm going to set the response kind to JSON so that we can force it to return JSON. So it expected a JSON response, but got text plain instead. Oh. So our server is returning JSON. So let me just get rid of the parameters. I think it's something else. So inside the logs, it looks like we're getting for payment. No template found for payment. Rendering head, no content. Wait, that doesn't sound right because I'm trying to look for the. I think I see what's going on. I think I used the wrong. We're supposed to be using the Stripe session 
URL. But back here in the payment, I actually put the success path. Oh, we don't need to do that. Oh, I think I see what went on. Yeah, I meant to put this. So that's like a little mix up on my bad. On my fault, I guess. I don't know. So I need to take the success path. Go and put that in the bookings controller as a return URL. And then we still are passing in listing booking, so that looks good. On the payment page, I can't believe that I was putting the success URL. But that's what happens when you're coding for like hours on hours like this, guys. You start having typos, so just sometimes it is best to take a break and just kind of like slow down. But I don't need that because now I figured out the issue. So actually we need to have the Stripe session listing booking path. Pass it in the listing and the booking. Boom, because we were totally weren't returning anything. Let's reload. We still get the same error though, but if we look in the console, we should be requesting a different place now, maybe. Oh, reload. It says undefined method price per day for nil. Oh, interesting. So, bookings. Oh, look. Well, the ID is five, but it looks like it wasn't able to find the booking. That must be what happened. So we had the listing ID. We have the booking ID, which is just ID. Hmm. Let's go back to the bookings controller. Payment success. Oh, we also need to, it's because of this before action, that booking, we're only doing it for payment success. We also need to do it for stretch that thing. Yet another reason to do a separate controller because we don't need to whitelist all those specific routes. All right, but we are getting error 500 from the server. What happened? Undefined method price per day for an instance of booking, right? Because it's price per day would be off the listing, not the booking. Let's go back into the controller. And instead of using booking, it needs to be at listing dot price per day. And then you multiply that by the booking amount of days, and we're good to go. Whew. All right, let's reload. Now we still get an error. Undefined method price per day for an instance of listing. Oh, I don't think price per day is actually the method or like the the name that I called it. It's wasn't it like day price then monthly price then yearly price. I think it's just called day price. Let's reload. Still get an error. Yikes. Invalid integer 420. <laughs> Wait, that's crazy. It's 420. But I guess with Stripe, they're expecting an integer. So we can't have any sort of change, I guess, on the number. Any sort of decimals or cents. And I think also with Stripe, you're supposed to just multiply by 100. So on the day price, since we're using decimals, we have to multiply by 100 and then just call 2F to float, no, 2I to integer. All right, let's reload. See what we get in the console. Invalid integer. Whoa, now it's 420. Hundred, but that should be right. That should equate to four hundred twenty dollars. But there's still some space right there. So I guess maybe on the unit amount, we'll just call dot two i on it before we pass it in. We can ensure that it's the correct amount. Let's reload. We still get an error. Invalid integer. No, it's not, why is it not working? saying in number 24, so right here, when we're creating the checkout session, there's a few places to look. So we're also putting in the application fee amount with the unit amount. So that could have like somehow used, it's not, it's not supposed to be integers. So let's see, unit amount times 30. Make sure that we call to integer on that. And then up here, I'm going to wrap this calculation and then call it to integer on it just to be extra sure. Now let's reload. Oh, we get syntax error, I guess. Probably with down here. This is not correct. 
Oh. Something I did, they weren't liking. So I called to integer. To integer. Reload. Received unknown parameter. Unit amount. Oh, it doesn't know what unit amount is? Uh oh. I thought that was the one that we used in the in my video. I wonder if that video is not accurate anymore. Let's go back to it. It's like one of my older videos. What get from really yeah, look, I am I'm doing line items. Array brackets, quantity one, unit amount, price. Just like how we have here, unit amount. It's trying to say it's that's no longer a thing. Come on, guys. Price. I'm passing in price. What is price then? Actually don't know. It's the product. And items API is really product data and then we put the unit amount this is a stripe checkout session that's what we're doing here oh. maybe we should try to add the product data but this might just be outdated by now so the name is going to be the listing dot title and then we should still have unit amount Quantity. Oh, I think I see something different. Line items, it's actually in a thing called price data. So, what that means is you have the quantity outside. But the rest of this, whoa. I guess that was fine. So, we have to put another key called. Now I lost it. Price data. Oops. Okay, I can't tell if we're using strings or not. Okay, we're not. We're just doing underscore. Price data. And then leave quantity outside. All right. And then inside of price data, we have product data. We have currency. Oh, I'm, I just said that too. USD. Just for now, we're going to set it to, you know, American US dollars. But if you were building this in another country, just do whatever your dollar is. Ooh, we get an error right away. Doesn't like, oh, I forgot uh, to put a comma between that and the quantity. Reload. What do we get? We still get an error. Let's go to the console. It says invalid URL. Oh, because I was passing a path instead of URL. We can fix that. It was just for the return URL. Instead of doing path, which is going to do a local path, so it's not going to have the, like, the host, we're going to have to do URL. I'm going to reload. Oh, we're not getting error, but oh, now we do. Although in the console, I don't see anything wrong. It says it completed 200, OK. But now it's in the front end. It's saying. Fetch client secret failed with an error. Should always resolve with the client secret as a string. The function that was provided was with the value type of object. Oh, okay. So that's not good. So inside of my fetch client secret, I guess they didn't like this. The client secret that I returned was an object. So maybe that's because of the bookings controller, right? We're supposed to be returning client secret, but I don't know if that's actually the code that we're supposed to return. So let's look at my video. Oh, look at this. Rendering JSON client secret is camel cased, but the session dot client underscore secret. So it's not using the camel case on the stripe side. So wait, I forgot already. Need a drink. Just like talking so much. Purchase me out. So, well,
client underscore secret. Just like that. Perfect. Now let's reload. Yo, it actually worked. We got the payment form. $1,400 payment for Malibu Dreamhouse. Now we might even want to re like remove the padding on this page so that it, because you know, so, since there's such a big form. But let's go back in here. So on the payment page, let's just return, let's remove that padding completely. Reload. Oh, well now it's a little bit too high. So let's just reduce it from 40 to like 20. Reload. All right. Maybe even 32. Reload. I don't know. No, I definitely want it to be higher up. Like 16. There we go. We get the payment form, and it's like, you're so close to staying here. Just pay $1,400, which that's right, right? 200 times seven nights is going to be 1400 Cool. So then you'd fill in their information, and there actually is a test card that we can use too. So I'm just going to put some information, and then the test card for Stripe is just going to be 4242 four, two, all the way. And then just put any date for expiration that's like further than today. It can't be a date in the past, and any CVC. Then on the card. I'm just gonna put a random person, random number in the country region. And then I'm gonna not click this because I don't want to put a phone number. Now I can just simply pay. And then boom, it redirects us to the confirmation page, which now looks kind of <laughs> looks pretty bad with this. Let's get rid of that GIF on the success page. But just as easy as that, I've paid. Let's reload, your booking has been confirmed. You know what? Instead of the GIF thing, let's just put the actual house that we're gonna be going to. New image tag. We can got images off first. Let's give it a height of 500 pixels. Maybe a little bit smaller, 400. I don't know about the width though. Let's reload. Undefined method images for booking right. I meant listing dot images first. Your booking has been confirmed. It looks nice. And then since we're doing the card with the shadow thing, let's do flex, flex call, item center, put some padding. So we can just center things and make it look a little bit better. Your booking has been confirmed. We can put a BR between the image and the title. Another BR. And check in on dot booking dot check in date. And let's do our same surf time. Surf time. You can find an example of that on the bookings index. There we go, we have the surf time. Just like that. Reload. Alright, next we have your booking has been confirmed. Check in on this date, I guess. And then we we might want to add another field on the listing that says like the check-in date or the check-in time. Because right now we're just doing a date, but they might want to know like what time to actually check in. To do that, we just, since we're already using date time, we could actually put it all in one or we could have another field. There's a lot to think of, and I've already been coding for quite a while. So I'm probably going to take a break for now, but this video has been really exciting. And I can't believe we got to this point where we actually have the bookings. You're able to pay for a new booking. Now there's still some things I want to handle, like making sure that the booking is like look because you can book a booking right now you can create it and everything but there's no there's no way to tell if you paid for it or not like all these bookings are created but there's no way to tell like one of them has actually been paid for and to do that correctly you need to make use of the stripe webhooks so right now i think we were using webhooks in our app right? We have Stripe webhooks events. So we do have the whole setup for webhooks, but now we just need to listen for the correct webhook or like the payment success or like whatever that event's going to be. And then we would have to add some code 
to handle setting the booking to be like completed and paid for. And then from there is when you'd like send out all the emails and you let everybody know. And yeah, we'd also be like, it would be paying out the owner pretty directly right now. So if you wanted to hold on to the money until the end of the booking, just in case there's any issues or anything, we probably want to look at some other options instead of doing like the checkout with the destination. So actually what you can do is you can get rid of this transfer data destination and just transfer all the money to the application or you can put it to like a personal account and then later on you can pay out the user like the amount that they get from this particular booking. So in this video I'm going to continue on the Airbnb series and I'm actually going to build the Android app. It's going to be really exciting and let's get right into this. So the first thing I'm going to do is just open up our Airbnb Rails app and I'm going to start that server up. I'm going into my Ubuntu console and I don't know if I'm using Redis, I can't remember. I don't think we really are using Redis, but I'm going to make sure that that server is running and then let's go into the app and I'll start the server using bin slash dev. So now that the server started, I can view the app on localhost port 3000. So just like this, everything looks good. So I'm going to try to sign into my account indigotech at gmail and there we go we're signed into the account so these are actually all my listings so I can edit them and everything and it's looking good I can create new listings yeah everything is set up and cool so from here I'm gonna start creating the Android app so to do that I'm gonna go over to Android Studio so I'm just gonna open up Android Studio and then I'm gonna create a new project by going to file and then new new project and then what I'll do is I'll do it with no activity just because we don't really need any of these like you can have these uh, templates to get you started but I think it'd be better with no activity and then we can just create the activity that we're going to use so now we have to set the name of our app I'm just going to call this Airbnb and then you can change the package name. I'm just going to leave that how it is and save location for the language. Make sure that you're using Kotlin and the minimum SDK should be at least 26. And it says your app will run on approximately 95% of devices by using the minimum of 26. So that sounds pretty good to me. The other thing you can do is make sure that the build configuration language is Kotlin DSL which is the newer setup compared to the Groovy DSL. So we're going to use Kotlin DSL. And after we've configured that, we can just press finish, which will create our app. So I think it's actually creating it in a new window. Yeah, let me exit out of this one and pull open that other app. Right. I want to terminate that. All right, cool. So looks like our app is generating right now can't really tell okay down at the bottom right corner there is some information like it's installing some files but cool so from here I'm just gonna go right into installing the turbo Android framework onto our Android app so to do that I'm just gonna go to the turbo Android github and I'm gonna find the installation docs so I have it pulled up right here. It's on the hotwired turbo Android GitHub. And then we'll see what we have to do. So basically you just add a dependency to your apps module file. So we're going to add this implementation. So for the module, it's inside of the Gradle scripts folder. And then right here, the build Gradle KTS, you'll see that there's two. But we're going to select one for the module and the module one has way more stuff inside of two. So like if you look at the project one, there's nothing there, but the module has all this, these different uh, things. So we're just going to add right down at the bottom to the dependencies. We're going to add this implementation and it's going to be the dev hotwire turbo. Then we have to put the latest version, which right now it's 7.1.3, which I'm trying to type. There we go. And you can see the latest version right here on the GitHub. 
it's showing up right here on Maven Central. And if you also just look up the like this name dev.hotwire turbo, you'll be able to find it too. As we can see, the latest version is 7.1.3. That looks good. And then there's also the required min SDK. We already handled that when we were setting up the app. We don't need to mess with that. And then also internet permission. So for the web view to access the internet and load the web pages from the URL, you have to have this permission for the internet. So to add that, we have to add it into the app folder in the manifest on the Android manifest. So this is like your main configuration file for your app kind of. So I'm just going to add it right at the top. Use this permissions for the internet permission. Cool. And also because we added that new dependency hotwire to the Gradle file, we have to sync our Gradle, which basically means it'll install the new dependencies. So make sure that you click the button. If you don't see that blue pop up, it's also the elephant button up here. It's the elephant with the arrow. That means sync the Gradle files. Okay, so I ran it and now, oh, I was getting this yesterday. This is so annoying. So this could not read workspace metadata. All right, it's coming from this Gradle caches. I'm just gonna try to delete that because that's really annoying me. So I'm gonna try to go and find that in like my file explorer. Yeah, let's just go to this file. Gradle caches. I just want to delete that whole caches file. Like, there's really nothing that could be that important inside of here, in my opinion. So I'm going to delete caches. Screw it. Look at how much stuff there is in there. And then probably actually I'll, let's exit out of Android Studio. But I was literally trying to make this video yesterday and I was getting that error. And I was getting like another error in the, with my app. I don't know why. Why does it do that? must just be an Android Studio thing, but look at how many items there are. 200,000 items from Gradle. That's insane. That's a lot of freaking items. I'm just gonna let it run. And hopefully this doesn't like, if it does ruin anything, everything, we could just reinstall Android Studio. That's like another option. Okay, it looks like it finished. We threw away all the cache data. Now let's open up Android Studio and see what happens. Okay, it looks fine. Now we're gonna try to sync our Gradle file. So I'm running the builds. And I'm just gonna hope that there's no error. Okay, cool, so that took like only a few minutes. Actually, it wasn't that bad. It was a lot faster than Xcode for building the iOS app, so I'll tell you that much. But anyways, I think that it finished installing, so we should be good to move on. I'm going to go from the installation guide over to the quick start guide. So right here on the quick start guide, we're going to get into this. We have to create this host fragment class. We're going to call it main session nav host fragment. This is a lot. I'm just going to copy that class name and I'm going to go and create the new class. So where we're going to put this is inside of the app folder, Kotlin Java, and then the name of your app, like the whole identifier. I you notice there's a few different ones, but the other ones are just for test. The main one is right here. There's not any like parentheses or like sub name on it. And then we're going to create the new class. So to do that, we can right click on this folder and then go to new Kotlin class file. So I'm going to put the name as this main session nav host fragment, I guess. Now, I don't think you have to name it like that. You can name it whatever you want, but for some reason they just call it like a, whatever, a nav host fragment. <laughs> so we're gonna have this uh, host fragment. This is gonna be like the entry point kind of for our app. That's what it seems like, because we set the start location. We also set the registered activities. So if you have more than one activity in your app, and then real quickly, let's just import all these classes. So if if there's a class that's red, it means you have to import it. So to do that, I just press Alt Enter. And like I usually have to press Enter twice to just cl click on the top thing. 
Web fragment is actually a class that we're going to have to create. So we're going to do that in a second. And then for the start location, we're going to not use this is going to the turbo native demo. So I'm going to switch this to use our local app. So to do that, you have to have this Elias IP. So in Android Studio, you can't just use like localhost 3000 like this. Because if you do that, then it's going to think that you're referring to like the local host on the phone, you know, because you're going to run this app inside of the simulator device. So you have to use this Elias IP, which is this 10.0.2.2. This will port over to localhost. And then we still have to use the port 3000 for our Rails app. All right. The other thing we can have to do is delete the remote file URL. So this remote file URL uh, doesn't exist anymore. I guess they like remove this path from the demo app. So this will cause an error if you leave this. So we're actually going to delete that. And we have to use the local configuration file, but we're going to have to actually create that inside of an assets JSON folder. So to do that, I'm just going to right click on app, click new, and then folder. So this little like Android Studio folder inside of there, there's the option for assets folder. So I'm just going to do that, leave everything default, press finish. And then what it does is it adds this assets folder inside of here. Then I can go and right click on the assets folder, press new, this directory. And I'm going to call it JSON. So that's just like a simple, just simple for folder. And I'm going to click new file. And I'm going to create a configuration.json file. And this is where we're going to put that path configuration which we don't have, but I'm going to open up this docs right here and get the little example for the path configuration. Whoops, it's right here. So this is like the most simple configuration that you can have. And the configuration is how your app will like know how to present each page that it loads. So it's possible to like present certain pages inside of a modal. And I want to get to that because I haven't done that in any episodes yet. And I would love to do some things in the configuration file just to explain it a little bit more. But now that we've set that up, we have the asset file set. We have that configuration file, which will load correctly. So we can move on. Oh, another thing real quick is we need to set Android use clear text traffic in the Android manifest. If we don't do that, then using the local host actually fails because we're not using HTTPS and in Android with like the, all the frames and stuff that they're using by default, it'll cause an error. If you try to go to like an HTTP site without HTTPS. So we have to allow that by setting it inside of the Android manifest file. And we just do it right here on the application, I think. Use clear text traffic, true. Just like that. All right, so that looks good. We have this host fragment created. Now we have to create an activity. So create the turbo activity layout resource. So we need a resource file inside of a layout folder inside of res. So I'm going to copy this code and then I'm going to create that. So to create the layout, we're going to go over to res, which is right here in this main folder level res. We don't have a layout folder yet, but I'm going to quickly create it by right clicking, pressing new. And we're just going to do a directory. I'm going to call it layout. And then inside of there, I'm going to do a layout resource file. And then oh, I always forget what they want me to call it. Activity main, I think. So I created activity main. And then now you kind of see like this view with this is like what the app would look like. Uh, so it's a preview kind of section and you can drag and drop all the different items. So this is kind of helpful if you're building Android screens that are fully native, but we're not really doing that right now. So to switch over to the code mode, go in the right corner and you'll see these three icons. So one is like full preview mode then they're side by side. And we start to see the XML code right here on the left and you can also go with the four lines, which just means full code mode. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace all of this code inside of here with the example code. The only thing we have to change is the Android name. See, it's trying to go over to 
its main session netflix fragment which we don't have anymore so i actually need to set that to our local one which oh there we go it kind of gave me a pop-up that's perfect dev airbnb on rails airbnb all right So that's fine. Then the next thing we have to do is create the turbo activity. So they just call it main activity. That's going to be another class inside of our main class folder. We do new common class file and then just call it main activity. And I'll drop in this main activity class and then I'm going to go through and import each of these things. Each of these classes I'm going to import. And then, okay, that looks good. We can move on to creating the web fragment. It says refers to the activity layout file, refers to the main session FOS fragment hosted in your layout file. Refer to the demo as an example. Don't forget to add your activity to your app's Android manifest XML file. Right. I don't know if I, since I did the no activity, uh, what that means is inside of Android manifest, there's no activity inside of application. And I think we need one of those. So what I can do is go over to the demo. See, we're already inside the demo. Uh, I just need to figure out, I don't even know where to find all the, like the, <laughs> the Android manifest file. I don't see it. Turbo demo. Oh, right up here. Source main Android manifest. Here we go. So look, they're using this activity, which we're going to have to change up a bit. But I'm going to put this inside of I have to actually delete the ending slash and then bring it down to a new line. There we go. And inside of there, we put the activity, but I have to change this name to our activity name. Oops. There we go. And then for the theme, we're going to use not the day and night. We have to use our local theme, which I don't even know if we have one. Oh, look, we do. So in res values, themes, we do have a theme. So I'm just going to use this name, theme.airbnb, just like that. Style slash theme.airbnb, the same one you're using on application. So I guess that's perfect. That looks good to me. And then remember, we still have to create that web fragment. That's the last class that we have to create. So if we go back to the quick start guide, it just looks like this. It's like two lines of code because we're not really getting fancy with it right now. So let's go back to the same folder that we've been putting our classes. I'm going to create a new call in class and I'm going to call it web fragment. And inside of web fragment, I'll just replace it with these two lines of code and then also import these classes. Just these two classes. All right. And that looks good. I think that actually might be it. So once you've created all those different classes, uh, we have our simple Android app. Perfect. So now I'm excited to test it out see if it works. So to do that, just press the play button. And we already have our Pixel phone. But we're good to go. We're going to test out Airbnb Android. See how it works. I'm really excited about this. Ooh, let me try to... Maybe I should move my head over to the other side. Woohoo! If you look at the bottom corner, the Gradle build is running, so I'm just gonna have to wait for that to load. Who knows how long that'll take since I cleared the caches. By the way, if you're having errors, uh, try to do what I did, because that kind of helped. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. It loaded up. The Android app. We actually see Airbnb. It looks good. 
we have our Airbnb app. So the only thing, I, I kind of talked about this in another video, but you see how we have two top bars, two, two nav bars? That's kind of weird. So to fix it, like really simply, it's because of the theme. So inside of your res folder, values theme, uh, because the theme that we're using for our app is the dark action bar, that's what this is at the top. It has the same, this is the action bar. All you have to do is change it to no action bar and then it won't use that top bar. See if we do no action bar, boom, problem solved. Now we still have the built-in top bar. That's why we see like, we'll still see a top bar. See the Airbnb Rails logo. And then it even has like a back button, which this is part of turbo, like because of the turbo request, it kind of adds in this back button, which might be helpful, it might not be. We can actually override that top bar too, which, cause look, we already have a nav bar, which kind of looks decent. So depending if you want like a fully native uh, top bar or not, which honestly in this video, I don't want it fully native. I don't want like this built in turbo top bar. And I haven't talked about how you can get rid of that, but that's kind of a big part of building like turbo native apps is just getting around some of these things that are built into the framework. So one thing is that top bar that adds like the back button, it adds the title, all that stuff. If we want to get rid of it, I'm actually like, that was kind of a pain to get through personally. And I do have an example on GitHub, but that was a pain when I was trying to figure out how to do that by myself. I think that took me like kind of some time and there wasn't really much documentation. I should probably make a full video on this, but Inside of WaveCloud's Android, I do have the example of what I did. So let's go into the app code and take a look. So we have web fragment. Let's look at our web fragment. All right, I think this is what's happening. So you remember in our app, the web fragment just looks like two lines, but actually what I had to do is I had to put more stuff inside of the code. Should observe title changes, I set that to false. Let's go and try add that first and see what that does. So inside of our web fragment class, you'll notice right now it's just like a basic class. For some reason I have open keyword. I don't know if that's important. Let's try it without the open keyword. I'll just add the brackets and then add in this override should observe title changes. Now let's restart and see if there's any difference. Oh, so we still get the top bar, but now there's no title up there, but there's still like the back button. That's kind of funny. So I just want to get rid of, I remember like when I was first coding my, my wave clouds app, that was my first Android app I created. I remember this part. It was like so annoying that there was this top bar and I just wanted to get rid of it. So what I had to do is I had to override this on create view and then put in my own web fragment layout. That's what you have to do add this code override on create we're also gonna have to import this few classes there we go and then for the layout see we don't have a web fragment layout but I'm gonna quickly add that so over in res layout let's do a new layout resource file and I'm gonna call it web fragment and again we're gonna go to the code version with the four dots to view the code and then I have to grab the code for that web fragment I'm just going to take it right from the wave clouds example. So go to res layout web fragment. And I'm just going to take this example code and drop it in. And if we take a look at what it really is, it's just this simple constraint thing. So you always have the constraint as like a wrapper. And then we have an include layout turbo view. So it's literally just doing like the turbo view. And I think the important thing is the layout height, 0 dp. I think that's just like making it not exist. I don't know. Anyways, I feel like this should work. Let's go back to Web Fragment. Everything looks good, although we're still getting error. Oh, because there was a few other classes. I didn't see, and we're going to have to import those. Whoa. Whoops. There we go. Import. All right, now let's try this again. I'm going to restart the server. 
A, and there's no top nav bar. So there we go. We're able to fix that issue pretty easily. I'm just trying to have this phone a little bit bigger. Cool. So we have Android. We have an Android app right now. Airbnb on Android. We don't have the annoying top nav bar anymore. Everything kind of looks normal. So yeah, I want to see. I wanted to check out if everything works. So first of all, does Stripe work on an Android app? I have no idea. So let's try to book. Boom. So we can book our appointment. Oh, this is cool. It actually has the native select too. Although the styling on the check-in date looks kind of weird. It's like they forgot the border on the right side or something. Oh, I think I, I think it's because of the the three fourths width. Then we do something like that. So let's go back in the code. I'm gonna open up Visual Studio. I have to open up this app, Airbnb. Whoops. And let's go over to the views, bookings. Wait, not bookings index. It's gonna be listings, bookings. So the listings folder, then the bookings folder, the new page. Inside of here, I think we had some sort of width three fourths. Yeah, right here. I'm gonna put that only for medium. Now let's come back in here, do a nice refresh. So it looks like, well, uh, <laughs> the card got a little bit wider, I think, but the inputs are still looking pretty weird. So, oh, on the fields themselves, let's add a width full class. Class with full reload. Okay, that's that looks fine, but why did why are we missing the border on the right side? That's so weird. We might just want to go fully custom styling. Rounded large border zero. Or no, border none. I actually forget how to do that. And then let's do BG gray. 100 so we use some we use the background to stick it away from the page there we go that looks kind of cool that looks good enough so we're not using a border anymore we're actually just using like the color then we're going to select our date so let's say like friday june 7th to the 14th and now i click book your stay which wait why is that not doing anything <laughs> what the heck So already we're kind of getting some sort of issue where I'm, I'm pressing book. It's making the request. It's completed 200. Okay. Uh, but what else is supposed to happen? So I don't even know. Let's go into bookings controller, right? Let's look at the create and see what happens. It says if booking save, redirect to payment listing oh we don't even have a user <laughs> wait we literally don't have a user here so we should lock down this controller probably this whole bookings controller let's try let's make sure that you have to sign in first so let's just do that right at the top before action authenticate user I think like that now let's reload and boom, right away we get this message, you need to sign in. All right, so I'm actually gonna create a new account. Oh, I hate how it scrolls the form out of view. Android, wait, why am I actually typing with the Android keyboard? I'm gonna call myself Android guy. There we go. I'm gonna click sign up. Boom, just like that. And now we go back to the booking page and I can actually book my reservation now. There we go. One week reservation. I'm booking it. Boom. No, it did. It worked with Stripe. Look, popped up the form right there. A thousand dollars. Hey, that's not bad. The Android guy. Four two, four two. 1224. Doing random information. So I don't have the webhooks 
listening right now, but I think it will still work. Wait, why did the... That was looking so weird. Okay, it did. Look at this. Your booking has been confirmed. Check in on this date. So everything's working. Although that one, f it looked like on that page, like for some reason, the nav bar was like halfway down. That was really weird. Maybe I can recreate that. So let's go and let's just book another stay. Book your stay. So, I mean, I'm not seeing the error now, but it looks like maybe when we type, it like has some sort of glitch. I mean, not anymore. Yeah, I don't know. One thing is the, this notice kind of blocks the page. So we might want to make that fade away after like a few seconds. But other than that, this app is looking really great. Looking really swaggy. I'm an owner, like everything's working, right? And it's looking good. So from here, there is a lot to do. Like we can make this app way better. Probably the first thing that we might want to do is adding a bottom navigation bar. We can actually do that using a fully native bottom navigation bar, or you could use one that we code inside of, like from the website inside of Rails. But I think a fully native bottom bar might be better. Now you might be thinking, how do we add that bottom bar? Like, how does that work, right? Well, I think we just add it inside of activity main. Because look, we have this fragment container view, but you could just drop your bottom navigation right underneath this and it would show. Actually, I got a comment earlier today. So shout out to the commenter who added this, but he was saying some things that could have been improved on the app. And I totally agree. So one thing was when somebody goes to book a booking first you have to create an account let me do that real quick so when they go to actually book the stay we create the model as soon as they click book your stay and it says your stay was booked and then it brings them to the payment form so what will actually happen is now they have this your bookings reservation and it says that it's ready to check in even though they didn't pay so if they just like left the page it still says like that they have a booking so i want to improve that and change it so that it says like it it has a status so that's what the comment said they suggested i add a status where it starts at pending and then once it's like once it's paid for with stripe then the status would change to like paid for or like confirmed and then you actually see the booking on this page and you could tell that it's, you're gonna book into, you're gonna check into it. So also what I would like to do is the house that you're booking, we could replace this link that says like book now and then replace it with like, you're, you're gonna stay here and then like, here's when you're gonna check in everything like that. So we can change up the UI on this page and that'll be pretty exciting. So let's get right into it. The first thing we can do is add that field Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add that new field onto the booking model. To do that, I'm gonna first create a migration by typing Rails G migration, and then I'll call it add status to bookings, and status will be type integer. That's what we're gonna use for different states of our status. And then what we can do is change the migration to set a default for this. So to do that, I'm gonna to go to the DB and the migrate folder, and I'll go to the latest migration. And inside of here, it's just adding a column to bookings, which is a status, and we can set the default to be zero. That'll be our default index for the status. And then what we have to do is change the model. So inside the app folder, models and the booking, the RB, we're gonna add an enum for status. And then I'll use an array to set the different states. We can have pending and then we can have complete. So a default to zero, which would be pending. And then whenever we set it to complete, it would use one. So that's a pretty easy way to add statuses into your Rails app. And then we can do is just do Rails DB migrate. And that should have set all of the bookings to have a status of pending. But I'm going to double check that. By going in the Rails console, 
and I'll just do booking dot last. If we check the status, it is set to pending, so that's perfect. Everything is working correctly. And then whenever we do get payment, we just want to update update that to complete. So to handle that, I mean the easiest way to do this is inside of Stripe or inside of the bookings controller on the success action, we could somehow like we could pass in our booking ID through the success URL down here on the return URL. Although the problem with that is if something goes wrong with the payment after we get redirected, which is kind of possible, then also they could hack this in the URL. Like they could find a way to get to this page. And if we just like update their booking and set it right on this page, it's not secure. It's definitely hackable. So we don't want to do that. Where we want to set the booking status to complete is inside of a listener for the webhook. So right now I haven't set up webhooks in this app yet, but we can easily do that if we go over to stripe.com. And actually, oh, for locally, you use Stripe listen. So you use the CLI to listen for webhooks. But let me pull up the documentation. Stripe webhook docs. Okay, there we go. There's a whole page for setting up webhooks. And we can get this simple code right here for our webhook endpoint. And what we're actually going to do is create that endpoint in our app. So we can go to the config routes.rb. And then we're going to need to, to create that route. So, oh, actually, we already have a Stripe webhook events route, right? So we're already sending webhooks into our app. I forgot because we're using, yeah, we're already using webhooks just in a earlier episode. So we already have this whole, all set up. This makes it a lot easier. So what I have to do is down here where we're listening for the event type, we just need to listen for another event, which would be like payment intent succeeded right here. Or maybe it'll be Stripe checkout complete. So let's look for the different events. Let's look events checkout. Right. Or maybe I should have searched that on that website and search for like checkout. Here we go. Checkout session completed. Maybe we should listen for that. And checkout session completed. We could do this webhook event creation thing. And then account updated job perform later. So what we'd actually do is we'd have our own background job for this. Like bookings complete job perform later. Pass in the webhook event ID. And then we can look this up inside of that background job. So from the console, I'm gonna generate the job. So Rails G job. And I'll put the name of it. Booking, how about instead of the S, let's just do booking complete job. Booking complete. And then you don't need the job part because it'll automatically put that. We can restart the server, get that set up. And I'm gonna go over to the jobs folder inside of app. Then go in the booking complete job. And I'm actually gonna just copy this code from account updated job because it already is doing a lot of the stuff to set up Stripe. And right in here, we're looking at the Stripe object data. So we're gonna to need to kind of like figure out how to pass the booking ID into this payment or this checkout success event, which I've done before to look up a model. But we're gonna to have to go back to the listings bookings controller inside of Stripe session. And we're gonna to need to pass in some metadata on this. So let me look up how to do that. So it's kind of hard to find the information I need about uh, this. So actually, I'm just going to take the name of the class and search that up. Stripe checkout session. And then it looks like that brings me right over to the API docs. So this is a bit better. So we can see like the session object. Ooh, there's a metadata. So set of key of key value pairs that you can attach to an object. So this is what we're looking for. It's just a hash of anything that we want. So that would be a key 
method on this main level object. So we can put this anywhere in here. Let's just put it right after payment intent data. We do metadata. Let's add the booking ID. Booking ID. And this is perfect. Then we should be able to look it up and just make sure to add semicolon after this hash. Okay, and then inside of booking complete job, uh, probably stripe object dot metadata. Booking ID, that's what I would expect. And then we would do booking equals booking dot find for this booking ID. And then we're going to update the booking for the status to be complete. Just like this. I think you can also do this booking.complete with the exclamation point look. I think that's a built-in method. Let's try it out. So what we are gonna have to do is listen for webhooks using the CLI. So I'm gonna go in a new tab and just do Stripe listen. Actually, first let's do Stripe login to make sure we're logged into the right account, which I think I have another one open. So I'm gonna quickly switch the account that I'm logged into. So yeah, I'm on this other account right now. Let me go over to the Airbnb account. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a Stripe login. It says go to this URL. So I went here and I'm allow access, there we go. So now I know it's the right account. I'm gonna do Stripe listen dash dash forward dash two localhost 3000 webhook events. I think that's just how we called it. No, it's Stripe webhook events, right? Like this. Let's check the routes to RB. Yeah, namespace Stripe webhook events. Probably add that. Webhook events. I'm gonna press enter. So now we're listening for webhook events. And then all I have to do is go and test this out. So if I want to have the console open, let me try to do this side by side. But I should be able to just do a listing from mobile view. Go book my stay. And do Saturday. Book your stay. So I'm so close. I just have to fill out the information. No, don't save this. <laughs> Come on. This form, why? I want. I wish this form was a little bit more slimmed down. But I guess we should probably capture that information. It looks like there's an error in the back end. Undefined method metadata for Stripe event. So it looks like we did get the webhook event and we did go all the way to the background job. That's pretty cool. But just this wasn't a method. So what I'm gonna do is, why don't we just try this code out in the console and see if like what method is correct and then we can fix our code. So I'm gonna go to rel C and then I'm going to use this code but I'm gonna set event ID. Well actually I have to make sure I'm finding the right event. So let's look at the last webhook event and see what type of event it is. Last dot data dot I'm trying to find the type. Yeah, this is hard. How about dot keys? Okay, so there's only object. Dot keys. There's like so much. 
Payment. I want to see what the event type is. It's kind of weird. Maybe object again. It says checkout session. <laughs> I don't get it. Well, I'm just trying to find the right. So let's just say that that is the right event. So we'll say webhook event equals webhook event dot last. Well, also, I don't see any sort of metadata. Let's see. So I tried to attach this. It says on the. Let me know about the event ID. Oh, I thought I said event ID. No, I didn't. With webhook event. I need to say event ID equals webhook event dot ID. Now we got the ID. I'm going to try to run this code. And now we have stripe object. Type checkout session completed. So it is the right event. Now let's try to see if we can get metadata. It doesn't have it. How about dot data? Not metadata? No. We can even do dot methods to see all the methods, but that kind of gives us like too many methods. Right, how about dot object? Dot metadata. It does have it. Dot booking ID. Look at this. So I finally found it. So all we have to do is replace this code right here. Booking ID. There we go. Now I'm going to set booking ID to this. So it's off the stripe object data dot object dot metadata. All right, that's pretty simple. Now I'm going to exit out. So the next time we do this, it should work. So let me just go like backwards. Uh, here we go. We're actually, see we're on the right booking for 10. So now I can actually complete the payment real quick. There we go. So for email, we actually, we already have an email. So I, I don't get why it's asking for me for it again. We should probably try to figure that out. Let's go back to the Stripe session docs and let's see if I can change this a little bit. So there's mode, payment, setup, or subscription. That's kind of cool. Save payment details to charge your customers later. Oh, I like that. You could try that. Oh, look, customer email. If provided, this value will be used when the customer object is created. If not, customers will be asked to enter their email address. Oh, or we could create a customer ID, the ID of the customer for the session. This is the way better idea because, here, let me show you. If we go to the Stripe website, I'm pretty sure every time we go to this form, it creates a new customer, which might not be good because you want to like, you. it's just, it's kind of like creating too many. So it looks like I'm not in test mode. Let me switch over to test mode. Overview. Actually, you can't tell. It looks like this is the one guy that I just created. We've charged him, look, like three different times. So that's cool. But as soon as I put a different name, I think it would create like a new customer. Let's try this out. Hello, YouTube. There we go. I'm going to book my stay. Your booking has been confirmed. Awesome. Okay, and back end, we got a bunch of events. I don't know if my booking is actually confirmed though. So now I have to go to like the bookings page and we have two bookings. Uh, we need to now filter it so that it doesn't, it only shows the, like the ones with the correct status. So if we go back to the booking, model we have the pending and complete status so i need a filter on this bookings page to only show the completed ones i think with enum it should already give us a helpful method for that let's go in the rails console and i'm gonna grab up the listing.last.bookings so see it has three bookings 
Then if I do dot complete, you'll see that uh, it's an empty array because it's not. It's only showing the bookings that are completed. So we even just say booking dot all dot complete. It only gives us the complete ones versus if we do pending, it gives us all of the pending ones. So we can take advantage of this when we're displaying those records on the page. So the first place that we're doing that is inside of the layouts nav bar. I'm pretty sure we had some logic or if we have bookings. So that's actually fine. But once you're on the bookings path, I want to like differentiate like these. This one's actually confirmed versus this one you still have to pay for something like that. So I'm going to go over to the bookings folder, the index and on here. Let's just loop over bookings dot complete each booking and then now it'll only show the completed ones this is perfect we show this booking and then for now i think we could just wrap this whole card inside of a link that goes to the booking we could do like a link to booking do It reloads undefined method booking path. Oh, link to booking. Weird. What was the path then? I'm not booking. <laughs> link to booking dot listing. I'm trying to link to the listing. Let me reload. There we go. So it does work. And now I want to change this text down here. So if you have a confirmed booking, then I want to. Basically, just show some different text on that booking. So to do that, I keep calling it a booking, but it's a listing. So inside of app views, listings folder on the show page, I'm going to come in here and all right, I'll find this code right here. If the listing day price, then I set up the link to set to create a new booking. Or a new listing booking. So what I'll do is I'll check in here if current user dot bookings where uh, first of all status is complete and then the listing ID is the listing dot ID. Also I'm thinking that we only want to change the UI if the booking is upcoming, which means like the date is in the future and it's not in the past. So we need to say if like checkout date is time dot now dot dot, which means if it's if the checkout date is farther or is like is later than today than right now, and then we could just do a dot any else. <laughs> so if there's not, then we're just going to show the regular booking text so if there is dot any well maybe we maybe this will just be a method on the user model like if current user dot upcoming bookings dot any and then we could display like or wait actually not upcoming booking because we're trying to do it for the specific listing so we can do that too. Upcoming bookings. And then we just pass in the listing. Then we make that model on the user the RB. We could have a model. We could have a method called upcoming bookings. And then we're gonna pass in a listing. Maybe listing could be nil. And then inside of here, we're gonna check for this bookings. And then listing ID. We're actually gonna want to create this query real quick. So the query would be like a hash object. And then we only want to set this key if we have a listing passed in. We can set this, and then we'll just do a query of what listing ID equals listing .ad if listing just like that there we go and then 
upcoming bookings. We probably want to memoize this. We can say bookings or equal or equal. And we can return bookings with at bookings at the top. I think that might work for memoization. Or maybe you're supposed to put this all into a method. But then we're gonna have like so many methods, but we could be like find upcoming bookings. And put a private method. And upcoming bookings for the listing. And just put all of the logic inside of here. So it's memoized. So I think that'll save some queries. So like when we do it here, we can call dot any, and then we can also just use it in here, and it won't cost any more. Like it shouldn't do another query; it should just cache it. So the upcoming bookings listings first. Dot title. Upcoming bookings dot listing, and not the title dot second date. We might have some text, but like we have an upcoming reservation. All right, let's finally reload and see what happens. Undefined method check in date for active record relation. Oh, right. So I need to call dot first on this to get the first one. Reload. And look, it actually worked. First try. You have an upcoming reservation. So I want to reformat this. It's a little bit prettier, like we've done in other places. So I think to do that, we can go over to even the booking success. Yeah, right here we have it. And we can just put this dot check in date with the surf time reload. Okay, this looks nice. And then I can go ahead and style this and make it look a little bit prettier. Flex. Justify center. Check in. And now, obviously, for Airbnb, they give you more information than just like this. You'd have a whole reservation page. So I'll probably build that. But first, I'm just handling a few of these edge cases, and this video is mostly focused on adding those changes for the comment that I received. So the suggestions that I got earlier today, where we have this text, you have an upcoming reservation, and we might want to make that stick out a little bit more, so it's like bright and happy. We could try changing the text color to be like a cool gradient. For the you have an upcoming, so let's do a span. Let's do BG clip text. And I'm gonna try to set the background of the or like the color of the text to be a gradient. So we can do text transparent and do a gradient. BG gradient to bottom from red 500 to pink 500. And let's take a look at what that looks like. Reload. You can't even see really like much on the text itself. But it actually is working. So let's change from red to like purple. A little bit more obvious. Reload. Okay, I mean, that's cool. You still can barely see it. And then the check-in, I'm going to make this look like a little like badge. We'll wrap this in a spam. I can do some margin on this too. And let's do a BG gradient to right red 500 to pink 600. X red 50. Let's do P2 rounded large, or actually rounded full. So we have a full circle. Alright, that looks cool. And then we can do item center on this outside div. Cool. 
Yeah, that looks cool. Although the check-in looks kind of like a button. So let's change this. Instead of being like an action text, we'll say like check-in at so that they can see like we're just doing some cool design. Oh, maybe I'll make this text lighter. Or actually, maybe it's too light. That's why I can't see it. Anyways, let's make all this text bigger by doing like text large. That's what we did for the other one. Okay, you have an upcoming reservation. Maybe I'll make the button text a little bit smaller. Text medium. Text small. Reload. All right, I mean, that's cool. Obviously, we could change this. You guys could change this to whatever you want it to look like. I don't really want to spend that much more time on this. But I like colors, so I'm just going to make it a little bit colorful. I know Airbnb likes colors, too. Oh, they probably keep it a little bit more to the color scheme of the app. Like, that's a little bit too bright. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get rid of the brightness on the, you have an upcoming reservation. I'm just trying to think this out. Maybe we'll go like flex call so that they're stacked on top of each other. We can just add a flex call and leave the rest of the styling. See how that looks. All right, you know what? That looks a little bit better. I like that. Let's just leave it. You have an upcoming reservation. Check in at this date. Maybe check in on. Probably a good word to use. Yeah, check in on the 86, which is eight six. So that's like two months from now. Wow. And over here at the bookings, we have this. Yeah, everything looks great. Cool. And now let's make sure that everything works if we go like incognito. <laughs> no, we don't we get an error because there's not a current user in that situation. So let's go back to the listings show page. And right here on this if condition, we just need to add probably like the safety operator on here. Reload, there we go. So a guest user, someone who's not signed in could still look at the listing, but then when they try to book, it says like you need to sign in and that's fine. All right, this is looking pretty awesome. So in this video already, I've covered adding that status so that we can make sure that the bookings are completed. Now from here, let's make it so that somebody else can't reserve the same house at the same time. So that's kind of a tricky one, but we can handle this. So maybe first of all, let's display both of the dates on the bookings card. So to do that, let's go to the bookings folder inside the views. So inside the app folder, inside views, bookings, index, that's where we had our card. Let me just copy this and do check out just so we can see this and then change it to check out date. That's perfect. So now I have two windows open, one incognito where I'm going to create a new account. And as we can see, actually, this looks weird. Why is there 15 on the first one? No, that can't be right. So I think the surf time, why do, wait, why did I put the date first? That's not really something we usually do in America. So I need to change this up. I have to move it like this. Oh, wait, <laughs> I'm so confused. Yeah, I don't know why I did it like that. But we want month, date, and then year. I was kind of confused. Like, wait, why is the 15th first? So actually, the check-in date would be today check in on that's today so maybe we should do something else if it's like check in on this but maybe we should change the text if they're going to check in today but i'm not going to worry about that but the checkout date is the 15th so that's all that we are caring about so now i have this house reserved from today until the 15th i don't want anybody else to be able to book the house too 
So if some guy comes over to the entire cabin, right now they can click on book. Well, they're gonna have to create an account first. I'm gonna call my guy like Lake Lover. Okay, so book your stay. Now here's the problem. So if I go to like try to book a stay from today until that's the same exact booking date as this one, right? This should fail. Or how about from today? How about if I'm only staying from Saturday to like Tuesday? It's still going to override on this booking. So I need to fix this because right now it would allow me look. Book your stay. It says your stay was booked for this date. So now we both have stays for this booking and that's really bad. So I'm going to fix this. <clears throat> First thing I'll do is let me go in the console and delete that last booking. Yeah, we don't want that one because there's already someone staying. Let's just start working on the logic. So the first thing I'll do is do the backend validations, which means when we try to create the model, we can just straight up block it in the backend, which is really good for security. And then we can go on to actually limiting the state picker UI so that like these days would be grayed out and you couldn't select them because that was suggested in the comment that I received. But first of all, I'm going to handle the back end so that we just can't, we, it won't allow us to book the stay if there's already someone staying. So what we can do is inside of the booking model, we can add a new validation. They like validates. Well, it's kind of tricky because it's like validates all this stuff. Like if someone else is booking, so we might want to add a custom validator. So we can do validate. I think that's how you do, or is it validates? I don't know. Really, I think it's just validate. Um, booking is available. Or how about, no, validate listing is available for dates, or just listing is available. And we could go and have this in a private method. Listing is available. And what we're going to do is return. I can't remember what we do. Let me go and look this up. I think we have to add two errors, like some sort of errors module. I'm going to look up custom validation rails. So yeah, we can do just the standard validates a certain attribute and then check for like presence, but that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for a custom validator. There's all of this validates associated books. Validates each uses a block. It's kind of cool. Validates with so you can use validates with to, to pass in a custom class. So this is pretty cool. And there's like so much you can pass in custom messages for validations. There's a lot you can do. Numericality. <laughs> I still need to get to the custom validate. I think it's just called validate. Yeah, like this. Custom methods. Perfect. So you put in your method and then inside of the method you add to errors. And if you don't add to the errors, then there won't be any errors. Okay, that's easy to, to see. So we're actually gonna add it to it's a good question. Uh, listing available, is that would that work? Listing is already booked. That's our error, but we're gonna have to first do the logic to see if that's true. So we can do booking dot where uh, check in date is. We kind of want to like find in between this range. So if there's already a booking, 
Well, first of all, the status should be complete. And then the check-in date is our check-in date. The check-in date is greater than our check-in date. And checkout date is less than checkout date. Actually, it's gonna be kind of complex. Also, it's not checking like that. The best way to do this might actually be to do this from the console. Yeah, we're gonna to wanna to do this from the console real quick. This thing is available and just see if we can get this logic to work. So I'm gonna open up a new window or maybe I'll just turn off the server for a second. Go into rail C. And then let's try to query for that booking. Booking.count. We do booking.complete. We actually can do that. And then we can just check where Second date and dot zone dot now. Yeah, it's kind of confusing. The check-in date, how about let's say our check-in date is gonna be and dot zone dot now. And then checkout date is gonna be check-in date plus three dot days. Something like that. We have these two dates that I can use now, and now I'll find bookings where um, that's another thing for the listing ID. So booking belongs to listing. We pass in listing ID. Let me quickly get that. I can actually get the listing ID from the booking.complete.first.listing. ID. There we go. And now we're going to look for the listing ID. Listing ID. So now we found another booking where the listing ID is the same and it's complete. So we know like there's somebody else who booked a booking for this house. But we don't know if it's going to conflict with the dates. So that's like the question right now is, are my check-in date that I have right here, is that gonna conflict with the with this other booking? So I think what we can do is probably do a check-in date, so do the query that checks if the check-in date, if our check-in date is greater than their check-in date, and the checkout date is <laughs> it's getting so confusing. So our check-in date is in between their check-in and their checkout. I think that's what I was saying. So if it's greater than the check-in and if it's less than yeah, yeah, like that. If it's less than check-in date. So I'm using dot dot because that kind of is like a shorthand for this. For less. And then for the check-in, we actually want if it's greater than the check-in date or if it's less than the checkout date. It's so confusing. Let's run it. It actually it gives us no. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, no. Hmm. How about we just only do if the check-in date is greater than that check-in date? Okay, so that automatically is no. Maybe I'll set this dot first dot check-in date. Is it equal to my check-in date? No. These are side by side. Looks like my check-in date is later than theirs. Obviously, because it's... We need to also check, is it like equal to or greater than? Uh, which is kind of... How do we do that? 
Let's go back to the query. Maybe we have to say like, yeah, I don't even, we might have to do some custom SQL for this. I think we're gonna have to do a custom SQL. So where check-in date greater or equal to, and we do question mark. So this is to prevent SQL injection. Oh shoot, I know what to do. Semicolon quotes. If the check-in date is greater or equal to, and then we're gonna just paste in check-in date, which I feel like, don't we have to format that? I don't know. But look, if we do less than, it actually works. If check-in date is less than this. Okay, and check-out date. Greater than question mark, and then it needs two. Oh, I don't, also don't think we need the quotes and all that stuff. Interpolation because I'm not adding anything else. I'm just gonna do checkout date. Boom. I mean, this passed. So if check-in date, if there's a booking with a check-in date that's less than my check-in date, and the checkout date is after my check-in date. It means my check-in would be right in between their stay. <laughs> so that's not going to work. I think that's all we have to check for, actually, is this. And there is already one. So I'm going to take this query, this big old long query, exit out of here, and let's put that in the validator. There. There we go. It's kind of big and chunky, but we can check if there is a booking where my check-in date would be oh wait i use checkout date or if their checkout date is greater than my checkout date i think i mostly just want to check for the check-in date because like if my check-in's between their check-in and checkout it means it's conflicting so we don't even care about the checkout but if this dot any then we're going to throw that error Say the listing's already booked actually we might just be able to put it on the listing Errors that listing, listing's already booked. Okay. Cool. So now let's go test this out. So actually inside of our incognito window, that's where I was gonna do it. Let's try to make a booking. Check out. Book my stay. Wait it <laughs> it looks like it worked. Or no. Let's check the console. I'll see booking dot last. I can't tell. I need time to go in words. Time helper. Ah, uh, how do I use time in words right here? <laughs> it says like twenty one. No, I can't even tell. Got last dot listing. Hmm. No, yeah, it looks like we just created a booking for this listing and it redirected me to the payments page. So this didn't work. How about if we go check in date is the ninth? And for sure, this logic should pass, I think. So I ran it. Can't tell what happened. Oh, it didn't move, so I guess that's a good thing. Now, we're not displaying the error, so I want to quickly add the error. So on the views, we're going to go to the listings, bookings, new. That's where we have these fields. And then we can check for that error. So actually, we can just do this up at the top. We can say do error. We simply do like a span. Do text red, just pop the error. See if that works. Reload. Undefined method errors. So maybe we have to do f dot object, which would be just the same as doing the booking dot errors. All right, so nothing. 
Let me put my check-in date there. My check-out date, book my stay. Hmm, still nothing. No errors are showing up. Okay, let's just try to display the errors on the page. Like, let's just display at booking. Oh, error. I think that should display it. Give it a go. Not seeing anything. Even though it is re-rendering the page. You can see it right there. But we're not seeing any change. Inside the model, the booking.rb, we have this condition where we're going to be adding the errors. We do have the validator. How about we do check-in date? Yeah, that's kind of fair. Like, listing is already booked for the check-in. That's fair. Book my stay. Still nothing. We are getting a rollback. I'm just not sure why we're not seeing the errors. So let's go and check out the controllers real quick. That's kind of weird. So let's go to the listings bookings controller. So if we don't get, if the booking doesn't save, then we're going to render new, which is perfect. So then we have this bookings model, but we should just save the booking. So we'll save this variable. We'd already have it, like we'd have the user and everything. That's a good way to check actually. Let's try to display the user dot email. Let's use the safety operator. So we can test if, even like if we're getting a page update. Okay, I didn't see anything. All right, let's just try to reload. Nine. Okay, there we go. Mm. Rollback. So yeah, it's not going through. See, it's even saying in the listing is available. It's doing a rollback. But for some reason, I can't see the error on the page. Oh, this is frustrating. F dot objects. Try to display that. See, it's a booking. And if I call dot errors on it. All messages. I think that's the method you can use. Reload. It's just an empty bracket. Try to do my booking. Still empty bracket, although it should have an error message inside of there. That's weird. On the booking model, this looks fine. We're doing like the errors add, but it's not showing up. I'm gonna have to look that up. Custom validation rails not showing up on page. Error not showing up. Make sure you display the errors. Oh wow, thanks. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do. And I have the same like render new. Oh, maybe we should try errors based. That's what they're using. Looks like they're just shoveling it in like this. All right, let's try. Oh, we should also check, make sure that the checkout date isn't before the check-in date because that's kind of weird. Look, your stay. Look, it actually said my stay was booked now. That's weird. Something went wrong. I don't even know what happened. But let's let's add a validation to make sure that the checkout has to be after the check-in. So to do that, it has to actually be more than one day after the check-in. So to do that, let's go back to the booking model, which we already are right here. What are we gonna do? Just wondering, should I use one of their built-in validators for this, or should I do my own? 
could try inclusion. But the problem is, I don't know if we can actually access like the checkout date from that. So we might just want to do our own validator. So if uh, checkout dates valid, let's make the method for that. And I'll basically just check check-in date. How would we do this? Check-in date. Um, well, first of all, we can just do check-out date greater than check-in date. I guess, yeah, that's that, that'll probably work. So if check-out date less than or equal to check-in date, then we're going to add some errors. Errors.add checkout date must be uh, more than one day after check in. Okay, that looks good. So let's test that out, see if that validator works. We just do like 10, and then we're going to try to check out on a 9, so it'd be like negative. That should throw an error. So I did it. It looks like it did a rollback, but we're still not seeing the errors on the view. That's so weird. If we look in console, oh, we're actually seeing an error. Form responses must redirect to another location. Really? Wait, that's weird. But we're just doing rendered new. So why would that cause an error? It's actually really weird. I'm going to screenshot that and put that up on GitHub or see if somebody else is having this error. So it's not showing the errors and then it's having this turbo error in the console. Here, let's go to GitHub. Oh, make sure that we're in my normal browser. my notifications how to use on VM oh I got a response to my question on about thruster cool I'll check that out in a second but first we're going over to the turbo framework library thing how wired turbo we're gonna look through the issues and I want to see if anybody else is having the same issue form responses must redirect to another location which I know they are but like I'm getting it in a weird place. So look right here, this error. So I'm not seeing really anything that relates to me. How about form errors? I don't know why I'm seeing this. I'm just going to create an issue anyways, like form not showing, not displaying errors on page, simple rails form where I'm selecting dates for a reservation and I submit do some validations on the model and then in the controller if the model not saved, then a render new. Do code snippet. Uh, I'm expecting the errors to show up on the form. But instead, I receive an empty array and see this error in the console. And I'm going to upload the picture that I just saved on my desktop, the screenshot. This is pretty confusing to me. I'm going to create this issue. Form response must redirect to another location. And maybe I'll show like the code 
the controller, just a simple controller code. All right, let's go back. Here's the code in my controller. Wait, I think we want, isn't there an option for multi-line code? Maybe it's just like this. No, wait, look, <laughs> that looks weird. Maybe three dashes, I think. There we go. So I put up a new error, or new issue on GitHub. This is so weird. So I mean, what the heck? I'm just trying to display the error on the page. I don't get it. Here stay. Wait, that actually went through. Although it shouldn't because I'm pretty sure somebody else already has that booking for that date. Look, from the 8th to the 15th. I just booked it for the 12th to the 14th. Yeah, that's the code's definitely not working in the validation. So let's go back to the query. Like, forget about not displaying the error. Now the validation just isn't working at all. So let's try to do one where the checkout date is before. I'll do the 12th and I'll try to check out on the 11th. Look your stay. So now I just get like the nothing happens and probably in the console we see that error. It's very weird. Look, console. Form responses must redirect to another location. That's weird. Uh, let's go to the bookings controller and inside of render new. Is there anything else I should be doing? Status the other. I know I've had to do that in the past to make turbo work. See other actually worked, but I've never had to do this before. Yo. No, that's weird. It must be a change to the to turbo or something. We gotta fix that. Oh look, someone started my repository. That's cool. Uh, let's go back to that issue I created. Form not displaying errors. I was able to resolve this by adding. That is the other on the render new. But this is weird because I've never, I have never had to do this before. At least, uh, at least I'm pretty sure. I don't remember doing C other for the for render new. Maybe that's just something you have to do. Okay. Well, now we now we show the error. So perfect. Let's go back to the index or no, let's go back to the form. So the listings bookings new page. And let's go and loop over these. Each error. You can just put the span. We're going to display the error. Just like that. Reload. Oh, looks like there's a syntax problem. Oh, I forgot to do the do on the block. That's really important. All right, so now let's try that again. If we go and try to have the checkout before, we get this error message. How about on the same day, we still get the error message. I kind of want to clean that up, actually, make it look a little bit nicer. Maybe we'll do like a max width mall. And also, we're using Font Awesome, so we could pull in like a Font Awesome icon for like error, or like issue, wait. <laughs> Alerts. Yeah, maybe exclamation. We could do just an exclamation mark. I guess we don't really need an icon for, but that's fine. Reload. Do that again. I guess we didn't need to reload. So now we do have this little icon. 
but I still want to style it. I thought I did a max with small, but I guess that's not small enough. Try extra small. And we don't need to reload because we could just redo the form. Although, yeah, still. Maybe I'll do a BG red 300. And then, like, a border B2, border B2. Or maybe I can do border Y, too. I think to do top and bottom. Now we're going to have, like, a real red border on this alert. But for some reason, resubmitting the form, I think it's because I changed the styling. Okay, so that looks interesting. Still, like, it looks like the sizing is off. Yeah, like, that error is totally on a different styling than the form, so I want to fix that. Oh, let's put it inside the div. Maybe that's the issue. Put it right inside of here. Now, any errors will just pop up in that really red thing. Maybe we should change the text to be, like... Red 700, I don't even know. Do this again. Ooh, so that looks cool, though. Well, let's get rid of the max width on this error. That it goes to full width. Hey, there we go. Then maybe do a little padding vertically, like PX to... Alright, cool. <laughs> Yeah, that looks good to me. I'm displaying the error. So yeah, so let me fix my date now. Go to the 14th. Book my stay. Well, now it's booked. But the problem is that, look, somebody already booked this for that date. Check into the 8th to the 15th. So that shouldn't have even been a possibility. I should have seen an error. We're going to have to fix the other validation. But at least now that we can see, we can see that the validation wasn't working correctly. And we can go and fix it accordingly. So with the listing is available, it looks like this isn't working. So we're doing like the query for the listing ID is listing ID. And then where check-in date is less than. How about less than equal and checkout date is greater than equal. Although you should be able to book a check-in on the same date as a checkout, I think. That should be fine. As long as the Airbnb like... As long as the owner is fine with that amount of time to like clean the house between rentals, I'm not sure how they really do that, but I know that Airbnb does let you check in the same day as somebody else is checking out, just like hotels do that too. So where check-in date is less than or equal to, oh, that's not right. Where check-in date, wait, no, actually that is right. So where their check-in date is greater than or equal to our check-in date and checkout date is greater than checkout date dot any. <laughs> so this is the question, which it's not working. So let's change the errors too. Now we can actually do it like this way. We add it on checkout date. That looks fine. And if I put my check in on like any day after the 8th, the 9 to the 12th, book my stay, it says, oh, check in date is so, yeah, we get kind of like this weird message. So let me change it to error space. But this is good. Because now we're finally getting, looks like the logic is correct now. Book your stay. Oh, not, not equal. I meant to do a shovel onto error space. All right, so let's go to the 9th to the 12th. Wait, but now it, now it went through. What the heck? So maybe errors, maybe the problem is actually that we're doing on error space. And that's like not registering or something. So let's do errors. Check out date. Or check in date. Shovel on this. Nine to the ten. Ah, oh, it was booked. It's not working. But what if we do errors add? The question is, is it doing different things? 
or is it just the dates that I'm choosing? To the tens to the elevens. No, now we get the error. Check out date. Listing is already booked. So the problem for me is that they're putting like the name checkout date. How about we just say check in date and then for the message we'll say like is already booked for this listing. And then we could actually tell them like what date they can use. Please select. Well, yeah, that's the question. Uh, how do we show them all of the dates that are already reserved? We probably want to just do that right in the select field so that they see like, oh, these dates are already booked, so I can't do it there. Let's book my stay. Check-in date is already booked for this listing, but I can't tell like which dates are available. So we're going to have to work on some logic for that. But for right now, we already know that this guy's booking on the 15th. So oh, let's just do that in the form real quick. Let's go to the 15th to the 18th. And this should work, no problem. Hey, it worked. So my stay was booked. Look, we're actually still, the surf time is kind of weird. And I don't know why I set it up like that last time where I had the day in front of the month. But that looks kind of weird to me. So I'm going to need to go around and fix that in all the places I was doing that. I think I did that on the bookings controller. Yeah, right here. I'm going to do a, just a, a search for the surf time code. Control F. It looks like I'm doing it in a few places. And I'm just going to do a find and replace. Forget how to do that. can also just do it in the place for them. Like, so we just have to move the date. Whoops. <laughs> move the date after the month because it just looks more correct to me. There we go. And realistically, we should make a, you can make like a little helper method for this so that you don't have to remember the surf time thing every time. That'd be a lot better. All right, so cool. Now we can do, we have a little bit of validations on the bookings. We also don't show the bookings unless you have one that is confirmed. Now we should probably show like the bookings that need to be paid for because I've already created a booking, but I need to show that it needs to be paid for. We could show that on the bookings index. We can probably just do like another loop but for the pending ones, we could do another title. Your pending bookings, your upcoming bookings, and then maybe we'll only show this top header if you have any completed bookings. Complete dot any. Probably the same for this. Pending dot any. And then maybe if current user dot bookings dot count equals count dot zero, you can just do another H1 that says like. This is where your bookings will show up. Although you wouldn't really see this bookings page unless you already have one. Looks like there's a syntax error already. Wow, what did I do? Oh, I forgot the end on this top. If statement, I, I think I did. Reload. Yep. There we go. Although now the styling is all messed up. I think I forgot a div somewhere in here. Yeah, look, we have two divs at the bottom, so I definitely cut one of these divs off. Uh, try to figure out which one it was. Maybe just delete it. Maybe it's not important. <laughs> Probably was. Let's go back here. Reload. Yeah, look, there, <laughs> something's definitely missing a div. We just have to figure out where it is. Down. 
here. Looks fine. Oh, this is weird. So try to figure it out better. I can just like cut out a section of code, see if that fixes anything. I can't really tell. Well, actually we wouldn't even show this code unless we have the, those bookings. So it's definitely something in here in the pending bookings. And I think all it is is this div right here. We had an extra div because we we're supposed to have this div which adds some styling. Let's add that back. Reload. There we go. Wow, your penny bookings, I have a lot of them. Uh, and then the link to instead of just going to the booking listing, we should bring them to like the payment path. And instead of showing check in, it says like you need to pay now. Pay now to complete. And booking. Reload. Pay now to confirm your booking. That should probably be in like big letters. Do like a pink. Pay now to confirm your booking. And then when you just click anywhere on here, I want to take them to the payment page. So I want to have like a little hover effect on the card. I wonder what we can do for that. Maybe like a, you could do a simple brightness thing. I guess we could do a hover, brightness, 75. So that just makes the whole element a little bit darker, which, see that gives us that hover kind of effect. So I like that. And then the link to is going to have to go to the payment page. So to do that, let's go to the bookings controller and let's find this payment listing bookings path just like that you go back plop it in and then just put in the correct booking we have the listing so everything should be good or actually we don't have the listing we have to use the booking dot listing just like that reload now when you click on your pending booking it actually brings you to the payment page so I can put the payment in although those bookings are invalid anyways like you'll see uh, they're actually invalid so we might want to do a check for that real quick on the payment page. If the booking's invalid, we might just want to like take care of that. So to do that, we can go to the listings, bookings controller, or no, the payment page right here. Let's say if not booking not valid, then we have to like redirect to listing the alert the booking is not valid Let's see what that looks like so if you reload look we get a refresh and it says like your booking is not valid okay that's fair try and book a new one maybe on the bookings page in general we shouldn't show any invalid bookings so we might want to do that on the bookings index so if current user bookings pending dot any we probably want to do like a little query for invalid or for only valid which I don't even know how you do that queries for only valid records Fastest way of getting all invalid records. Hmm. It's kind of funny. I don't even know. Well, actually, no. The funniest thing about this is that this only counts for like old records because now that we've added in those validations, you would never see invalid records because they just wouldn't save to the database. So really what we need to do is we need to delete those records 
manually in the console real quick. So we can just do like a booking dot all dot filter. Pass in a block. V dot valid, not v dot valid. And now we get all of these records that are invalid. And then we'll just say like each and destroy. There we go. And now if we do that again, we don't see any invalid bookings. That takes care of that. Can reload. Now we don't have to have that code on the bookings controller either, like doing this redirect because that would never happen. And that's how the Rails validators work, by the way. It won't save the model until it passes these validations. So that's kind of important to realize. So now we can see we only have one pending booking that is valid that we have to pay for. So if I go in here, I can't even see the check-in date, but let's just go ahead and fill out the form. Go ahead and buy this booking. It says check-in on the 15th. Okay, perfect. So uh, this one is valid because I would check in right after this guy checks out. He has to check out on the 15th, and I get to check in. This is awesome. We'll go to your bookings. Wait, actually, it looks like maybe that query I did deleted my booking. I don't know. What happened there? Because now it only shows my pending bookings. Maybe the code, maybe the code is wrong inside of the bookings index. If current user bookings complete any. Because I should have had a booking. That's weird. Let's go and check the console real quick. Where I'll see booking.complete. We only have one of them. We should have had two. Dot listing. Okay, that's pretty weird. I guess I might have deleted it accidentally. Uh, but that's fine. So let's go ahead and do a booking. So I'm going to do this one. I'm going to go for my same dates of the 8th to the 15th. Book my stay. So my stay was booked. Here. So I'm on the payment page. It looks like there's some sort of error with the payment thing. You cannot have multiple embedded checkout objects. Wait, I don't. Do I? Let me reload. Okay, that was weird. Now we have this form. And I'm using 4.2 because that's the card that works on Stripe. I'm just doing like random silly information. I always do it, I can't resist. There, we went through the process. We have our check-in. We have our booking. If I go to my bookings, okay, here are my upcoming bookings and then also my pending bookings. I still need to book, I still need to pay for my Barbie dream house one. <laughs> okay, but here, this is what I was trying to do earlier is, so on the, like the form, also we're getting this error now, you cannot have multiple embedded checkout objects. I don't know if it's like caching it on the page or something. I think it is with the stimulus. Whenever we go back, it's like caching it. Yeah, it totally is. Which means on our stimulus controller, I think we need to do some teardown. Which means hook into the disconnect event. So let's go into the, our code. Let's go to the app JavaScript controllers and the Stripe payment controller. So inside of here on connect, we do this whole checkout mount and like we set everything up. But I think we need to take care of whenever we disconnect. We're gonna wanna like tear it down. I wonder if there's any information on this. Stripe checkout embedded. Let's see if there's a method to like tear down. Checkout.js mount. Hmm. Vote remove. Right, check out. Yes. 
the Troy embedded checkout. Here we go. Checkout dot destroy removes checkout from the DOM and destroys it. Once destroyed, an embedded checkout can be reattached. Yeah, I think that's what we have to do. So checkout dot destroy. <laughs> Apparently, and we have to probably use this dot checkout. So which instead of using const, we'll do this dot checkout. And then we can destroy the checkout. That's kind of like an interesting little thing that I just noticed. Let's reload. Make sure everything works. Let's navigate away. And then let's go back. And boom, we're not seeing the error anymore. So that fixed it. I guess you just need to handle the teardown of the element. All right, now I want to get to the point that I was saying before, which is like the customer information. If we already have this, I don't think we should keep asking for it. So that's why inside of the session object, we're going to pass them the ID of the customer. Or we could just pass customer email. It might be easier to just do customer email right now. We could do that inside of bookings controller right in here. We just pass in that as an attribute. So maybe after metadata customer email to current user email. And if we go back reload the form it pre-fills our email okay that's already a little bit easier I like that and there's other things we can do too like setting the cardholder name I think we could do that too but we don't really force the user to have their name set out but they can in settings if you go over to settings they can put a first name last name but right now we're not like making them do that anyway this is a little bit easier I'm gonna pay for my listing Pay for my booking real quick. There we go. Boom, $1,400. Now I have my Barbie dream house. <laughs> Such a silly one. All right, and look, if I click on here, it says I have an upcoming reservation. Check it on the 8th. And I also have one for the cabin, also on the 8th. So I guess I just want to have multiple Airbnbs for one night. Have a whole party hey if i want to i can rent all the airbnbs because that's how awesome our website is check it out your upcoming bookings check out on 15th yeah that was pretty exciting we handled validations we handle yeah mostly just handling validations uh oh and then also secure uh doing like a status on the booking so that uh, we make sure that the customer has paid for the booking before they can view it and they see that they can check in and everything. And we're doing using webhooks, which makes it secure rather than just doing it based off the return URL. This is pretty exciting. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. You found it useful. Thanks for the commenter who suggested these changes. I really appreciate that. Appreciate that. And if anybody else has any ideas that would make this app better, please leave it down below in the comment section and I would love to handle that in a future video. Indigo. Indigo.